Hey Upper East Siders, Gossip Girl here, and I have the biggest news ever. One of my many sources, Melanie91, sent us this. Spotted in Paris, How to Train Your Gavin Reading the Gossip Girl books. You know, the one that inspired the iconic television show, the original one? He somehow got his hands on all 14 of them. And yes, you heard me right, 14 books, and he's about to expose every dirty secret in them. Including the book where Blair and Serena trade in shopping sprees for killing sprees in New York City and become serial killers. Something tells me we're in for quite a ride. Don't believe me? See for yourselves. And who am I? That's a secret I'll never tell. You know you love me. XOXO. Gossip Girl. Now usually I tell you to grab a coffee for a video this length, but I genuinely think you're going to need something stronger. So, bottoms up. And now I can write this wine glass off of my expenses. Hi everyone, welcome or welcome back to How to Train Your Gavin. In today's video, I probably better put this down. In today's video, I'm going to be discussing every single Gossip Girl book by Cecily Von Zegese. I'm gonna go through all 14 books in the series to expose every sordid secret that happens in the series and essentially give you the tea on everything that happens. You may know Gossip Girl as the iconic television show that debuted on the CW in 2007. And even if you haven't seen the series before, I'm pretty sure you will have seen my absolute icon, Mike's Mike, going through every single season of Gossip Girl. And as a filming this video, he has done the first two seasons, but I'm sure in one way or another, you will have heard about Gossip Girl. Now, I'm not gonna sit here and lie and tell you that I was a big fan of the TV show. I really wasn't. I think I watched the first season of Gossip Girl and then kind of gave up. And then I went back to Gossip Girl to find out who Gossip Girl was. So I sort of skipped all the way to the series finale, which is terrible. It's not something I usually do, but I did it nonetheless. I was more of a 90210 fan at the time. Then Pretty Little Liars debuted like a couple of years later. That was my new obsession. So then I thought, oh, you know, maybe Gossip Girl just isn't for me. I do regret my decisions though. I do wish that I was aboard the Gossip Girl hype train back in the late 2000s when it was like in its peak because Blair, Serena, Nate, Dan, Chuck, Jenny and Vanessa became quite iconic in their own way. And when I heard it was actually based on a book series, I jumped at the chance. I jumped at the chance to read all of these. Do I have regrets? Yes. The book series strips any kind of glitz and glamour that you would usually find in the television show and instead presents us a group of ridiculous high school students who wouldn't even know how to spell XOXO let alone give us some decent drama. I was half tempted to make shit up in this video, not gonna lie, just to make things interesting. Because let me tell you, unless cheating is something that really thrills you, then the Gossip Girl book series is gonna give you a huge wake up call on what you think Gossip Girl is actually about. Even after finishing all of these books, I can't even tell you which character I think is the worst. They're all kind of terrible. And you know what, actually, I'm not going to sit here and tell you which character's the worst. I'm going to let you decide. I'm going to go through every single thing that happens in the Gossip Girl book series, and you can let me know down in the comments who you think turns out to be the worst character in the Gossip Girl book series. It is not like the television show whatsoever. It might start out that way. There might be different things that you will see that were kind of alluded to in the television show, but it's totally different. After the first book, it just goes on its own path. And honestly, I'm so glad the TV show doesn't do what the book series does. And I think you will struggle to pick your least favorite character. I think your mind will change throughout this video more times than Dan writes a shitty poem. And do we find out who Gossip Girl is in the book series? Are they the same as in the TV show? Well, that's a secret I'll never tell until the end of the video because I want you all to keep watching. So if you do end up enjoying this video, don't forget to leave a big like, subscribe if you haven't already, share with your friends and buckle up because you're in for a really wild ride. You're not gonna believe what happens in this book series. It's messy. Right, let me explain to you the Gossip Girl series real quick before I dive in. So the series was published between 2002 and 2011 with the original author Cecily Von Zegese. Although she actually only ever wrote the first eight books of the series and then also the slasher remake of this book. And yes, you heard me right. A slasher remake of the first book where Blair and Serena are serial killers. I read that one too. No comment. There are a couple of spin-off books like The It Girl and The Carlisles, but I'm only focusing on the actual Gossip Girl books themselves, the ones that were titled Gossip Girl and released into the wild 
as Gossip Girl. But who knows, maybe in the future I might give those books a go. If you would like to say that, let me know down below. The first 11 books are actually set within a year, so they flow quite nicely into one another. So if you just want to read the first 11 books, you absolutely can. It does have pretty much a beginning, middle and end. The 12th book is a prequel and it's set a couple of years before the events of the first book. And then we do have a continuation, which starts four months after the end of book 11 and then jumps every new year for the next couple of years after that. And yes, the 14th book, Gossip Girl Psycho Killer, is the slasher remake of the first book. This is the one where Blair and Serena become serial killers. And it's wild to me the fact that the original author, Cecily Von Zagesa, came back for this book. She stopped at book eight and then comes back for this one. And I can honestly tell you why, but I'm gonna wait until I talk about this book later on. I have feelings. These are the 14 books. This is the order I read them in. And I would probably recommend reading it in this order. Although actually maybe read book 11 and then 13 and then read the prequel and then read Gossip Girl Psycho Killer, maybe. Actually, I would recommend that you don't read the series at all. Just let me do it for you. And instead of rating these books, because honestly, I'm not the target audience. I know this. I'm a 30 year old man reading the Gossip Girl books, what? And I know that these characters are supposed to be toxic and these are supposed to be really spoiled brats and stuff like that. So I'm not gonna rate these books. But what I will do is I will just tell you everything that happens, my thoughts on what happens, and essentially just gossip about these characters as if they were real people, because I need help. I think that's all I need to tell you before we dive in so grab yourself a glass of wine get yourself all cozy although if you need the toilet go now go piss girl come back and enjoy this is my villain origin story Ah, the one where it all began. This was apparently published on April 1st, 2002. And I'm not surprised that this was published on April Fool's Day because this feels like an April Fool's joke to myself. Retroactively though, I don't think this is a totally bad book. I mean, there are definitely problematic things about it. It hasn't aged very well. It kept me reading. So I guess that's kind of a good thing. This book is essentially the pilot episode of Gossip Girl. What you say in the pilot all happens in this book. And then after that, it does divulge. But I think this one is such a important foundation to the TV show that I feel like you could just watch the pilot episode and just pretend that this doesn't exist and then read on from there if you really want to do that. So we are introduced to the core characters. Now I did put on Instagram a poll asking people who I looked best as. Do I look better as Blair? Do I look better as Serena? Or do I look better as Jenny? You know just for suspense because you know this series didn't have any. I want to wait until a little bit later on to tell you the results of that. You let me know who you think I look best as and then I'll reveal what people voted for. We begin the series with a blog post from Gossip Girl and this is usually the case with every single book. They start off with a big blog post, usually starts off with some kind of monologue and then it goes into some questions and then sightings and things like that. I'm not gonna lie, Gossip Girl is rather redundant in the book series. Nobody really brings Gossip Girl up. There were only two times that I counted throughout all 14 books where Gossip Girl was actually mentioned by characters. And you do hear characters gossip and rumor about things which they probably got from the Gossip Girl website. But again, they just do not mention it. Only twice they've mentioned it, but there is no hunt for who Gossip Girl is. Just like the TV show, we are told that Serena has landed at Grand Central Station and the news of her arrival spreads fast within the Upper East Side. We are introduced to Blair and she has a bit of a tumultuous family life. She lives with her mum and her brother Tyler as well as Cyrus Rose who is seeing her mum. Now Blair's mum is not glamorous like she is in the TV show. She usually wears like sweats and she usually has the word juicy written on the back of her sweats and you never actually see her do any work or anything like that. It's very very odd. But you know, we are supposed to believe that they live in this amazing place, this amazing apartment. And we can definitely chalk it down to the parents and the way that they raise their children for a lot of the bad things and the bad choices that our main characters do and the way that they are just genuinely toxic people. Their parents believed in the quasi-European idea that the more access kids had to alcohol, the less likely they are to abuse it. And considering we're at a dinner party where these high schoolers are given just access to drink, but it does establish the fact that the parents are rather shit and they haven't raised their kids well. Okay, so we met Blair. We also meet Nate, who is Blair's boyfriend. And there is this really weird exchange between Cyrus and Nate about Blair. Cyrus asks Nate if he slept with Blair yet, which is so intrusive and like such a weird question to ask, especially about the high school daughter of the person you're seeing. Nate says he doesn't want to rush things, which isn't really Nate's choice at all. You're gonna find out how much I hate Nate the more we go on. But Cyrus wants to give him some advice and says, don't listen to a word that girl says. Girls like surprises. They want you to keep things interesting. You know what I mean? Dude, you're pretty much like, not yet, but you're like almost her stepfather. Like, 
Can we not? Especially since this book series does such a great grand job. Like it doesn't do things well in general, but one thing it does do well is how much it sexualizes high school children and glorifies the use of sex and alcohol and drugs and all of that for a teenage audience, by the way. Again, we'll get to that later. <laughs> I'm trying to rush things, but I have a lot of feelings, okay? It doesn't help as well with Nate, for instance, that whenever we do get a description of him, he's just referred to as God's gift to mankind. Like he is like the sexiest boy alive. It says he couldn't help looking hot. He was just born that way poor guy. And what's interesting as well is that Gossip Girl does sort of narrate the entire book series. They do add in a little flourish maybe sometimes at the end of a paragraph, kind of with a sort of little remark about what's just happened. So we do get that a lot in the book series. Blair and Nate are absolutely in love with one another. And then we are also introduced to Chuck Bass. Now, if you have watched the pilot episode of Gossip Girl, you will know that he is a huge sleazeball. And I can't get away with the fact that Cecily describes Chuck all the time as aftershave commercial handsome. She says that so many times. Fortunately, I think she realized that she used it all the time, so she stopped during one of the books. It still wasn't great, like getting this repetition of like how much he looked like an aftershave commercial model. We get it. We get it, but we also get told that he's the horniest boy in the school, which does check with the TV show. And I also think that because we get more of an insight in the characters, we see Chuck as more of a sleazeball than we ever do in the TV show. Like he's even more irredeemable at the start of the book series. And it's gonna be weird, and I'm saying this now just to keep you hooked, but I feel like Chuck probably has the best character growth or development by the end of the series. But I'm kind of saying that with a question mark at the end because Again, I can't get away with these characters. I'm trying to look at all the positives, but it's very hard to do. I'm just gonna put that out there though. I do think Chuck does a lot of development, but it's so odd and bizarre as well. I can't say that with 100% confidence. But just an example for Chuck's creepiness in the start of the series. When talking about Chuck and his past sort of endeavors during parties, once at a party in ninth grade, Chuck had hidden in a guest bedroom closet for two hours, waiting to crawl into bed with Caddy Farkas, who was so drunk she kept throwing up in her sleep. Chuck didn't even mind. He just got in bed with her. He was completely unshakable when it came to girls. So we get into bed with this really drunk girl. We don't find out if he slept with her or anything, but we say this a lot. We see Chuck crossing boundaries and touching and kissing and groping when it isn't welcome. So Blair and Nate want to do it for the first time. Blair has been waiting for the right moment because she's still a virgin and she thinks now during this dinner party is the right time. And just as they are sort of about to do it, that's when Serena walks in. Not in the bedroom where they're doing it, but like at the party, Blair's mum shouts, hey, Serena's back. And then we have what starts off, I think the series properly, especially when it comes to the love triangle between Serena, Nate and Blair. So firstly, we have Cyrus, this old man who is saying Blair's mum, come up to Serena. He kissed Serena on both cheeks and hugged her a little too tightly. Serena giggled, but she didn't flinch. She was used to being hugged by harmless, horny European gropers who found her completely irresistible. She was a full-on groper magnet. And the way that this series does portray Serena in particular, <sighs> It's problematic. It's almost towing the line between saying that Serena's asking for it when she isn't, but that's how the narrator is trying to portray it. And it's honestly so gross. Chuck then comes up to her and he goes to kiss her, but intentionally misses her cheek and kisses her on the lips. So there's another example of Chuck literally doing something that somebody didn't ask for. And then Serena sees Nate. Her heart sped up as Nate began walking toward her. He looked better than she remembered much better. My Gossip Girl voice is absolutely shite. We also got a sense here as well that Nate loves Serena, but he just doesn't want to say it out loud. So we do get a look into his inner turmoil because if you've seen the show, you will know that Nate and Serena hooked up and then Serena went off to boarding school, which is where she's been all this time and she's just come back from there, but they haven't told Blair. And at the time, Blair and Nate were together. So because cheating is such a huge part of the Gossip Girl book series, like literally when I tell you, all the drama that pretty much happens in the series is cheating, you're gonna Gonna believe me by the end of this video. So let's introduce the cheating counter. Once I realized that cheating was literally probably the main focus of the Gossip Wheel series, I put on my Instagram stories a sort of betting thing where I put on a question box and I asked everyone who watched the story, who do you think cheats the most out of these characters? So I put the cheating counter out there and I got everyone to submit who they thought was the biggest cheater. And before I tell you the results of that, I'm gonna go through some of the funnier comments that came through. Never seen Gossip Girl, but Vanessa sounds most like a whole. So her. <laughs> Vanessa sounds like a cheater. Name. I do apologize to all the Vanessas who are watching this right now. Blair has a name for it, but in brackets, have not read any. Jenny, never met one who didn't cheat. <laughs> I am so sorry to this person. It sounds like they have history. Chuck, I don't know shit about it, but he seems like an adulterer. Chuck, he seems sus. Dan, would be a classic nice boy thing to do. 
Can't argue with that. Haven't seen the show or read the books, but Chuck seems like the right answer. My 14 year old toxic self still loves him regardless. Chuck. Look, we can't follow our past teenage selves for anything. Let's be honest, there were so many things I enjoyed as a teenager that I shake my head at today. Never watched or read, but the name Nate gives me the vibe. And Chuck, not read, but name gives me vibes. Blair for sure. I love the confidence in that. I did tally up all the responses and these are the results. So with Blair, 21. Serena, 45. Nate, 48. Chuck, 62, Dan, 28, Jenny, 9, and Vanessa, 8. People thought Chuck was the biggest cheater. Vanessa got the least amount of votes for being a cheater, despite having a few comments saying Vanessa sounds like a cheater. I know the result of this. I know who was the biggest cheater, but I'm not going to tell you if the results were right just yet. So Blair comes out of the bedroom, and Blair saw Serena, her best friend, the girl she would always love and hate. So we already see, like, this really toxic friendship between the two, and this toxic friendship only gets worse as the series goes on. Blair does does hate the fact that Serena's talking to Nate and Chuck does say that oh look out Blair Serena's found herself her next victim and we don't actually really know why Blair hates Serena so much we have to assume that it's really just because Blair shines brighter without Serena there without Serena being the sort of queen of the school Blair has been able to step up to the plate instead but actually Blair doesn't actually know anything that happened between Nate and Serena oh I don't think sitting on the floor was a good idea but this is where I belong. You'll come to see that Blair is very self-absorbed and thinks that the entire world revolves around herself, which honestly, sometimes it isn't a bad thing. Blair says herself as the main character of a movie. And don't we all do that? Aren't we all the main character of our own lives? And Blair says that literally in her head as one big movie and she is the star. Except it does mean that her interactions with people are rather terrible. She is kind of a terrible person. <laughs> Serena asks Nate, does Blair know? And the first thing Nate says is, Blair who? <laughs> <laughs> Literally, your girlfriend? Oh, honestly, I'm starting to get really mad talking about Nate. This is the first time I've actually said things off my chest about Nate. Because I haven't spoken to anyone about this. This has all been trapped inside of me. And now I'm letting it all out. Oh my gosh, it feels like therapy. So now we have our main characters apart from like Jenny, Dan and Vanessa. We're not introduced to them just yet. But we are back at school. We are back at Constance Billiard. And there are a lot of rumours about Serena flying around. And actually, I felt so bad for Serena. There was a lot of speculation about why she was kicked out of boarding school. And they say some like really horrible things. It does show you just like how toxic gossip is which I guess is a good thing actually but at the same time it's like a lot in the series we have them speculate whether Serena has had a baby and she's had to leave in a different country that she slept with everyone she got kicked out there's a lot of slut shaming by the way all of the girls all of the women in the series don't actually have to do anything to be called a slut so there is a huge problem with slut shaming but it's something that the series, again, never tackles well. And it's the same with Blair's bulimia. So Blair does have bulimia. She does force herself to be sick a lot. And bulimia is something that I think that should be tackled and handled well. The fact that so many people know about this with Blair, Serena knows, Nate knows, nobody actually helps her. They say it happened. They know it's happening. They say her go into the bathroom to do it and they don't stop her. They don't even bring it up. And this is, again, a recurring problem in the series. A little bit later on, it does look like this might be addressed in a later book, which I'll talk about. We then get introduced to Jenny at school, and she is a 14-year-old girl, and every single time throughout the series, whenever Jenny is introduced, her boobs are the first thing that we find out about her. It would have been easier if her boobs weren't so incredibly huge. At 14, she was a 34D. Now, I'm not gonna pretend that I know what a 34D is, but I would tell you that yes, puberty, for girls and young girls especially, at this time, confusing, right? Your body's changing, and to say represented in a book is great, right? Not in the Gossip Girl series, because it's overtly sexualized, and it's the first and only thing that seems to come out about Jenny and the only thing that we get told every single time Jenny comes on the page. She has big boobs. She has bigger boobs than anyone else. People tease her for her big boobs. You know, it's just constantly about Jenny's boobs and she's 14. Yes, show us her struggles with her body, how she sees herself, body image. This series is not the one for that. And I will go into more detail when those storylines come up because again, it's just handled so very poorly in this series. I have to think Cecily Von Skesa was raised in a lab and she actually has no experience with being a teenager herself. So the cracks start showing Jenny's character now as well because she has this really weird infatuation with Serena and she even wonders 
how many times Serena has done it. Like, I guess these are kind of thoughts that go through a teenager's head, but when you see, like, how utterly obsessed Jenny becomes of Serena, this is just the first red flag. But Dan as well, her brother, Dan Humphrey, is also obsessed with Serena, because who isn't obsessed with Serena at this point? Chuck is gossiping about Serena, says that she's the sluttiest girl he's ever known, that she was all over him at the party, even though she wasn't. She didn't go anywhere near him, but that's what he's telling everyone. Dan ends up standing up and like even though he's only eavesdropping on the conversation he doesn't actually like say anything to them directly and they don't even know he's there so he starts to walk away dan turned his head and puckered his lips making a smooching sound three times as if he were giving each boy a big fat kiss on the lips why can you imagine somebody just standing up like not part of the conversation at all turning around going and then walking away, like, why? Dan's like trying to show it to them because he doesn't like hearing this gossip about Serena. But like, what are you actually doing with that? And a huge red flag for Dan right there. I should have done a red flag counter, but then the limit does not exist. Finally, we meet everyone's favorite, Vanessa Abrams. You know, the one who just like wants to be like all the other girls, not. So she has a shaved head. Vanessa Abrams has shaved her head so that she doesn't look like any of the other girls there. And when you have a character who would be willing to change their entire appearance, their entire piss, I'm starting to stir my words. I barely made it through this wine. Changing her appearance, changing her personality, just so she can stick it to the girls of Constance and show them that she is better than them, then that is another big red flag right there, isn't it? You might need to reevaluate your life morals if all you want to do is look down on the people around you. I mean, yes, the girls of Constance seem to be rather shallow, but like, they're teenagers for one, which I know sometimes I'm criticizing. Two, Vanessa, like you're sinking lower than everyone else by changing yourself to show it to them? Come on, girl. Anyway, Vanessa wants to be a filmmaker. She wants to, you know, record films, be what a cameraman kind of person. And the things that she likes to film are things like pigeons pecking used condoms and, you know, used gum on the sides of trash cans, things like that, you know, really artistic things like that. And she's also trying to get people to audition for a film she's doing and Dan Humphrey, the person she's in love with, is being the male lead in that sort of film. And then we took out a bit more of Dan and Jenny's sort of family history and how their mother ran out on them and went to Prague and yeah, they don't really talk to her much anymore and she seems to be out of their lives. But she has left them in the care of Rufus. Now Rufus, their dad, he doesn't really interact with the other parents. He doesn't really have a thing with Lily, I believe Serena's mum from the TV show. I don't believe they have any kind of connection at all in the books. There's nothing with them. The parents in the book series are very two-dimensional and I have to wonder just like how they got away with raising children. Dan and Jenny's shtick is that they are poorer than everyone else at Constance, even though they have, again, like this really great apartment. Nate gets an email from Blair saying that she is ready to have sex with him on Friday. Why Friday? I don't know, ask Rebecca Black. And then Serena, who, honestly, everything good happens to her, even though there's a lot of gossip going around about her, and I do feel really bad for her because the gossip is, like, really, really horrible about her and really nasty. She is the kind of character who is naturally great at everything and gets everything handed to her, usually accidentally. For example, she's just randomly touring this sort of art museum, and she gets photographed by these twins, these kind of fashion photographers. They photograph Serena, she leaves, and then somebody wants to see this photo of Serena and they're sort of a big wig and they get this photo of Serena on billboards on the sides of buses and things like that. And like Serena has like no bloody clue about all of this and it just happens. And this is how natural and easy things are for the characters in Gossip Girl because they don't lift a finger essentially. Like they don't actually like work or do anything that warrants them getting all of these good things happen to them. And I'm not gonna lie, I'm sick of saying bad people have good things happen to them. It should be happening to me instead. Nate is preparing himself to have sex with Blair and you know, Blair's still a virgin, which is absolutely fine. Like that shouldn't be shamed. And it's not really exactly shamed in the series. It's just that oh, I should be holding the book up. Why am I not holding the book up? Like losing their virginity and sort of striving to have sex is something that is just so forced down your throat throughout the entire series. It's just not done in a very good way. There are pressures, there are a lot of pressures on them from other kids around them, which if it was explored better, I would have really enjoyed reading about to say like how they would overcome that and stuff. Instead, I feel like this series just perpetuates the whole idea that you have to lose your virginity. Like if teens read this now, I would actually worry about them. Another scene you might find familiar from the pilot episode is that Blair is doing the kiss on the lips party and there is something wrong with the invitations and Jenny overhears this and she offers to do the invitations for free. So I lost my train of thought. I thought it looked good in the viewfinder there so I was like taking photos. <laughs> what was it again? Oh yeah, so like 
Jenny's doing the invitation. She wants to be invited. And then we have Serena. She ends up auditioning for Vanessa's film thing that she's doing. So this is like the first time that Serena and Dan like properly meet. And there is this instant chemistry, this instant connection between them. And Vanessa even says this through this sort of like screen testing thing. And she wants to put a stop to that because she is in love with Dan. Vanessa loves Dan. And she does not want to see Dan with Serena. So even though Serena was the best person to audition that day, she's way better than Marjorie, for instance. Marjorie auditioned beforehand and she was really bad. But because Vanessa <laughs> would rather sabotage her own film than cast Serena in it because she loves Dan, she tells Serena, she gives her a call and she's like, look, you didn't get the part, I'm giving it to Marjorie. Me and Dan both agree that you were too polished for it. Even though Dan has no idea about this, she lies about this, to sort of drive a wedge between Dan and Serena. So Serena is so upset, like she's trying so hard to make friends, like she's trying so hard to get extra credit, you know, with the college admissions person saying that she has to do more at the school. She's just like, what's going on? Like everything's crumbling around her. And honestly, genuinely, I'm not the biggest fan of any character in this series, but in this book, I genuinely felt for Serena. So Serena wants to do her own movie and she asks Blair for help, but Blair doesn't want to do it. And Jenny is the only person who signs up for it. So Serena and Jenny kind of form a little bit of a friendship, even though Jenny's ulterior motive is that she wants to be a little bit more popular. She wants to be friends with Serena, which is like kind of fine. Like it's a good storyline for her if <laughs> she was a good character. Again, like none of the characters are good. I'm sorry, I'm gonna shut up. Blair and Serena do end up meeting for the drink. And I feel so bad for Serena here as well, because because Blair says that she feels sorry for her parents. You know, like Serena tries to tell her that the rumors about her being kicked out of boarding school were not true. Like she didn't sleep with everyone. She doesn't have a baby. She only got kicked out of boarding school because she missed the first week of classes because she was in France. And Blair just doesn't want to hear it. Blair ends up going up and leaving her. And remember at this point, Blair doesn't know about Serena and Nate. She is literally just being a bitch to Serena because Serena went to boarding school and essentially left her, but also because Serena's back. So it's kind of like you can't win with Blair. And then when Blair leaves, in walks Chuck. <laughs> Serena, she is feeling very sad and like you can really feel that through her emotions. And she allows Chuck to take her up to his suite. She accidentally spilled her drink and Chuck is like feeling her crotch and stuff. And he's like, oh, I can't even really see it. In his suite as well, Serena has a drink and she starts to feel really tired. Now it's not explained if Serena was drugged by Chuck, but it's kind of assumed in a way because she does suddenly start to feel tired and she starts falling asleep. Chuck then proceeds to bite her big toe and kiss her ankle. And he lowered his face to hers and kisses her. And this is when it gets like really creepy and so irredeemable of Chuck. Serena Serena let Chuck kiss her for a while because he was heavy and she couldn't get him off her. Now fortunately Serena does get away from Chuck before things progress, but not without Chuck kicking up a storm saying like, oh you'll sleep with anyone but you won't sleep with me. He's one of those really creepy men who thinks he's entitled to a woman's body because he's a man. He's a man so automatically Serena belongs to him. Or any woman for that matter. Oh you'll put out for everyone else but you won't put out for me. And I'm just like dude shut up before I throw my wine in your face. At this time Nate and Blair are beginning to have sex for the first time and Nate, well, this is actually a really weird uh, interaction as well. Blair gapes at his erection. It looked like it was going to take over the world. Okay, <laughs> I'm scared. Mum, pick me up. But then Nate does get a bit of a heart and tells Blair before they go all the way. However, the way he does it drives me wild. And it's the first instance where you really see Nate and his true character in where he feels guilt-wise, like in if he thinks he's done anything wrong. So he confesses, he says that he hooked up with Serena, they kissed and then they had sex. And then Blair is instantly furious with Serena, not with Nate. I mean, she kicks him out, but like she is more furious with Serena. She says, who hasn't had sex with Serena, that nasty slutty bitch? And Nate only wanted to tell her so that she didn't think this was his first time. Literally, these are his words. It just happened and it was only that one time, promise. I just didn't want you to think that it was my first time when it wasn't, I had to tell you. So he had to tell her that he slept with Serena just because he doesn't want her to think that it was his first time. Oh, well, thanks. Oh yeah, you're not losing your virginity with me. But like, so what? Like, that's just like such a bizarre reason to tell her. Just because he doesn't want her to think that it was his first time? And he says he only did it once, but actually they did it twice. Him and Serena, when they hooked up, they actually did it twice. So he lies to Blair. He says he only did it once. And then as soon as Blair storms out on Nate, he instantly thinks, he wondered if he kissed Serena right now, full on the lips and told her he loved her, how she'd respond. 
So you have girlfriends just walked out on you and they haven't officially broken up, like Blair's just stormed out. And the first thing you think of is how it would feel to kiss Serena. This is a recurring theme, by the way. And then Gossip Girl on the website as well. I, this is how I think it's impossible to pick one person to be Gossip Girl. I'm still not gonna tell you who it is or if you find out who it is, but like this is just shows you like how impossible it is for anyone to be Gossip Girl. Can you believe N? He was this close to getting a nice slice of bee pie, if you know what I mean. I guess why I suppose to admire his self-control, his ability to keep the old hot dog in the bun. And this is published right after this has happened. How does this get to Gossip Girl? How does Gossip Girl know that they were this close unless they were in the room? So then you're probably thinking, oh, well is Gossip Girl Blair or Nate? I'm not saying anything, but there are so many instances like this when something really personal happens in like closed doors, like nobody else can see, where they seem to know what's happened. And now if you're wondering about Eric, who is Serena's brother. So Eric is actually Serena's older brother and he has been off to college for a few years. She talks to Eric all the time on the phone. They're actually quite close, but like Eric's absolutely fine and he's off doing his own thing. So it's not like the TV show at all. So Serena decides not to go to Kiss on the Lips even after getting the invitation from Jenny. And she ends up bringing Vanessa instead because she again wants help with her movie. And Vanessa invites her to see her sister Ruby play because her sister Ruby's in a band and Serena goes to her. At the same time, Jenny goes to the Kiss on the Lips party hoping that Serena will be there, not knowing that Serena has kind of ditched the party. And then this is when like Blair is very, very shady. Jenny is talking to Blair, but Blair doesn't want anything to do with her. So Blair sends Chuck to Jenny. You know what happens at the end of the pilot episode with Chuck. Blair sends Chuck to Jenny and gets him to talk to her so that Blair doesn't have to talk to her. And considering everyone knows Chuck's reputation, the way he gropes girls without their consent, you know Jenny's a 14 year old girl, Blair, and you've just sent Chuck to her. You've literally just thrown her into shark infested waters. You bitch. She just did all your invitations for you for free. So Chuck asks Jenny if she wants to dance and Jenny's all like infatuated with him because she's like, oh my God, an older guy and he's really cute, like talking to me. Like Jenny doesn't really know his reputation, even though she should, they're at the same school. Jenny's very selective about what she does and doesn't know. But Chuck asks to dance and then she says yes and he says good girl and he's talking to her like she's a dog. And that's exactly how the narrator describes it. Like he says to her, good girl, he said, like she was a dog. This is how Chuck says girls, as animals, as dogs, like dogs for him to control. Dan also blows up the party and goes to see Vanessa and then sees Serena's there and he's just like absolutely like Pff. And you know what, it's actually really sweet to see how much Dan really does care and love Serena. It does say that Dan felt like Cinderella and it really does kind of flip the gender roles between Serena and Dan, like the fact that Dan felt like the sort of fairy tale princess around Serena. Like it was actually really sweet and wholesome in this book. And considering a lot of the relationships, a lot of the friendships are very toxic, that was such a nice thing to say in this book. The Serena and Dan thing, we all know how it turns out in the TV show, but in the book series, you're gonna be surprised. At the party, Nate is trying to confront Blair, especially after the confession that he slept with Serena. He knew Blair was in the bathroom, thrown up as usual. The question was, should he go rescue her? It was the type of thing a good, concerned boyfriend would do. As we all know, Nate is not a good, concerned boyfriend. Nate is not a good person at all. He knows that Blair is struggling with bulimia, and that's exactly what she's doing right now. And you know what? He doesn't go and help Blair. He never does. He never, ever does. And you know what really pisses me off? And like, Obviously Blair seems to be a lot more forgiven than I could ever be because Nate, the only ever time he apologizes for anything in the series, just saying, this is Nate's explanation of why he slept with Serena. Not the fact that he told her that he loves her, by the way, because apparently Nate absolutely loves Serena and Serena loves Nate. That doesn't matter. What Nate tells Blair is, I think the only reason I did it, I mean that I did it with Serena, is because I knew she'd do it, but it was you I wanted all along. So he's making Serena look like a slut that she would just sleep with him and he did it only because he knew she would sleep with him. And Blair says, or at least thinks, he'd said it just right, exactly the way she'd written in the script in her head. She put her arms around Nate's neck and let him hold her. His clothes smell like pot. He is addicted to drugs. Is this ever addressed properly? Once? And not in a good way. So Blair has forgiven Nate because he said that he wanted to be with Blair all along despite sleeping with Serena and gave her a bullshit story, which isn't true. It's not true. The excuse that he gives her is not true. He just lied to her. But that does mean that Blair and Nate are back together and they don't deserve to be. I'm furious with Nate for lying and for being a creep, but I'm furious with Blair as well for forgiving him so easily. She needs to wake up and smell the condoms. While this is all happening, 
Chuck has Jenny. And it's definitely a lot worse in the book than it is in the TV show in the pilot episode when Chuck, I believe, has Jenny on the roof and he's really only just trying to kiss her and she's like fending him off. And then Dan and Serena interfere before anything really happens in the book. Firstly, Jenny and Chuck are off on the side. Chuck had his hands full of Jenny Humphrey. Jenny wished the DJ would bring up the temple. She was trying to dance as fast as she could to keep Chuck from groping her, but it was having the opposite effect. Every time she moved her shoulders, her boobs bounced out of her dress and practically hit him in the face. She's 14. I just want to kiss you, Chuck said. He bent his head down and enveloped her mouth in his pressing his tongue against her teeth with such force that she let out a little gasp. Jenny opened her mouth and let him thrust his tongue deep into her throat. Jenny escapes to the bathroom and Chuck follows her. So she's in the stall and Chuck is waiting outside of this stall for Jenny. She could see Chuck's feet standing outside the stall. All right, he said, but I'm not finished with you yet. So she is like there pretending to pee. All right, he said, that's it, I'm coming in. And that's when Jenny messages Dan. And Dan at this time is with Serena. Dan doesn't say anything about it being Chuck. Serena just wants to tag along. In fact, Jenny doesn't even say anything about it being Chuck, which I know in the TV show, that's what like drives Serena to be like, oh my God, we need to get there now. But there's no mention of Chuck in the text. So Serena arrives at the party. Blair tells Nate when she sees Serena, go over there and tell Serena that you're never speaking to her again. He's on friends anymore. And so Nate does that, what she asks. After that happens, Serena and Blair look at one another. Instead of glaring at each other, the two girls smiled. It was a strange smile and neither girl knew what the other meant by it. And I kind of like that. There's some kind of thing between these two girls. Like their relationship is very rocky and unpredictable. And I don't understand or know what's gonna come with these girls at this time. I mean, I do know after, but like right now, it was intriguing. But by chance, Serena goes into the bathroom and finds Jenny. And there, Chuck had stood Jenny up on the toilet seat lid in the end stall and pulled her dress down so he could get at those massive jugs. He has literally exposed Jenny right now. It's definitely worse than what happens to the TV show. And then Dan randomly comes in as well. He's like, Jenny, are you in here? Oh my God. And then has a little bit of a fight with Chuck. And then Chuck is shouting all of this stuff at Serena. And it's, yeah, that kind of plays out like how it does on the TV show. Dan takes Jenny and Serena into a taxi and they leave. Oh, also actually at the same time as well, I totally forget about this because I find Vanessa just like, why is she even there? Why is Vanessa there? She gets over Dan very quickly with her saying how much that he has fallen in love with Serena and there is a bartender at the place Vanessa was called Clark and she kisses him, he kisses her and they're now a couple. So that happened. But I honestly, I don't care for Vanessa. I don't care for anyone. And the ending is pretty sweet with this one with Dan and Serena. It does give you hope that they would be a really great couple and Dan is like, I don't see you the way that other people see you. I see beyond the gossip. And that is just like so wholesome and lovely, isn't it? Well, things are about to take a turn. I am gonna assume that now the TV show and the book series go on their own different paths and it's probably for the better. So at the start of this book, we have Blair and Nate. They're still a couple. And Blair's father has come to town. You know, he's been in France. He's been with his partner Giles and he is gay now. Ugh, I cannot get over the homophobia. <laughs> the homophobia of the series. Firstly though, we do get a look into the fact that her dad is rather selfish. And Blair is like very thankful that he's there and says, thank you so much for coming to see me. And he instantly says, I'm not here for you. I'm just here to show off. This is why like the dialogue in the Gossip Girl series is just so strange because I don't feel like people talk the way that they should or the way that they would realistically in real life. But it does show you straight away that Blair is craving for, well, love really. And her parents just haven't really shown her any of that. It is honestly just so sad. So Blair's dad, he used to be straight, right? And when he was straight, he was a normal acting man. And now that he's gay, he is acting so flamboyantly and so, well, as they put it, gay. Like, they literally say he's acting gay now. And it's like, people who realise, or people who slowly realise their sexuality, because I genuinely believe it's fluid, it's very confusing. For some reason, as soon as her dad says he's gay, he instantly changes everything about him and he acts gay. Like, it's a huge stereotype. And it's one that I think is done so poorly in this series. I need wine to talk about the gay representation of the series because it only gets worse from here, of course. Nate says he just wanted to get this dinner over with. Not that he minded hanging out with Blair's flaming father. Flaming father. It was actually kind of entertaining to see how gay he'd become. <laughs> 
and Blair, her father's voice and mannerisms were completely different from when she'd seen him nine months ago. Then he'd been a conservative, suit-wearing lawyer, all clean lines and sharp edges, perfectly respectable. Now he was totally camp with his plucked eyebrows and lavender shirt and matching socks. So he isn't respectable now because he's gay? Sure, she wanted her father to be happy and it was okay for him to be gay, but did he have to be so obvious about it? Oh, so she hates the fact that he is obviously gay. Uh, okay. Nate himself, so while Blair has gone to the bathroom to throw up, you know, because she's absolutely sickened by what she's seeing, she does say she knew it was disgusting and that she had to learn to stop, but whenever she got nervous, she made herself throw up. It was her only bad habit. I mean, one, bulimia is not a habit, and the way that it isn't addressed in the series in a positive way shows me that the author herself doesn't know what she's talking about when it comes to bulimia. You know, it's an eating disorder. It's not a bad habit. And when you have that sentence where Blair, she only does it when she is anxious or when she's nervous, like that's a problem. And you know what? The fact that she knows that is the first step to overcoming this problem, but she doesn't. And it's infuriating to me because there are many times when this could have been tackled in such a healthy way and it just isn't. Nate glanced sideways at the other diners in the restaurant. He wondered if they thought he and Mr. Waldorf were together, boyfriends. To squelch such speculation, he pushed up the sleeves of his green cashmere sweater and cleared his throat in a very manly way. Yeah, Nate, you've just showed everyone how straight you are. This is what we did. <coughs> Am I straight now? If only it was that easy. He literally resents the idea that people would think he was gay, that he would try and, and bear in mind this is all in his head, that he would try and show them, oh, I'm not gay. Look at this, I've just rolled up my sleeves and I've just coughed in a very manly way. Honestly, they need a better education. So moving on from all that homophobia, we have Dan and Serena, they've gotten very close and they are together. And again, it's very nice to say because Dan, he says he's from the west side and Serena's from the east side. So we have these two worlds collide. They can't be more different from one another, but they just match. And Serena doesn't have a single friend in New York and she's just really grateful for Dan. The way Dan says Serena is rather wholesome too. She had the ability to be sad and happy at the same time. She was like a lone angel, floating above the surface of the earth, laughing with delight because she could fly but crying out of loneliness, Serena turned everything ordinary into something extraordinary. And yeah, that is pretty true about Serena. She is a tortured soul, just like Dan. Dan says he's a tortured soul and he's sad and she's sad and out of loneliness, they both found each other. And it is so lovely. If the book series stopped here, I would still find it rubbish, but I wouldn't find it as bad as, you know, all 14 books together. Before his nerves could paralyze him, he leaned in and kissed her on the lips ever so gently. Like, how nice is that? Like, right now, Serena and Dan are my favorite characters. It's so funny I say that when Dan probably becomes my least favorite character by the end of it, maybe? So the storyline of this is that the teens are having interviews for their chosen universities and Nate and Serena have interviews for Brown, while Blair has an interview for Yale. All of that's happening the same weekend. Nate and Blair are trying to have sex again. She still hasn't had sex with them yet, but they keep getting interrupted. Also, Nate accidentally jabs her in the ribs. So to show you how immature and petty Blair is, she ends up biting him. She literally leaves marks on his skin and she says, there, that's what you get for hurting me. How old are you, Blair? Who does that? Well, she's 17. But like, even at 17, I wouldn't be doing petty shit like that. Blair has been interrupted by her mum and her mum has announced that her and Cyrus are getting married. She's also getting married not long after Thanksgiving, but on Blair's birthday. As a mother, can you not pick a date that doesn't coincide with your daughter's birthday? Again, it does show you the inside of Blair's upbringing and how she's been treated by her parents this entire time. And I do feel sorry for her because of her parents. It's, again, a fine line because Blair does make really bad decisions and she's not a nice person. Yeah, Blair acts out a lot. She acts out a lot because her parents don't show her the love and devotion they should. We have more body shaming and self-loathing. Serena looks into the mirror and calls herself a fatso. And we have Jenny looking into the mirror and calling herself a freak. And again, I don't think the series is good for young girls, especially, I guess, teens, impressionable teens to read. There are times when things are like, are oh, the shorter the skirt, the better the, the girl or something like that. And it's just like, are these really messages that we really should be telling people or like showing young, impressionable teens? And even like the guys who are reading this as well, like if any guys read this, thinking that it's all 
okay to slut shame girls for not doing anything. Nate has kind of distanced himself from Blair as well for no good reason. She says I love you to him on the phone and he just like hangs up on her. So Blair thinks that she needs to make it up to him so she goes to a store, I think it's Barney's or something, and she tries to pay for some pajamas but her card gets declined. Would they really mind if she just took them. It wasn't like she hadn't tried to pay for them. Besides, she spent enough money in Barney's. She deserved a free gift. Now, I've never stolen anything in my life, apart from a few things. So I find it so hard not to judge Blair right now. Yeah, she thinks she's entitled to just steal a present for Nate because she spent enough money in that store. It does really show you, and again, I can't really criticize it too much because I feel like this is the point of the series, is to highlight how toxic and bad these kids are and like how spoilt and bratty they are. But the fact that she has taken this and gone with it, thinking she's entitled to it, is so bad. But Serena, followed her in and she sees the whole thing. So Serena goes back to school. There is a sort of showcase for people's films. So Vanessa's film is shown. It's fine. Although I honestly, I, every single time her films are described, it just sounds like a pile of shit. Literally, it's mentioned that she just films grass growing. She films grass growing and it's autistic. But Serena, she shows her film and Vanessa helped her film it. And it's apparently the most autistic thing anyone's ever seen. Serena's film, on the other hand, had turned out to be the most austere and cerebral part of art Vanessa had ever encountered. Dan hasn't seen it yet and he wants to, so Serena goes to Dan's apartment and she comes across Rufus, his dad, and Rufus tells Serena, I don't know why he does this, but he tells Serena that Dan has been writing poems about her. The poems are in his notebook on his bedside table. The idea of Dan writing poetry about her made her more nervous than the idea of him watching her film. Was Dan way, way, way more into her than she thought he was? And then we get into Dan's shitty poetry. I don't mean to be horrible and I know poetry is very subjective but I subjectively think that Dan's poetry is awful. Throughout the entire series he writes poetry and it's god awful. It's the worst stuff I've ever read and I'm going to demonstrate it to you in this video so that you know that I'm not just being a bitch how bad his poetry is. When I cut myself shaving I think of your teeth on my lip and the pain becomes pleasure. <laughs> Serena reads us and freaks out, obviously. At the same time, we have Vanessa as well, wishing that her boyfriend Clark was more like Dan. Jenny is out and about, and guess who she walks into in the park? Nate. Nate is getting stoned. And Jenny introduces herself as Jennifer because she wants to seem a little bit more sophisticated, a little bit more older. And Nate cannot take his eyes off her boobs. Nate noticed Jenny's chest. Man, was it ever huge. He couldn't let her get away, not without Jeremy and other guys getting a chance to check her out. It felt great to be with her, if only Blair knew how easy it was to make him happy. So, we have Nate having these simple thoughts. He's still Blair's boyfriend, so he's come across Jenny and instantly sexualizes her because of her boobs. And Jenny is like really crushing hard for Nate. In fact, by the end of the chapter, she says that she is in love with him. Honestly, as a teen, I can kind of see where she's coming from because if a guy was nice to me and he was absolutely dropped dead gorgeous, no doubt my knickers would be around my ankles in two seconds flat. But we ain't talking about me. We ain't talking about me. We're talking about these characters, these fictional characters in this book series because we are grown adults and this is what we do. But Nate should not be thinking about this way about Jennifer or Jenny, because he's in a relationship with Blair. And not just that, but she's 14. She is 14, she is three years younger than him. The absolute creep. Nate invites Jenny to his house. Again, still in a relationship with Blair. And Jenny tells him that she is 14, so he knows that she is 14. She doesn't, you know, lie about her age or anything. Nate reached up and touched her curly brown hair, combing it ever so slightly with his fingers. Then he put his hand down again. I know, he said. It's okay. Is it? <laughs> Is it okay, Nate? No, it's not. It's not okay at all. She's 14, you're 17. While all this is happening, Nate is just ignoring Blair. Every time she tries to call him, email him, message him, he ignores it with no explanation why. And it leads Blair to resort to putting her fingers down her throat, making her sick because she is nervous. And again, if we explore this in a really healthy way, it would be amazing. And the narrator, Gossip Girl, the, the whole narrator, everything, just treats it as a joke. Even if she actually decided to eat, she could always throw it up later. Oh, I'm so stressed. This is book two. Dan thinks that he can send Serena some poetry. Listen to this. Your rope snuck around my neck, I jumped. Your lips kissed me as I fell and falling still. Why would you send her that? Back with Nate and Jenny, 
Nate offers Jenny pot, but she says no. And this is actually why it's really great because he doesn't pressure her to have drugs. She says no and he respects it. So I will give this book props for that. Always feel comfortable saying no and never ever pressure anyone to have drugs. Nate says about Jenny, he couldn't get over how comfortable he felt with her. He usually had to smoke up or have a few drinks before meeting Blair just to deal with her constant planning and nagging about the future. But with Jennifer, he didn't even need to be high. Okay, but Blair is still your girlfriend. Do you want to tell her this? He even knows Blair won't be happy with this. Even Nate's friend says Blair will not be happy with this and he doesn't care. He says he's not going to ditch Blair for Jennifer, but he's a liar. So Dan thinks that him and Serena are boyfriend and girlfriend and you would assume that after how much time they spend together, but Serena is starting to find him a lot more stalker-esque. And I'm wondering, did Serena here predict Penn Bedgley's role as Joel Goldberg in the hit Netflix TV show You. Back with Blair then, Nate is still ignoring her. Let's not feel too bad for Blair though. She ends up almost kicking a dog and telling her to fuck off. And then she meets her stepbrother Aaron. And Aaron tries to be nice to her, but Blair just does not want anything whatsoever to do with him. So he's trying to talk to Blair and Blair's like, does this asshole think they were having a conversation? She also finds out that he's vegan and she wants to throw raw meat in his face. You know, not everyone can be Blair Waldorf, but the question is, should anyone be Blair Waldorf? We have more problematic body issue things happening here as well. Les Miller's trying on some wedding dresses and then Rita says, the way to any girl's heart is to tell her she looks tiny. Girls kill to be tiny. And there's nobody to tell this narrator that they're fucking wrong. Blair desperately wants to get away from her mother and Aaron offers up to take her to her Yale interview and they're gonna leave a bit early. They're gonna leave the night before. And again, at the same time, Serena's off to Brown to have her interview and she's going with Dan. However, they have a chance encounter, which happens all the time. Despite New York City being a whole big ass city, the chances of running into the Gossip Girl characters are low, but never zero. And here we have Nate end up running into Serena and Dan. Nate and his other pothead friends. They hitch a ride, they're driving under the influence of drugs, and they end up getting a motel together where Nate and Serena end up sharing a bed, even though her and Dan are a couple. And especially since Dan wakes up in the middle of the night to find Nate and Serena lying together, holding hands. There's no indication that they've kissed or had sex there, but it's still sketchy. It's still weird. Especially since Nate is like stringing Jenny along at this point and is supposed to still be in a relationship with Blair. He just hasn't told her that he's seeing other women. Back with Blair and Aaron, Blair ends up letting her head down a little bit. Aaron gets her to come out of her shell a bit more and she starts drinking with him, stuff like that. It seems almost like something would happen between them, but Blair's like, oh no, he's gonna be my stepbrother. Absolutely not. And thank God it doesn't go that route. But Blair doesn't put an alarm on for her Yale interview and the car battery ends up dying. So we're actually having some drama right now. Oh my god, like actually we're getting something a little bit exciting. And especially since the narrator's like, oh, she forgot to put on her alarm. Actual tension. I actually had chills at this point. They do wake up in the morning, Blair realizes she's late and the car battery is dead. She blames Aaron for everything because nothing is Blair's fault and he has to have his battery jump started or something. I don't know, Carl's. I don't drive. I don't know how these things work, but apparently it'll take two hours and Blair's just absolutely forming, even though she was absolutely fine with having fun the night before. Anyway, she goes for her Yale interview and it goes terribly wrong. Firstly, she says, my dad went to Yale, you know, he wasn't gay then. Then she crosses her legs and looks like she's sitting on the toilet. And then when he asks her if she's read anything in the last few months, she's trying to think of something that she's read and she just ends up learning out that her life is a mess. She stole a pair of pajamas for her boyfriend. He didn't even thank her. And she relays all of her problems on him. Like she has an actual breakdown. And you know, a big part of me is like, this is a cry for help. But with this being the Gossip Wheel series, we're just gonna suppress everything. We're not gonna address this. He asks, oh, this is so awkward. He asks, uh, do you have any questions for me? And she says, if you can promise me to let me in early, I promise to be the best student Yale University has ever had. Can you promise me that, Jason? And he says, I'll see what I can do. And she stood up on tiptoe and kissed him on the cheek. So she kisses her Yale interviewer. She didn't answer any of his questions. Did you ever watch Glee? You know the season three episode, Chalk, when Rachel Berry is singing in front of Whoopi Goldberg, who is a sort of admissions person for the place that 
Rachel wants to go to. I've forgotten what it's called, okay? But she ends up messing up the interview. This is what this feels like. She's literally just messed up her interview for her dream university. At the same time, Dan, Nate, and Serena are having their interviews and their interviews go a lot better and Dan realises that Serena just isn't into him as much as he is into her. What's happening with Vanessa at this time, you ask? Well, she's with Jenny and she asks the most inappropriate question. She asks a 14-year-old, with a rack like that, how come you don't have like seven boyfriends? And then Jenny says that she does have a boyfriend. She wasn't Dan's little sister, Jenny, anymore. She was Jennifer, her own person, with a hot senior for a boyfriend. Does Nate know that? No, because they haven't actually said that they were boyfriend and girlfriend. Like, this is the thing with these kids. They jump to so many conclusions, I can't keep up with them. And especially since Nate is still with Blair. They're still boyfriend and girlfriend. So let's fast forward a tiny little bit, a couple of chapters later. Nate and Jenny are hanging out in the park. Nate pulled her toward him. They both kept their eyes open, smiling as they kissed. One, having your eyes wide open as you kiss is fucking weird. But two, Nate, you've got a girlfriend. She's called Blair. What are you doing kissing a 14 year old? And not just that, but it is now Blair's birthday as well as her mum's wedding. I do, honestly, I feel bad for Blair with what's going on here. She's messed up her Yale interview. Her parents are shit. Nate, her boyfriend, is ignoring her and getting off with someone else. Nate has come as well. So this is like the first time they've seen each other. Nate has been very elusive. And he tells Blair, I'll oh, ask that photographer to take a photo of us. So she goes to ask, or can you take a photo of me and my boyfriend? She turns around and Nate has just left her. He's just gone. It's her bloody birthday. And he's just left her without saying anything. Nate has run off to a hotel where Jenny is and he has a feeling that he's gonna get in trouble for this. What gives you that feeling? Hmm? Is it because you have a girlfriend? And Jenny's like, why? We're not doing anything wrong. So we're assuming that Jenny doesn't know that Blair and Nate are a couple. However, remember, gossip travels fast. There's no way Jenny doesn't know that. Dan and Serena have a bit of a heart to heart and they seem to get over their issues because Dan has a lot of, you know, insecurity issues with Serena and her not being into him as much as he is into her. And they have an honest conversation. She says that he was like too intense, but they seem to be okay. They don't actually like break up or anything. She asks if he wants to dance, he says no, and so she just goes off and dances on her own. But then Dan and Blair both see Nate and Jenny kissing, and Dan is mortified because that's his little sister, and Blair is also mortified because that's her fucking boyfriend. And what also frustrates me as well is every single time somebody cheats, or, you know, some kind of drama happens, they don't react the way that they should. Blair just leaves. She doesn't confront him. I know what you're thinking, oh, you know, some people would probably just leave because being confronted with that is like quite traumatizing. But let me tell you, there's never ever a proper confrontation with any of these cheating things happening. And even this isn't ever really resolved between them. So just trust, just trust me. Dan tries to break them up, but Vanessa stops him. And then he starts seeing Vanessa in like a really like sexual kind of way. Her head was shaved like an army dude's. Her skin was so pale it gleamed. She looked pretty fabulous, at least to Dan. Well, I guess he got over Serena very quickly. But also let's remember that Vanessa is also still with Clark. So while Serena and Chuck are watching Dan and Vanessa, Dan and Vanessa start to get really close. Vanessa couldn't believe she was actually flirting with Dan. She hadn't even broken up with Clark yet, but it was kind of fun to be such a slut. She leaned forward and kissed Dan on his quivering lips. So we have Vanessa and Dan enter the cheating scoreboard. And so Dan has cheated on Serena. I would consider kissing someone and sleeping with someone cheating. So both of them just did that right there and then. Poor Serena's heartbroken. It's just a mess. It's just a mess. It's a sign of the fucking times, as Harry Styles once said. But Blair and Serena, they kind of find each other and they decide to watch Breakfast at Tiffany's, their favorite movie. So it's not really a terrible ending for them both. They both seem to be trying to move on, even though they haven't resolved anything with their boyfriends or ex-boyfriends now. Anyway. <laughs> From page one of book three, Dan and Vanessa are officially a couple. Blair ends up meeting Miles, who is the son of a restaurant owner and a friend of Aaron's. And Aaron wants to keep Blair for himself because he has a big crush on his stepsister. The more I think about it, the more it's like, okay, it's like kind of innocent. He doesn't really act upon it. So at the minute, it's fine. It's fine. <laughs> on page 10, Chuck was handsome in a dark aftershave commercial sort of way. Cecily, stop this. You're a writer. Please describe him in a different way. Chuck is also trying to get into Blair's pants at the minute as well, especially since Nate never got the chance to take Blair's virginity. Chuck now wants to take it. So at this black and white party, Blair passes Nate and Nate with Jenny. Nate's mouth opened as Blair swished by. She looked hot. No, she looked better than hot. 
Suddenly, he felt confused. He wanted to grab Blair's arm and say, come back here, I made a mistake. But then Jenny squeezed his hand and he looked down into her soulful brown eyes and deeply plunging cleavage and instantly forgot about Blair again. This man doesn't know what he wants. He doesn't deserve any of the things that he wants. We also get more of like Dan and Vanessa's weird relationship. Daniel Humphrey bit Vanessa's pinky nail off and spat it onto the brown shag rug on his bedroom floor. Oh, he's like biting off her nails? Uh, I, I don't think he took off the whole nail. Like just the top of the nail, but it's still weird. This is supposed to be Gossip Girl. Where is the glamour? Where is the glitz? Instead, they're like biting each other's nails off. It's... Ugh. Dan and Vanessa are talking about like having sex and stuff. And Dan is actually still a virgin. Vanessa's not. And again, we get more seeds of Dan's misogyny from this. Like this is like the worst book for Dan. I'm not gonna lie. Like I think this is like Dan's worst book. Because he questions like, why did you have to go and have sex with another guy for? Oh wait, was she supposed to get your permission? While you were with someone else? You went together. And do you want to know what's worse about the Jenny and Nate relationship as well? And is that it's literally stated that even though Jenny's 14, I've got the receipts on page 30, despite her chest, Jenny still looked about 10 years old. So we have a 17 year old getting with somebody who looks like they're 10. Oh, you nasty bitch. Cancel them. Absolute scumbag. Blair gets with Miles, they kiss, and then she does an exam where a teacher ends up like looking up at her and is apparently in love with her because he keeps blushing every single time Blair looks at him. The teachers of like this school are honestly scum. And we will talk about this more later on as well because there are a couple of instances in a later book where we cross a line. To get the gossip train running, Serena has been hanging out with a pop star called Flo. And even though she's been hanging out with them, all the gossip sites are saying that her and Flo are in a relationship. I mean, even though she hasn't really made anything official with him and it's just gossip, she seems to be moving on from Dan quite quickly. Speaking of Dan, we get more of his shitty poems. He writes one for Vanessa. Paper cuts, slicing lemons, salt water in my eyes, your face, a nut, you soothe my cuts and oil my engine. <laughs> It's like he just looked around and wrote down whatever he bloody saw. A book, a lantern, speaking to a camera, picking up my glass of wine, I drink it, I put it down, I need to go piss girl. It's like anybody could do it. When Dan does it, he really does make other people feel like they can do it too. And I know you guys are gonna be like, oh, he's one of those. But Dan mistakes Frankenstein as like Frankenstein's monster. He calls Frankenstein's monster Frankenstein. I can't forgive him for that, that's disgusting. But then he starts writing a poem for Vanessa. <laughs> And <laughs> it goes a little something like this. You are my Frankenstein, my Lichtenstein. You are divine. And he ends up sending Vanessa this, by the way. Does he have no shame? He's literally referring to Vanessa as Frankenstein's monster because he's confused and Frankenstein is Frankenstein's monster. And he's supposed to be some kind of like literature expert, by the way. It's like a rookie mistake. Everybody knows this. Anyway, we get back to Nate and Jenny. Nate is comparing Jenny to Blair constantly, always comparing their boobs. And Jenny had those incredible breasts while Blair's were just sort of there. Nice, but nothing spectacular. And then he goes on to say that unfortunately sex was not on the horizon with Jenny because she's 14. Emphasis on unfortunately. Most guys would be put off by the age difference, but Nate found it sort of comforting. <laughs> He makes me sick. Nate actually makes me sick. And these guys who continuously gawk and stare at all of these young girls' breasts, it leaks into the girls of this school also comparing themselves and putting themselves down for comparing their breasts to each other as well. And then everyone assumes that Jenny had managed to snag Nate away from Blair by putting out big time. Was Jenny Humphrey secretly even sluttier than Jessica Soames? There is a circle of toxicity here. I would not want to go to this school. Rumors also begin to fly that Serena and Flo are in a relationship. While Nate takes Jenny to get a Christmas present for herself and he takes her to a lingerie store, which honestly throws Jenny through a loop. She's like, why did you take me here? Yeah, why are you encouraging a 14 year old to buy lingerie just for her to wear it for you. What is your goal? You literally just said sex was not on the horizon. I swear he's my arch fucking nemesis. I wanna go off on a tangent here as well because he then takes Jenny to the park. Vanessa's hanging around filming random stuff, not realizing what she's actually filming. So there's Jenny and Nate. They're on the floor, on the ground in this park. Jenny says, I love you to Nate. And what he does is he pulls down her pants and blows a raspberry on her bare ass. <laughs> Literally, he blew a raspberry on the top of one of her cute pink butt cheeks and then flopped over on his back. So she said, I love you, and he farted on her arse. She says, I love you again, and then Nate responds with, I love you too. So Nate does actually say and tell Jenny that he loves her. <sighs> 
And as I mentioned, Vanessa's filmed the whole thing without realising she's filmed the whole thing. So Vanessa goes back to Dan's and he's seen he has writer's block and he thinks sex will help cure it. So Vanessa's like, okay, then let's have sex. And then immediately Dan's like, no. It kind of makes her feel like a bit ashamed for like saying that she would do it. And so she leaves, like she's quite upset she leaves. Jenny and Dan come and Nate sees her room and Jenny being, okay, like this is so odd. She has made six different portraits of Nate, each in a different iteration of an artist. And Nate sees them all and it freaks him out. And when talking about saying that he loves Jenny, he said, well, he meant it, sort of. Just like, do not play with a 14 year old girl's heart like that. But also that 14 year old is a little bit odd. Not just that, we find out through Gossip Girl's blog because again, I don't really mention Gossip Girl that much because they aren't really a big factor in this. A lot of times you could like just not even read those Gossip Girl sections. But through that, we find out that the video that Vanessa took of Jenny and Nate rolling around in the park got leaked to the internet. And even though nothing really happened, it looks like he pulls down her pants and then it cuts to them cuddling under his coat where it looks like they're doing it. So that obviously doesn't look good. We find out that it was Vanessa's sister who took the camera and loaned it out and whoever she loaned it to is the one who uploaded it. But I'm kind of a bit like, how did this happen? Because Vanessa had filmed it, had went straight to Dan's with the camera, I'm assuming, and then obviously Jenny and Nate were outside, came to dance. Like, how did that happen that quickly? It doesn't make sense. So yeah, that all happens. But then, oh my God, we see the worst of Dan after this. So Dan assumes that Vanessa filmed it because of the way she filmed it or something. It was like definitely Vanessa's mark. But like, how would he know that? He, how does she do anything differently to anyone who would be filming Two people groping each other in a park. Like, how does that, what? But honestly, the way Dan reacts, oof, I hate him so much. Dan is even more disgusted with Vanessa and Jenny. How was it that they both turned out to be such dot dot dot? Dan picked up his black notebook and instantly thought of a new word to start his writer's block exercise. He picked up his pen and wrote it down, sluts. So he's calling his little sister a slut for being filmed in public. And he's also calling Vanessa a slut for filming it. <sighs> Do we say the problem with Dan? Do we start to say it now? Dan then tells Jenny, he says, you know it was Vanessa who filmed you, right? And Jenny's like, well, when Jenny finds out, she's a little bit mortified, but she's not actually that bothered by it too much. And then when Nate finds out about it, he just doesn't even care. Because at this point, he's ignoring Jenny. He doesn't want anything to do with her after seeing the portraits, just like he did with Blair. And plus he's getting congratulated by his guy pals, of course. So we have Dan trying to come up with a poem called Sluts about his sister and his girlfriend. Like they haven't actually officially broken up. And this is the poem about his sister and his girlfriend that he comes up with. Wipe the sleep from my eyes and pour me another cup. I see what you've been trying to tell me all along. Shaving your head and handling me so delicately with satin and lace, you're a whore. That's a poem. And guess what he does? He emails it to Vanessa. Scumbag behaviour. And guess what happens when Vanessa reads it? The words were ugly and angry and they broke her heart. But Vanessa had always been able to see the beauty in ugly things. And she'd read enough submissions to Rancor to know that this poem was special. It was filled with rich metaphors and passionate language. And while it made her want to bury her head in the covers and sob, she couldn't help but admire the clever turns of phrase. It was brilliant. What part of that fucking poem is brilliant? Are we reading a different poem? And then even though the poem makes her feel awful, she was going to get the poem published. So she emails the New Yorker with this poem that Dan wrote calling her a whore and titling it Sluts. She emails it to the New Yorker where they instantly reply saying that they're gonna publish it. It's that easy, but also the New Yorker publishing a poem like that, calling someone a whore in sluts, really? And the fact that Vanessa's the one who does it. She makes him a published author, a published poet, with a poem he wrote about her slagging her off. Fucking Dan. And then Dan treats Jenny like shit. Like she is torn about Nate not responding to her. And then Dan's like, oh, well serves her right for being such a slut. <sighs> that man. I've never seen misogyny quite like it in a character. And then Dan gets pissed at Vanessa for getting the poem published because he gets an email saying, oh, we're going to publish this in the New Yorker. Congratulations, you're now a published poet. And he gets pissed off at Vanessa for that. 
I'm like, dude. I feel like I skipped so much. Like I have so many notes written out and everything, but like my mind is a jumble. I got so passionate there. So Nate as well, he's been asked by his friend if he and Jenny are still together. And he says, nah, not really. Have you told Jenny that? Because like he took her to see the Nutcracker, which he took Blair to see every year for Christmas. Like they were boyfriend and girlfriend. And yet he doesn't tell Jenny that they're not together anymore. He's a coward. Nate is a coward. Dan is a misogynistic pig. Chuck is a creep. There is not a single likeable guy character in this. Blair's mum announces to Blair that she's having a baby and she wants to turn Blair's room into a nursery. So she's essentially kicking Blair out of her room. <laughs> because you know, it's the last thing Blair needs, isn't it? Her mum to continue treating her like shit. And I can just only imagine like how she feels like getting replaced by a, a, a child. Like that again is a storyline that could have been so deep and could have been a great stepping stone for Blair as a character. I don't know if it's in this book actually. I will get to my notes. I'm starting to get a little bit tipsy. Blair is given the power to name this child. And do you know what she names this child? Can you guess what she calls her baby sister? Yale. Yale. She calls her baby sister Yale after her favorite university. The fact that her mum lets her do that just shows you that these characters are not real. Blair is obviously having a time and she wants to lose her virginity to Miles, but Aaron ends up walking in on them and he stares like a pervert and she kicks him out and she's like mortified and so she doesn't lose her virginity. God, I'm quickly running out of wine and I'm on book three. I'm gonna have to speed this up. <laughs> oh yeah, so Serena is also partying with Flo and he writes a song for her, but it makes her a bit uncomfortable. And then we also have, who's left? Oh yeah, so Jenny has managed to get all of Nate's family's addresses somehow, like because she is rather stalker-esque. She makes a care package for Nate and she sends it off so that Nate will get it because he's staying in Maine for a little bit. Like she ends up cutting off some of her hair and puts it in there as well. And one of the most unrealistic things again to ever happen in Gossip Girl is that the Gossip Girl blog gets a message from a filmmaker. A filmmaker who is making these big budget films in Cannes, I think it is, like the Cannes Festival, Cannes Festival, I don't know how to pronounce it. And they were like, oh my God, who was the person who filmed that clip of those two teenagers in the park getting it on? Because their film work is amazing and I wanna get in touch and invite her to the Cannes Festival and work with her. And Gossip Girl's like, I will send along her email address, it's Vanessa. And then Vanessa gets an email from Ken Mogul, Mogul, Ken Mogul. And he wants to work with her. He wants to pay for a trip to Cannes so that she can make films with him. Are you fucking kidding me? A video leaks on the internet that she recorded of two teens getting it on-ish. She gets approached by a filmmaker to make movies with him? No. No. And it does not deserve to happen to someone like fucking Vanessa either. This Ken person is in Central Park and he's filming some stuff and he asks Vanessa to come along. So Vanessa does come along, helps film some stuff. Dan is furious with Vanessa still and comes along as well. Ken gets talking to Dan before Dan has a chance to talk with Vanessa. And Ken's like, oh my God, Vanessa's brilliant, isn't she? She has such artistic vision. And then Ken's like, oh, who are you? Like, have you had anything published? And he's like, yeah, actually I have had something published. Yeah, thanks to Vanessa. And then he goes over and kisses Vanessa Vanessa on the lips. Like, come on, after what you've just done to her, you seriously think you deserve to go up there and put your lips on hers? He literally leads Vanessa away from something that could potentially be the biggest break of her life. And she's like absolutely fine with it. She goes on with it. She's like, fuck you, Ken, and leaves. I'm like, oh my God, like, how is this an actual book? How are any of these actual books? Anyway, there's a party again. Blair says Nate and she's like, oh, where's the little kindergartner? And he's like, oh, we broke up. Even though they haven't actually like broken up, Blair should still be absolutely pissed with him. But Blair even says that's irritating, but kind of wonderful to talk to Nate. It should just be irritating. Especially since he's like, oh, I'm gonna come and visit you at Yale. Fuck off. Who invited you, you bastard? Jenny also says Nate talking to Blair and Nate and Blair are quite close. They're not kissing or anything. They're not actually like doing anything, but Jenny gets the wrong idea and she realizes that Nate doesn't love her and so she leaves. Again, there's like no confrontation. There's no resolution here. She just leaves. And this happens all the time. What I absolutely love, and I think it's one of the best things that Blair does though, is that even though Nate wants like a kiss and stuff, Blair tells him to fuck off. Blair has not forgiven him. And honestly, that maneuver that she did there, she was kind of like, okay, I wanna let you like talk to me and stuff and we're gonna like chat and you know, it's all gonna be all flirty flirty. And then as soon as Nate wants a kiss, she's literally like, fuck off and she leaves. 
It was almost midnight and she had better things to do than kiss another loser. Oh, 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 oh. That doesn't stop Chuck though, because she ends up like bumping into Chuck and Chuck puts his arm around her and then slowly slid his hand down her back and over her ass. So for Blair, it's like out of the frying pan and into the fire. Chuck walked right up and kissed her on the lips. Did she ask for that? No, she fucking didn't. Flo is also still trying to serenade Serena with a brand new song that he wrote just for her and Serena hates it. So she ends up going off with Aaron, Blair's stepbrother, and kisses him instead. So now it seems like Serena and Aaron are a thing. And that, my friends, is the end of book three. Oh my god. Uh, I need to be quicker than this. Wow. Book four, because I'm worth it. Okay, so it's now February and Valentine's Day is fast approaching. Oh, where's my wine? <sighs> and everyone is finding out if they got into their chosen universities. As everyone is waiting to find out, the worst idea in the world is that Blair and Serena sign up as peer pressure leaders or they like become peer group leaders in school. And Jenny is in their group who, you know, has just literally broken up with Nate and Blair is leading her. And it's honestly like the worst idea in the world, especially since like Blair, I mean, she doesn't really hold any malice towards Jenny, which is good. Like she isn't trying to tear her down because this series does have a lot of girl on girl hate, especially between Blair and Serena. But Blair seems to be all right with Jenny. But because Blair and Serena are the ones who are leading these discussions on body issues, self-esteem issues, these girls are fucked. Jenny admits that she made a breast reduction appointment and she decided to back out of it as well. Again, it's like still just a lot of focus on Jenny's boobs. Four books in and it seems to be all her personality is. Dan admits that he loves Vanessa as well. They are in love and he is finally ready to have sex with her. And this only comes after she has gotten him published in a newspaper. And they have sex and he says it was indescribable. Although still resents the idea that Vanessa has had sex before. Let's sprinkle in some more homophobia here as well. Chuck congratulates him and says, who knew you were such a stud? And then Dan says, was there something distinctly gay about Chuck Bass these days? No homo. Literally, it seems like any guy says one positive thing to another guy and they're assumed to be gay. Guys can compliment one another without wanting to get in their pants, right? I mean, at this point, anyone can get in my pants just to make me shut the fuck up. <laughs> but if you want more unbelievability with this series, a top agent reads Dan's poem. I don't even know if I can even continue the sentence. An agent loved Dan's poem and immediately says that she is going to represent him. Daniel Humphrey, this is Rusty Klein. I read your poem in the New Yorker and assuming you don't have an agent yet, I'm going to represent you. The public needs a serious young poet to make them feel worthless and superficial. You're the next Keats. <laughs> I've never heard anything so funny in all of my life. Keats? Seriously? <laughs> I'm telling you, Dan is no Keats, he's a c Vanessa's very suspicious of this as well. She says, but you only wrote one poem. What's she going to do? I don't mean to be a downer, Dan, but you have to be careful of people like that, you know? She could be trying to take advantage of you. Didn't you just meet a random person off the internet who claimed to be a filmmaker, who turns out to be a filmmaker, which is fine. Like Vanessa had pretty much the same kind of opportunity and went and met a stranger in a park and she has the gall, the gumption to criticize Dan for this phone call with an agent. Do you know what I mean when I say that these characters just do not make sense? And neither does the entire plot of the series. I think I was starting to get a bit emotional there. My voice cracked. What's Blair up to, you ask? Well, Blair gets a second chance at a Yale interview. She meets someone called Owen Wells, who is like an alumnus interviewer. And he is an attractive older man. And she starts to fall in love with him. And they meet in a hotel sort of lobby. And he has a wedding ring. And he tells her, oh yes, I'm married, but we're not together anymore. And I smell instant bullshit. While this is all happening, Nate's drug addiction is becoming way more apparent. Nate had always maintained that his pot smoking was a mere indulgence, like eating chocolate, something he could give up any time. And just to prove it, not that he needed to prove anything to Blair anymore, he was going to go cold turkey after he'd smoked every leaf of pot from the giant bag he was going to buy today. So he goes to meet his buyer, Mitchell, but Mitchell has disappeared, he's gone off. And then Mitchell suspiciously comes back and offers to give Nate some drugs. And that's when Nate gets caught by the police. Mitchell was wearing a wire, he was trying to get his, what, what do you call them, the clients? Yeah, he was trying to get the clients court and stuff, probably for a, a deal with the police. So Nate gets, well, not exactly arrested, but he does get taken down the station and he has to do mandatory rehab. And I'm like, finally, 
finally, this young child, this 17 year old boy has a drug addiction. This is something that is serious and needs to be tackled. Aaron and Serena are in a pretty serious relationship and she wants to get matching tattoos, but Aaron as a vegan doesn't want that to happen. And he's actually quite mortified that she would even suggest such a thing. And already we're starting to see like the crack show in their relationship. Because not only does Serena want tattoos, she wants to get their somewhere private. And I'm sorry, but if I just met someone and we were together for like a day, I would not want to get a fucking tattoo on my dick. I don't care how beautiful you look. And like Serena's going around wearing these black fishnets with holes in them. Like, where's the fashion? Where is the fashion that was evident in Gossip Girl? Blair is out shopping with Jenny, of all people. Jenny has a crush on a random blonde dude in the store and she gets all like giggly and stuff. Jenny pretty much runs away, not saying anything to this guy. And then Blair, in a moment of actual genuine kindness, writes Jenny's email address down on the back of her receipt and throws it at this boy and runs out of the store. Like, was there any guarantee that he would pick it up and say the email address? No. There wasn't. But obviously it's Gossip Girl logic, so obviously he's gonna say that and email Jenny and suggest meeting on a bus, the bus that he usually takes. Did this TV show ever do that storyline? Because honestly, it's just, again, an odd one. It's a very odd one. I'm just wondering why Cecily got all of these ideas because they're just so random. And go back to Serena as well and how she just like gets everything handed to her. She is in a store trying to buy a jacket for Aaron and the jacket she wants, somebody's already wearing it. And this person who's wearing the jacket is like, oh, like you're so beautiful. Can you please be a model in this runway show that's happening? And Serena's like, yeah, but only if I have your jacket. And he's like, okay, yeah, take it. And then yeah, so Serena does this whole runway thing, which is televised. Like it's a huge deal. It's a huge deal. And like this random encounter, it happens and she manages to score herself on this runway. And not just that, but she wears this most god awful t shirt where she's written I love Aaron on it. And apparently everyone bloody loves it. There's an, even an auction for it that happens. Is that fashion? Do I even know what fashion is? Aaron is mortified, by the way, because he wants to be a rock star. He does not want to be remembered as the person who was on Serena's t shirt. Because again, like Serena's getting like more and more famous right now. And so as Serena is filming this like perfume ad, because yeah, she suddenly gets a perfume ad deal as well. She's filming a perfume ad in the middle of the park and Aaron comes up to her and it's like, I can't do this anymore. I'm gonna have to break up with you. Oh my God, actually, I need to read the actual part. This is like towards the end of the book as well. I've just like skipped so much. A perfect tear began to form in the corner of Serena's right eye and trembled on the edge of her lower lid. And the photographer's like getting all of this. In that instant, the tear dropped onto her lovely cheek, a perfect illustration of every human emotion Lebes wanted to encapsulate in his new perfume ad. So like she's cried this perfect tear for this advert that just happened to happen after she is broken up with Aaron, her boyfriend. Please tell me Blake Lively acted this out in the TV show, please. And then the perfume is then called Serena's Tears. And by the way, Serena did not have to practice or do anything, rehearse nothing for that runway show. There is a lot of homophobia against lesbians. The D word is used quite a lot and the R word is also used quite a lot and the S word. There are a lot of words that I don't wanna actually say out loud, but just be aware that they are littered throughout the books. Blair and Owen end up kissing. Blair says that she's a virgin and he's absolutely fine with that. She asks, how come you and your wife split up? And he says, we haven't. I'd really rather not talk about it. Even though he literally just told her before that they weren't together. But guess what? Blair doesn't give a shit. She liked playing the role of the other woman. It made her feel so powerful. So we have Blair here absolutely throwing caution to the wind about getting with a married man. Nothing happens between them, Blair leaves, and then she finds out, and I haven't mentioned her yet yet because she hasn't really been that important, but Jenny has a friend called Elise who is also 14, and I will talk about her more as well because she's quite important to Jenny's part of this book, but Elise is during this peer group, writing out her name, Elise Wells, and Blair sees it and she realizes that Owen Wells, the person she's just been like courting, is her father. That's what makes her go ballistic realizing that he had a daughter. She didn't care that he was married and still with his wife. She just hated the fact that he had a daughter who was only three years younger than Blair. So Vanessa is doing a show. Ken Mogul, Mogul, person who was the filmmaker, he asked Vanessa to do this show and she does. Everyone absolutely loves, loves, loves her work. Again, I have no idea why it sounds shit to me, but we all have different tastes. Christina Ritchie's name is crossed out at this event thing as well and Vanessa's name is put over it. Yeah, fucking right. Well, Dan is attending Serena's fashion show. He's sitting next to a woman, talks about the fact they got published recently 
And he says, uh, he published Sluts, and she's like, no way, you don't understand. I read this poem over the phone to all my girlfriends. I can't believe you wrote it. What is happening here? Would somebody seriously be like that with someone after reading their poem in the in the newspaper? I, I don't get it. Of all the people in the world and you're sitting next to Dan Humphrey, you just read his fucking poem in the bloody paper and you're a huge fan of it? This was his first encounter with an actual fan and he felt simultaneously embarrassed and thrilled. Liked it? It changed my life. Would you mind signing this for me? Oh my god, like this is not real. This is not real. He's not sitting next to somebody who is like his first fan. And it's a woman as well. He's the most misogynistic pig in the world. He even goes on a big misogynistic rant later on. Which I will get to because, oh my god, is he the worst in this book? So he goes to this meeting with his new agent, Rusty, where he meets another client of his called Mystery Craze. Please tell me she does not appear in the TV show. Please, for the love of God. He meets her on page 150. He cheats on Vanessa with her on page 151. They're in public. She even says to Dan that his poem saved her life. And she is like a rather odd person as well. Like she loves death and gore and things like that. Rusty tells her that she's the next Sylvia Path. They raise a glass and she says to poetry. Then she grabbed the back of Dan's head and pulled him toward her, crushing his lips in a deep Campari soaked kiss. Dan knew he should have thrown Mystery off, testing that he had a girlfriend, that he was in love. But Mystery's lips tasted sweet and sour at the same time and he wanted to understand why she was so sad and so tired. He wanted to discover her. He's letting this fame get to his head. He wants to discover the perfect metaphor when he was in the middle of writing a poem and to do that he had to keep kissing her. What's your favourite noun? He asked. Sex. Dan grinned as he kissed her back. So yes, he cheats on Vanessa. They're kissing now and then they have sex. Mystery Craze is like a big deal apparently even though she hasn't like really published anything herself yet. And not just that but Dan remembers that he hasn't gotten Vanessa anything for Valentine's Day. At the same time he's like literally just cheated on her. Does he not want to like talk about that to her first? But then as he's talking about this like in his mind he's like oh I cheated on her. I cheated on her. It was all mystery's fault with her see-through slip and crooked yellow teeth she'd made him feel like he was living inside one of his poems kissing a begulingly a begulingly i've never said that word out loud before he hadn't been able to help but let his imagination run amok sending him stumbling across the snowy landscape to her ramshackle chinatown studio apartment and making love to her in all sorts of odd yoga-like positions on her uncomfortable futon bed as the sun was rising over the bleak snow-covered city in his mind it was fiction because he was trying to discover some kind of metaphor because he writes poetry. So Dan decides to write Vanessa a poem for Valentine's Day. The best thing about it was that he wouldn't have to talk to her and possibly admit that he cheated on her because he'd never been any good at telling lies. Nobody's very fucking good at cheating. And the poem he sends her, kiss me, be mine, hot stuff, lost my virginity again. <laughs> That's the poem he sends her on Valentine's Day. Lost my virginity again. He's literally confessing to the fact that he's literally just had sex with someone else. He was kidding himself if he thought Vanessa wasn't going to find out about him a mystery, but as soon as she received his latest poem, he was convinced she'd forgive him. Just as mystery had written in her note, he was a charmer. Look, I'm not ashamed to admit I'd sleep with anyone. I would not sleep with Dan. The actor from the TV show, yes. But Dan, no. Dan was supposed to have a girlfriend. He was supposed to be freaked out by this decidedly insane, yellow-toothed, horny chick. But the truth was, he was horny too. He'd lost his virginity twice already, and he couldn't wait to lose it again and again. They end up getting a room and putting it on Rusty's tab, and then they are signed up for a poetry reading, which Vanessa sees a flyer for, so he doesn't actually tell Vanessa about this. And their sort of performance goes something like this. Dan clears his throat and says, what's your favourite verb? And Mystery says, sex. Sex, she repeated, crawling between his legs and clawing her way up his body until their faces were only a centimetre apart. And Vanessa, who saw the flyer and walked in, says all of this. Dan and Mystery essentially make out and grope each other so much that they're almost having sex on stage. Feed me, Dan growled into the Megas Mystery right beneath him. Bear your naked body on my plate. And Vanessa, instead of running out, she's filming all of this. She couldn't bring herself to stop filming. Something was happening to Dan that she had to get on film. He seemed to be discovering himself right before her eyes. Vanessa kept filming, hot tears streaming down her pale cheeks. She couldn't stop and she wasn't doing it to torture herself. She was doing it for the sake of her art. On stage, Dan unbuttoned his shirt and Mystery licked his chest. Oh daddy, she whispered huskily. Oh my god, this is like the worst thing in the world. His girlfriend, who's just watched him cheat in front of her, is filming the entire thing, thinking it's art. Oh god, like isn't this like the most insane thing? When you clicked on this video, was this what you expected? So let's go back to Nate then. He goes to a rehab called Breakaway and there he meets Georgina Spark. 
aka Michelle Trachtenberg. She is described as a coked up version of Snow White. And honestly, this could have been a great way of exploring like Nate's drug problem and uncovering like the problems of it, making him a better person. But we don't do that. No, 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 no. We do not do that. Georgina invites Nate to her house and they start like making out and stuff. A bit later on, Georgina says that she has some horse tranquilizers and stuff that they can use. And Nate actually gets a bit freaked out and he realizes that Georgina does genuinely have a bigger drug problem than he does and he does call for help which is great it's honestly great because he does stop her from potentially having an overdose well done Nate one of the few good things that you've done in your life but do we learn from this lesson we absolutely bloody do not Georgina does get like sort of reprimanded for it and Nate is hailed as a sort of prince charming and then we get back onto their drug having bullshit Nate even declares that he loves Georgina as well. Did Georgina and Nate ever get together in a TV show too? I have a lot of questions. Once Blair is finished with the married man as well, she decides that she wants to get back with Nate. And she calls him, he says, oh, I'm in rehab. And I hate the representation of rehab in this because it's made to seem like some kind of exotic getaway. And Blair desperately wants to go there. Blair's like, oh my God, that sounds like amazing. That sounds like a great vacation for me. So she ends up signing herself for Breakaway and she gets to Nate's class. And she is, you know, forced to like tell them what her problem is. And she actually brings up her bulimia. Like she doesn't do anything about it. And neither does the author, the narrator. It's like brushed off as a joke. But Blair sees Georgina and Nate getting a bit cozy cozy. So Blair's like, fuck this. She's literally just been there like two seconds. She's like, fuck this, I'm leaving. She rings Serena and she was like, can you pick me up? I'm telling you, she checks in on page 221 checks out on page 227. What's Chuck doing all this time? Well, his sexuality has been rather questioned in this book too. A lot of people are assuming he's into guys now and there is speculation that he might be bi. Bisexuality is like brushed aside in this entire series, by the way. A lot of people do seem to explore their sexuality, but bisexuality is just like not a thing. It's just not a thing. It's mentioned a couple of times, but nobody ever wants to use that label. Other than the speculation, we don't really get a whole concrete idea of Chuck and what his sexuality might be. And then finally, Jenny. I mentioned before as well, Blair wrote her email address down on a receipt and threw it at a guy. And then he does email her and says, oh, let's meet on a bus. She does go with Elise, her best friend, to see who he is. She goes on a bus and bumps into him and he's called Leo. And I'm just like, I, I don't understand like how this place works, just how convenient everything is, you know? But just like she saw him in the store, I, I gotta admire that though. The amount of times I've fallen in love with guys at stores, I'm just like, oh my God, like, we are gonna get married one day and then I never see them ever again in my life. Like, I totally respect that and like, I wish I had the guts to do something like that. I just feel like I would get murdered. Anyway, at the end of the book as well, we actually get the first time that Gossip Girl is ever mentioned by characters. Firstly, there was like a flyer for a, a party on Monday and everyone thinks it's Chuck's coming out party. Although we haven't heard from the man himself, we don't actually know what his sexuality is right now. And they say, you know that site, www.gossipgirl.net. And they speculate it might be Chuck, but Serena and Blair say, no, it's definitely not Chuck. And honestly, it can't be any one person. So that's book four. In book five, we have Serena and her perfume ad has been out for a while and she asks Blair to move in with her because Blair is pretty much getting kicked out of home because obviously her room has been changed into a nursery. People speculate that Blair and Serena are lesbos when they say this whole exchange. Just like, ugh. I'm so fed up with the rumours. Like the amount of times that you have a conversation between like background characters or characters around saying, I heard this, I heard that. I know gossip is like the entire point of it. It's giving me a headache. Nate is turning a corner as well, which is great. He is in a relationship with Georgie and he is finding it hard not to be stoned. His head was so clear, it almost hurt. And all of a sudden there was so much to think about. Whoa. Like I love seeing Nate get clean. It's amazing but it doesn't last. Rusty, Dan's agent, tells Dan that Mystery is on a six month tour and he is furious. Like why is she on a tour and he isn't? Mystery, who was only 19 or 20, Dan wasn't quite sure, had managed to write a memoir called Why I'm So Easy in less than a week. The day she'd finished it, Rusty had sold it to Random House for an astounding six figure advance with a film deal attached. The first fucking day she sends the draft? And now she's on a six month tour, the fucking book isn't even out yet. Watch her touring. Who's coming to this tour? At the same time, Rusty sent Dan's newest poem, which is called Ashes Ashes, to the North Dakota Review. And <laughs> this is how it goes. It's the first baseball game of the season. I wait for your kiss. Breath meaty like chocolate. My shoes are still there. One in your bed where you left it. The other in the backseat of my car. Obviously the North Dakota Review hated it. That's what Rusty says. 
And so, like, he seems to be having a bit of a, an identity crisis. You know, Mystery is getting all of this good stuff happening to her, while he is realising he's a shit poet. So Rusty decides that Dan has to intern at a literary place called Red Letter. It's a literary journal or something, I've never heard of it. And he's like, how come everyone had heard of Mystery and no one had heard of him? He gets so jealous when someone does better than him. When we get back to Vanessa, we get this, I, I don't mention about the writing style or anything like this. I think the writing is awful in all of the books. This is an example. Her head didn't fly up behind her, bouncing prettily against her shoulders because she kept her head shaved and basically had no hair. Then why just, why just, what? just say she has a shaved head like you do in every single book because again, she's trying to be unlike all the other girls. She bumps into Dan. Have they reunited since he cheated on her in front of her? Has he even said sorry? I'm gonna let you decide, has Dan said sorry? I'll give you five seconds. I'll give you five seconds while I have another drink which will be gone before I even get to booth fucking six. He just says hi and tells her that he got a job today. And Vanessa's like, good for you. And then he goes, so what's up? She tells him her parents are visiting and goodbye. And he says, yeah, good to see you. Do you not want to say sorry for cheating on her multiple times with this mystery craze person? Do you not want to take any accountability for that? No? Okay. Vanessa does go away and calls him an asswipe, which is great. Like, I like the fact that Vanessa has a genuine reaction, but as I say time and time again, it never means anything because uh, you're going to find out. Back to Jenny, the shortest girl in ninth grade class, but with the biggest boobs in the entire class. Again, because we need to be reminded of Jenny's breast size. And we also find out that Elise, who is Jenny's best friend, has a crush on Dan big time. Blair, who is staying with Serena and is staying in Eric's room. Blair has the biggest crush on Eric, even though he's not even there. She discovers his diary, his notebook, she reads it and realises that she's in love with him. The idea of sleeping in the lair of an older boy she didn't know that well was strangely exciting. Eric invites Serena and Blair to like a skate thing, which is exactly where Georgina and Nate are. So again, like there's a lot of coincidences that happen in this series. And it's a good thing as well because Blair has now decided that Eric is the one that she is going to lose her virginity to. And honestly, if it does sound weird because you are more familiar with the TV show, it's honestly weirder just reading about. Back to Jenny then. Jenny is trying to learn more about Leo and he's been quite mysterious about his life and like his family. And so Jenny turns into a stalker to find out what Leo is hiding. Not that he's actually like purposefully hiding anything. It's just that he's never invited her to his family home. And bear in mind, they've known each other probably a week. The characters in this just want to move so fast that it it's just so infuriating. Since we had a sort of inkling of Chuck's sexuality in the previous book, we have more clarification in this book and this might surprise you. Chuck really was the devil and he was always looking for new ways to express his evil. Lately, he'd been experimenting with being gay, if only to starve off boredom. So now Chuck is gay because he's bored. Like, I'm all for experimentation, finding who you are and being confused. It's a huge part of being a teen and growing up, but you don't just decide to be gay because you're bored. And the storyline does get weirder. I'm going to tell you right now, the storyline gets weirder. I just wish that if Cecily was going to make one of the main characters gay, she would have done it justice. But I trusted her one too many times. I should have known. But Chuck is at Sun Valley with... Nate, Blair, Serena, Georgie, all of them. She's, he's there with all of them. I'm getting too drunk. <laughs> Nate is rather uncomfortable with Chuck being there and being gay. He doesn't want to get in the hot tub with them. Meanwhile, Blair had already fallen in love with Eric after reading his diary and sleeping in his shirts. She has got this agenda on her brain that she is going to sleep with Eric no matter what on this trip. And as you know, that is going to rub Serena up the wrong way. Meanwhile, Elise is stalking Dan as well. He's starting his new job as an intern at Red Letter, doing a really shit job by just throwing in the letters in the lake. But Elise who, I don't even know how she knows this, but she goes to his office building and leaves him some cookies because she wants to welcome him to his like first day on the job. Like they've never really like talked to each other. Like, yeah, she's best friends with Jenny, but like, is that like really intrusive? It's like a first gesture of like any kind of romance between them. It's just really odd. She's 14, so I let her off, but the fact that Dan accepts it and he's 17, he's turned into the new Nate. Dan then writes a really shit poem. The poem gets stolen and somebody writes it in his office and everyone says a poem shit. So really it's not just me, like I'm not just being a bitch. Vanessa gets over Dan pretty quickly and starts kissing a guy called Jody, sprinkling a little bit of homophobia here. Because again, like whenever somebody becomes gay in the Gossip Girl series, they don't just be gay, they become flamboyantly gay. So when Blair's dad becomes gay, he becomes flamboyant. 
When Chuck becomes gay, he becomes flamboyant. This was honestly written by somebody who has no fucking clue about sexuality. Blech. Okay, so I just read again the part where Elise comes into Dan's bedroom and Dan walked over to the door and pushed it closed. He tossed a notebook on the bed and turned to Elise, kissing her hard on the mouth as he yanked her t-shirt out of her jeans. Elise let out a little cry and took a step backward. Dan let go of her. All of a sudden, Elise didn't seem so old anymore. It goes a little bit too hard. In fact, I'm a little bit confused about this whole interaction. Yeah, Dan saws himself because Elise is only 14. And again, like, that's awful. But then he says, I thought you wanted to be my boyfriend and runs out crying. I don't understand this interaction at all. I really don't. Like, I'm glad Elise went. I'm glad Elise ran away. Because again, 14 and 17 is a big no-no for me. I don't understand how this is written. I swear to fucking God, these books were not written well. Dan then buys a UFO for Vanessa. Again, really random because, well, just because. Sends her away. It's like a toy UFO and Vanessa fucking loves it and she wants to like film it and stuff. Jenny is pissed off with Leo because again he isn't very forthcoming about his life so she says in an email to him, so how come you've never invited me to your house? The thing is I know where you live now so I'm coming over tomorrow at six which is when you're usually finished walking Daphne I think. Because yeah she's been following him this entire time, realises that he walks dogs, tells him via email that she knows where he lives and that she is coming round at this exact time tomorrow. Taylor Momsen should have been cast as Joe in you. And guess what, when Jenny does actually go, like Leo lets her go to his house, he is living in squalor. Like he hasn't got a really great place. His parents aren't rich or anything like that. He's rather poor. And Jenny turns her nose up at him and leaves. She hates it. She had the biggest crush on him. Like she was even getting to the part where she was like gonna say, I love you. And yet she sees how he lives, sees that his parents aren't rich and leaves. That's Jenny. That's Jenny for you. That's your Jenny. She ain't my Jenny. That ain't the Jenny I know and love. And the fact that she also comes from a pretty poor family and she has been in that position where she's been looked down on, I am confused. Serena and Blair do get in a little bit of a fight about Eric and it's a, it's a really pathetic little fight. And Blair's like, I'm gonna leave. Like, I'm not gonna live with you anymore. And then Blair does try and get it on with Eric, but she can't do it. And she realizes that she is still too much in love with Nate. And Eric is very understanding of this. Right, while all this is happening, oh my God. So Serena, Georgie and Chuck decide to have a bit of fun in the snow. And they have Serena in this like kind of sled thing and they're pushing it along and stuff. And then the police are there and they accidentally throw Serena off like a sort of hill and Serena's stuck, right? She's like, help, help, help me, help me. And they've like gone off and stuff. Nate happens to be walking by and saves her, her knight in shining armor. So I can see Serena in such a vulnerable and emotional position. So Nate leans in and kisses her very tentatively on the mouth, a nice sweet innocent kiss. You know I love you Nate, but I think we both know who you really want to be kissing. And he says, I love you too. Even though they say, Nate, you should be with Blair right now. And bear in mind, Nate should be with Georgie right now because they're in a relationship. They begin to have sex. It would always be completely harmless and Blair would never have to know. And eventually they'd stop doing it when Serena finally found true love, if that ever happened. But what about Georgie? You're still in a relationship with Georgie, Nate. So there we go, another one for the cheat account there, you adulterer. Vanessa seems to forgive Dan as well. Dan definitely had something and she was pretty sure she knew what it was. Her. That gets under my skin. Dan does not own Vanessa. Sending her a fucking toy UFO without saying sorry for cheating on her multiple times with Mr. Grace, which again, he hasn't even admitted to her. She just caught him doing it. He deserves nothing from you, Vanessa, but she knows in that moment that she wants to get back with Dan and that she is Dan's. Oh, doesn't that just make your blood boil? If you're wondering what Chuck is doing with his life right now, after sort of getting arrested, with Georgie. Georgie's parents decide to gift Chuck a monkey called Sweetie. So from this point on, Chuck's only sort of relationship with anyone or anything is with this monkey. Uh, it's a storyline choice. I can't fathom what the reasoning was behind him getting a monkey and spend all his time with this monkey and take this monkey everywhere. It's just, does that sound like Gossip Girl to you? We end the book with a sort of picnic in the park and a lot of characters want to say Gossip Girl because Gossip Girl said that they would be there. Obviously they wouldn't be. And Leo is there and he says him and Jenny aren't together anymore. And that's the end of that relationship. Did you guys care? No, you probably didn't. Cause I know I didn't. So book six, remember Serena and Nate have both recently just had sex. We never see Georgie again, by the way. She's gone. Georgie Sparks, gone. Serena absolutely loves Nate, but 
Blair is saying how much she wants to get Nate back and Serena puts her happiness in like the sort of back of her mind and wants Blair to be happy without actually telling her the truth about what she and Nate did. This is the book where they find out whether or not they got into their colleges or their universities. I don't know the difference. Like it's like Yale University but they're referred to as colleges. I it's weird. So Serena, who again is a huge flake and doesn't really put any work into anything, she gets accepted everywhere, including Yale, which she did not tell Blair. Blair gets rejected from pretty much everywhere except Georgetown, and even Yale waitlisted Blair. She's been waitlisted. And again, she has no idea that Serena even applied for Yale, and then Nate gets his college acceptances and stuff. He gets in everywhere too. Serena does actually say to Blair straight away, oh, Yale accepted me. And Blair is furious with Serena. Like she hates it when Serena has some kind of happiness. But at the same time, Serena seems to always want what Blair has. I'm starting to see it now the more I talk about it. I didn't really see it that much while I was reading it. It just seemed like Blair was just never happy for Serena. Yeah, it does seem like Serena always is like sort of a step behind Blair and then takes what Blair wants. Even though Serena does come across like very happy and go lucky and like she, doesn't really hate Blair and she really does care for her and stuff, she goes about it the wrong way. And you know how we had the previous two books with Nate being clean? Let's forget about that. Let's forget about Nate being clean from the drugs because he's back on the pot. All of that character development just went out the window. Nate got in everywhere including Yale and he hasn't told Blair that he even applied for Yale and now when Blair has said that oh she's been waitlisted, Nate doesn't want to tell Blair that he got into Yale. Dan gets in everywhere except Columbia and I have so much fucking respect for Columbia you have no idea. While everyone's getting their college acceptances Jenny decides that she wants to be a model and Serena says that she wants to help her. Ruby, Vanessa's sister moves out because I don't think I've ever mentioned this but Vanessa lives with her sister Ruby like they live together and Ruby is now on tour with her band so there is a spare room so Dan comes over and decides to live with Vanessa and it's funny this because with Vanessa she wanted to tell him how much she'd missed him and how stupid it was that they'd stopped talking. How stupid it was they stopped talking? You mean when he cheated on you multiple times and did it on a stage and it was stupid that you guys stopped talking? He still hasn't apologised by the way. You know what's hilarious as well is that even though Blair's like I'm not gonna get back with Nate until I've been accepted into Yale, Nate is telling everyone that they are back together. <laughs> Like, when did this happen? When did this happen? So Nate and Blair are a couple again. Okay. Okay. Has he told Blair about him and Serena? No. So as all of this is going on, they are going off to the colleges that they applied for to like say them out. So Serena's going to all the ones that she's been accepted to. She goes to Harvard and meets her tour guide, Drew. They meet and she instantly says, I want to say your room. And they go to his room and do it. I mean, fair game. I'd probably do the same thing. But then Serena is getting driven to Brown and they stop for gas and there is a guy holding a sign saying Brown and she lets him come into the car and he starts sketching her and he reveals that he knows who Serena is and absolutely loves her and he also goes to Brown and when she gets there he can show her all of the paintings and things that he's done of her because he's such a huge fan. And Serena, oh my god, what does she say again? It's, oh my god. Serena didn't know what had gone into her but she was totally turned on. What if I just grabbed him and kissed him she wanted to herself? And he has a like a life-size poster of the Serena's Tears ad and he says, I thought I was dreaming when you picked me up at the gas station back there. I've been painting you for two months from this picture. I'm still not finished. I'm in the studio, but Brown, I'm Christian. She was more turned on than ever. <laughs> You've just picked up a random stranger. He's been painting you for months and you're turned on. And he's actually sketching her as he's sitting next to her as well. Like before they even say a word to each other, before she even finds out all this information, he's sitting there sketching her. They ask you how you are and you just have to I feel like I'm done. Even though I've already read the rest of the series, I'm done. Blair goes off to Georgetown where she meets a like Southern Bells Society sorority thing and gets to know them a lot. Through them, she finds out that Nate got into Yale and she rings him up and she tells him to fuck off, which isn't breaking up with him. Which again, I'm still so confused at how they got back together. Oh my god, these teens. Filthy nasty things. Glad I never was one. Meanwhile, Nate has come across the, I think it's the Yale and the Brown coach captains. They're both women. And there is like this awful thing about how these women were only wanting Nate because he was sexy. Bridget is the Brown interviewer and she takes Nate on a sort of date and they're having dinner. She bites her lip and asks, do you have a girlfriend? And he says, um, sort of. Did Flynn with his Brown admissions officer really qualify as cheating? And guess what? He sleeps with her. After Blair rings him up and says fuck off because 
he confesses that he did get accepted into Yale. He says, I think my girlfriend just broke up with me again, even though she didn't. And he says, how badly does Brown want me? And she says, bad. Her hotel room key was on the table. Nate picked it up and dropped it in his pocket. Bad, she whispered again. Show me, he told her gruffly. And so, yeah, they go to the hotel room and have sex. And then afterwards, he feels rather disgusted with himself, as he should. And honestly, she should be so disgusted with herself because she is in a position of power. She is a faculty member. What she has just done is absolutely disgusting. He regrets it and he wants to sabotage his admission to Brown because of Blair. Like, he doesn't want anything to do with it. He also wants to sabotage Yale as well. He's like, okay, me and Blair are over, so I'm just, like, gonna blow everything out and just, like, reject you guys and be an asshole. Richard says, you're not going to tell anyone at Brown about this, are you? He says, maybe, maybe not. He leaves her high and dry. So he's only just doing it to sabotage his admission into a university for Blair. Okay, I just don't understand. I, I, I mean, am I too old? Okay, we'll go back to Serena actually for a bit. She's a brown and she has slept with Christian. He is asleep and she decides to leave and she whispers love you to him and goes. Goes to the next place which is Yale. At Yale there are a group of male a cappella singers and the lead guy Laws he ends up talking to Serena and she once again falls in love with the guy. And how is she supposed to pick one boy without some objective advice from her best friend? Wait, isn't she supposed to be picking a school? So like this whole thing that Serena's going through right now, you know, she's slept with Nate, she realises that Blair wants Nate still, and so she kind of lets Blair have Nate, and now she's kind of like sleeping with any guy who shows her attention right now. And there are some like deeper meanings to that. There are some self-esteem issues connected with that. But we are not exploring any of these. She's just bed hopping between these schools. The author is not exploring that in a way that's making Serena seem like a, a sympathetic character. Like I'm reading more into it than the author is actually giving me. I don't believe in slut shaming anyone. I don't believe that at all. And I'm trying to understand Serena's actions without the author telling me what it is that Serena's doing right now. She is hurt. She's hurt, but we are getting none of this. We are not getting any of these developments or these layers to Serena. We are just seeing her sleep with all these different guys and picking between them instead of the schools that she's supposed to be applying to. Oh my God, I need to sleep. I've been filming for hours. <laughs> Back with Vanessa and Dan. So Dan's moved in, but then a girl called Tiffany, she has a key and she's like, um, so uh, Ruby told me that I could live here and it puts a cramp into Vanessa and Dan's plans, but Vanessa ends up really liking Tiffany and Dan doesn't. And they start throwing a party and Vanessa gets a call from Ruby and Ruby says, wait, Tiffany still has a key. Do you not remember that squatter who wouldn't leave? That's her. And that part was dramatic, right? That part was like, oh my God, that's actually like really quite scary. But then nothing happens because Vanessa just like chucks her out and that's it. That's it. It's during a party as well where Dan is approached by a singer in a band, like a really big band apparently. And this guy went into Dan's bedroom, read his shitty poetry. Okay, listen to this. This is the birthday poem that he gave Vanessa. A list of things you love. Black, steel-toed boots, dead pigeons, dirty rain, irony, me. A list of things I love. Cigarettes, coffee, you and your apple white arms. But the thing about lists is they tend to get lost. It literally is just a list, but he's saying it's a poem. And it's a poem that he wrote for her birthday. It's shit. Dan is also awful to Jenny because you know how she is like trying to pursue her modeling career? She goes to like this go see without asking what the shoot is for. And like she has to take her top off and stuff. It's like really sketchy. And then she ends up coming back and she does this shoot with these other girls. And she's actually having the time of her life. Like she's genuinely really happy about it. And then when the magazine comes out, it's talking about like, does boob size matter? And again, she's 14 years old. Jenny's like really proud of this whole thing. And then Dan sees the magazine. It's a two page spread. And Chuck is the one who shows Dan this actually. And he's like, we're still, she was sticking out her tongue and her big brown eyes were shining. Like she was having the time of her life. Like, okay, that's the worst part of it is a Dan. The fact that she's actually happy. And Jenny asks his opinion and he says, you kind of look like a circus freak next to the other girls. I mean, they basically made you look as big and freakish as possible. <laughs> That was honestly so nasty and awful. You are an awful brother, an awful boyfriend, an awful human being. I believe Serena and Dan are at the same party as well. Serena is approached by all the guys that she met at all of the colleges she went to. Apparently they all decided to come to New York City, knew exactly where she would be and surprised her. And what's weird as well is that one of them brings their housemaid along who Serena never really met or really spoke to. His housemate or roommate kisses Serena on the lips and he's in love with Serena. And Serena has all these guys who are just like totally in love with her and she doesn't want anything to do with them. Oh, sorry, I totally went off a tangent. I mentioned something about 
Dan being invited to be part of the band, didn't they? So yeah, they found his notebook. This is all over the place, but so am I. Dan tells them that his notebook is filled with poems, but they convince him that they're actually songs. What he's been writing is songs, and they want to use his songs and make him their front man, like their lead singer, for their mega successful band. Like, they just invite Dan onto it. Can Dan sing? We're gonna find out, actually. So he gets up, he does, like, a sort of karaoke thing. This is all in Vanessa's, by the way, Vanessa's apartment. And, like, sings for everyone. Dan then rips off his shirt. And at least he knew now, all of these years, that he'd been writing twisted, morbid songs, not poems. <laughs> Vanessa sees all of this, and she's like, you know what, Dan? You do you. This ain't working. And they break up. She lets him go to be a rock star. Dan going off to be a rock star. Isn't that the most Funniest thing, one of the funniest things you've heard in this vlog. We end the book with Blair and Nate, and Blair has sort of forgiven Nate about the whole Yale thing. And do you remember how in the first book, Nate couldn't sleep with Blair until he came clean about Serena? Well, he doesn't do it this time. Blair finally loses her virginity and she loses it to Nate, who is the least deserving person ever. And Nate doesn't complain about Serena, he doesn't complain about Bridget, who he literally just cheated on her with. Like, he doesn't say anything and he takes her virginity and he had a huge problem with not being honest in the first book but now he doesn't give a shit anymore he just wants to sleep with Blair and sleep with her he does that is how we end the bloody book I'm still here six hours of filming and we are on to the seventh book which is the sort of halfway point and it's also upside down. Oh, tell me why I thought it was a good idea to film all of this at once. So Blair and Nate, they're finally having sex and they can't keep their hands off one another. They are just constantly boom, boom, boom. Nate was by far the best boyfriend a girl could ever ask for. She couldn't imagine why she'd ever broken up with him, not once, but again and again. And even the narrator says, because he cheated on her again and again. Yes, facts. <laughs> Act. He has been cheating on her constantly since the very start of the series and he does not stop. But like the best boyfriend she's ever had? It makes me feel sorry for her. If Nate is the best boyfriend, Serena and Jenny are modelling together as well. And Jenny's crush was deeper than most. She actually wanted to be Serena. So we're getting Jenny start to be a lot more weird again, especially since she's single, she's not seeing Leo anymore. So yeah, Dan is now in this band as well. They have a number one album. Vanessa is interviewing a lot of people as well for a new housemate, especially since Dan is no longer there and neither is her sister. So she holds some in-person interviews and we have someone come along called Beverly. Now Beverly's a man and she's surprised by that. And you know, he seems like a pretty decent enough guy and she offers the room. Bear in mind, he's the one who's looking for a room and this is an interview. He says, the thing is, it will be kind of weird living with someone I'd never even breathed the same air with before, you know? I wondered if maybe we could like hang out for a few weeks first, do stuff, get to know each other, see if it could work out. If this was a relationship, fair enough. But like she's literally interviewing you. You need to start fucking paying rent right now. This is essentially what she needs. Spending weeks upon weeks trying to get to know one another to see if he will move in. It's like, what? That's not how roommates are supposed to work. I mean, I get it in theory, but like, no. And Vanessa loves that idea. She eats that idea up. Beverly did want to live with her. He just wanted to get to know her first. How refreshing and exciting to finally meet someone so intelligent, creative, cool, and hot. <sighs> and Vanessa thinks that Beverly might be a good mate. Not just a roommate, but an actual mate. Slow down. Oh, that was more than gulp. Blair is, again, having problems at home. She decides to rent a suite at a hotel and stay there, like actually live there. And she invites Nate round. Like he says, I'll see you in a minute. As soon as Nate puts the phone down, we find out that he's with his friends, he's getting stoned. And they say, we should all head to your parents' boat, sail around, why not go for a little pre-Hamptons excursion? And Nate says, okay. Even though he's literally just said to Blair, oh, I'll see you in a minute. And he's made plans to go sailing on his boat while they're all stoned and drugged up. Make it make sense. And he's literally ignoring every call that Blair makes. They've just got together. They've just had sex for the first time. And he does this to her immediately after he leaves her. What goes through that man's head? Oh, anyway, Dan's getting prepped for the band and he's told he is a skinnier, shorter version of Eminem. Can you imagine Dan is that though? Can you? This is the one of the weirdest storylines to grace the Gossip Girl books. I have an English degree. Dan is doing a gig. It's like their first proper gig with Dan. And this is actually hilarious. This is when the Gossip Girl becomes a genuine comedy. Vanessa has come to the club to watch. And this is his song. This is Dan's shitty song. Crack me like an egg. Burn a hole in my finger till I find myself. 
find myself losing you, losing you and missing stuff, missing how you kicked my ass. Do you miss me? Do I miss you? I know, I know. That's not the fucking point. We were kind of like mowing the grass. Looked good, smelled good, but such a pain in the ass. This is the amazing Crack Me Like an Egg song that Dan has wrote for this band. Dan looked so pathetic, it was almost embarrassing to admit she even knew him. Like, Vanessa is watching this happen, and Dan is like, so... Awful. All of a sudden, the distinctive sound of vomit rising to the surface bled over the speakers and Dan staggered off stage, taking the microphone with him. So there's Dan retching his guts up and everyone can still hear it because he takes a microphone and he's throwing up. So it's like, I mean, the sound of someone vomiting makes me want to vomit, not gonna lie. In my head, seeing Dan do this makes me laugh so much. Again, the sound of his retching came out over the speakers, nearly drowning out the music. She's really good. But obviously Dan just wants everyone to hear him talk or vomit. Like that's Dan to a T. He's just the most attention seeking character, but he probably is just as bad as Blair for attention. I'm also just sat here wondering like, how does this high schooler go from being a shitty poet to being the lead singer in a rock band that apparently has a number one album? The mathy mathin. Meanwhile, Blair has gone to a party with Serena to talk about Yale with some Yale alumni. And Serena talks to an older man who has been part of Yale. And Blair talks to his grandson who tells Blair that he's gotten into Yale and Blair says, oh, she's been waitlisted. And he's like, oh, well, I can get you into Yale. And Blair's like, oh, hello. Even though, again, she's still with Nate, but she can't bring herself to cheat on Nate at this point. And the thought of it, like, even though she goes to his bedroom and stuff and they try to fool around, Blair just keeps laughing and she has to leave. Meanwhile, Nate, who's on this boat and all of his friends are stoned and stuff, there is a girl called Lexi and she's thrown herself at Nate, but he's resistant for a while. And then they decide to play a game which involves kissing. Every time she nabbed one of Nate's white-faced Oreo halves with her whole Oreo, she got to eat the Oreo half and kiss Nate on the lips. Nate really wasn't that into the game, which meant he was sort of letting Lexi win, but kissing her on deck where everyone else was hanging out seemed safer than sitting alone with her up in the crow's nest where one thing could have led to another. He's choosing to sit with everyone else and let Lexi kiss him rather than taking her to the crow's nest because he can't trust himself not to go all the way with her. Like, is that any better, really? Because you're still letting her win, which means you're letting Lexi kiss you. So once again, with all of this kissing you're doing, you're cheating on Blair. You're cheating on Blair. You've literally just got back together. You've literally just had sex for the first time and you're already cheating on Blair with Lexi. Whenever he fooled around with another girl, all he could think about was Blair and fooling around with Blair, making him feel sort of guilty and horny at the same time, which made it simultaneously kind of hard to take and kind of hard to stop. So it's okay for him to do this because he's picturing Blair while he's doing it? Nate also doesn't realise the time. He's actually been out for hours upon hours upon hours. I feel like it's maybe been a day or something. And when he gets like a, a message through the board saying he's in big, big trouble from his dad, he realises how much time has passed and heads back to the harbour. Blair would be so thrilled to see him again, she'd have to forgive him and he wouldn't have any trouble making her forget. Oh, uh, shut up. When you think about fuck it. Up. You think just because you've been MIA for like a day or something, you can just waltz back in and be like, oh, she'll forgive me, it's fine. I just cheated on her, it doesn't matter. Because as soon as she sees me, she'll be grateful that I'm still here. Oof, the entitlement, which again, is probably the point with this series, the entitlement of all of these characters, but Nate especially. Can I also take a minute here to say as well, French people are also portrayed awfully in this series. They're always described as like tramps or sluts. And even one who comes up to Dan, she's called Monique. Monique comes up to Dan's sister and starts grabbing her boobs and going Hong Kong. She has no boundaries, but this happens with every single French girl who comes into this. So Nate does finally get back and he knocks on Blair's door and Serena and Blair are like having fun and stuff. And Serena pretends to be Stanford, who is the grandson of the Yale guy who Blair wants to help her get into Yale. Serena pretends to be him and she gets under the covers and makes it look like Blair's cheated on Nate. So when like Nate's knocking on the door, Blair opens the door and she's like very nonchalant. She doesn't want to let him in. He doesn't exactly apologize for what he does, but internally he's like, uh, because while he was fooling around with Lexi, he realized that he really didn't enjoy kissing anyone but Blair anymore. So like, I'm glad you came to that realization, dude. You literally just had the girl of your dreams, apparently, and you know, you guys were together officially, properly, having all the sex, and then going off kissing other people, and then, oh, now I know. Now I realize that I actually love Blair, and that she's the only one I kiss. Honestly, it's so hard not to hate 
the whole male species. It's so hard. It gets harder every day. But with Blair having this guy, this guy in her bed, who turns out to be Serena, of course, it does seem like they are now officially broken up. It just seems like such a weird reaction from Blair. She doesn't know about the whole stuff. Like, he's just been gone a day. Maybe not even that. And she's pissed at him. So they're broken up. It does seem very trivial in that regard. Like, I'm glad she's broken up with him because what she doesn't know but the reason she breaks up with him, again, leaves me with a bad taste in my mouth because things are not getting resolved. Nothing ever does. The whole cheating thing, it isn't resolved. Jenny has now become a famous supermodel and it's kind of put her in a bad light with a school. The headmistress has a word with Jenny's dad and brings Jenny, Serena and Blair in at once and tells Jenny that she has to change her ways or she's going to get kicked out. I find this whole section very infuriating because a lot of this stuff that this headmistress says to these girls are things that she's heard from gossip. So like she's essentially slut shaming the girls herself and telling them that they need to change or they will get punished. And she even hates the fact that Blair is living in a hotel by herself. She's like, you're not supposed to be doing that. What's it to do with you? And Jenny has been partying with rock stars and things and that's why the headmistress is like, you need to watch yourself, you're gonna get kicked out. The headmistress bringing in these teens to say, sleep in your own beds. The adults in this series do not make sense. No one makes sense. She tells Jenny's dad she is building a reputation for being a little wild and the parents of the peers are beginning to ask questions. Are you aware that your daughter was not home last night? Like, how the fuck would you know? Apparently it was on Gossip Girl, but like, how the hell would Gossip know that quick? You know, like, this is why nothing makes sense in this series. This isn't her first mishap either. There was that compromising image of her and a boy that was passed around the internet a few months back. Oh... Like, what a way to blame Jenny for that, which wasn't her fault. Jenny has a bit of a wake up call right now though. She's like, you know what? Fuck you guys. Like she wants to go back and party. She wants to be this incredible rock star model. She is now purposefully trying to get herself kicked out so that she can go to boarding school and walk in Serena's footsteps. So we go back to Nate right now. Well, now he knows it may not suck to be the cheater, but it definitely sucks to be cheated on. Nate. I'm glad you feel bad. I'm glad you feel bad about being cheated on, even though he actually technically wasn't cheated on. Still, I'm glad that he's feeling this way. Do you think this will stop him from cheating in the future? You'll just have to keep watching to find out. He does end up mailing in his deposit for Yale, so. <laughs> so he is definitely going to Yale, which he also thinks will piss Blair off. So did he do it on purpose to piss Blair off? I don't know. I can't read his actions at this point. Chuck also didn't get into any of the schools that he applied to. He's actually going to go off to military school. And it's, again, like, the way that Chuck is barely in this series, really, like, he only appears very briefly every now and then, usually to be a sleazeball. And then he was, like, randomly gay, which hasn't really been explored since then. Well, it's not the last we see of it. He is apparently too dumb, too much of a playboy and stuff like that to have gotten into any of the schools he applied to. So it's it's military school. There is gossip that Serena is dating Damien from the Raves, which is the band that Dan's part of. So he ends up emailing her and saying, hey, you know, there's gossip about us dating. Do you want to meet up? And she's like, okay. So like she goes to a party at his house where Jenny is and she leaves like pretty much straight away. Like she does not like the vibe. And also the fact that Damien is married to Monique and the fact that Dan slept with Monique. So Dan ends up getting kicked out of the band and gets replaced with Jenny. Oh and didn't Taylor, well isn't Taylor the actress of Jenny, isn't she in a band and didn't she leave Gossip Girl to be in this band? Interesting parallel there. So they say that they'll still use his songs but just use Jennifer's voice and then he reveals that hey she is only 14 and Jenny had actually lied to them about her age. She is younger than they thought. Damien says you sang like shit last Saturday and you basically threw it on stage then you hooked up with my wife which is when we find out that Monique is married to him. Oh hilarious like Dan got a little bit of justice there, a little bit of you know a saying to but it wasn't enough. I would have preferred to have seen him punched in the face. Blair and Serena aren't really speaking as well. Don't ask me how that happened. Actually, I don't even know. They seem to fall out more times than they make up. So Blair is looking for a new place and she says Vanessa is looking for a roommate. So she's like, hey, interview me. So they have a bit of an interview and you would never really put Blair and Vanessa together. So it's like a really weird dynamic. And Blair assumed that Vanessa was a lesbian just because of her hair. And this happens a lot, again, in the Gossip Wheel series. A lot of people who don't look like the typical 
feminine woman are assumed to be the D word. Like they use the D word a lot. Blair doesn't use it right now, but she did think that she was a lesbian because of her hair. Blair couldn't believe she was even considering living with Lesbo, Baldo, Weirdo, no friends Vanessa, but she really did need a place to live. Like, isn't that so lovely? Like, isn't this like the start of like a beautiful new friendship? Not. Blair also gets the idea that maybe Vanessa and Aaron can be a thing, like become a couple. So that's her like new wicked scheme. Move in with Vanessa and make Vanessa date her stepbrother. We have Vanessa and Blair's moving in date as well. Everything moves very quickly in Gossip Girl by the way. They're moving in. Blair's brought in a lot of stuff as well because you know she is rich. She brings a lot of furniture, a lot of nice stuff. Vanessa doesn't hate it either. She accepts it. And so they're having like a sort of first night kind of party. Stanford comes and reveals that he actually got rejected from Yale. He didn't even get in. So he'd been using Blair and Blair thought that he would help her get in. So like this is like a crashing moment but it happens during a truth or dare game which was actually like a really cool moment i kind of liked it and there was like a little bit of a falling out and then serena went to check on blair and blair was naked in the bathtub and serena gets in yeah so it seems like they're like best buds now like their friendship is like really taken off again the book isn't even over yet so the last part of this book is senior spa weekend where they all go on like nate's boat and stuff and go to this place where only girls are allowed boys are allowed on the boat but they're not allowed in the actual spa so i feel like this would be in the perfect moment for all of the girl bonding especially since blair herself realizes that Nate was always the cause of every fight between Blair and Serena. Like, no matter what happened, it always seemed like Nate was in the middle. After all, wasn't Nate the cause of almost every fight the two girls ever had? And it honestly felt like we are getting so much growth. And like, if you just get rid of Nate, I feel like Blair and Serena would be the best friends, even though they still have a lot of unresolved issues. And the whole friendship itself is still very toxic. But they don't realise that at that moment, Nate has kind of snuck in on the boat and he's up in the crow's nest watching them. And all the boys kind of just like come onto the senior spa weekend thing even though they weren't supposed to be there. So what happens? Well later that night Serena she ends up going into the bathroom and Nate is hiding in the bathroom. He's in the bathtub with a stash of pot. He's in the tub and she climbs in with him. They both tell each other that they're going to Yale next year and they're both kind of terrified that Blair will find out. And so they do bond over that like they do seem to have like a shared fear of Blair even though that's like not healthy. And then Nate grabs Serena and Serena's like, what are you doing? Of course it was kind of wrong, but it wasn't like she and Nate hadn't kissed before and somehow knowing that they were going to be together next year made it seem okay. She closed her eyes and gave herself up to the kiss. Her towel fell away and somehow Nate's damp grey t-shirt seemed to fall away too. There was nothing wrong with the little celebratory hookup between two best friends. As this is happening, Aaron gives Blair an envelope that he's kept from her and it turns out that Blair has been accepted into Yale. This is a huge moment for Blair. She's like, oh my god, this is amazing. I've been accepted into Yale. This is my dream university. I have to tell my best friend Serena. So she goes to find Serena. Literally, she is so happy the first person she wants to say is Serena. She gets to the bathroom. Inside a tangle of familiar gorgeous naked limbs greeted her from the bathtub. Nate and Serena blinked stupidly up at her, their golden heads only inches apart. We were celebrating, Serena stammered. Blair tells her that she's been accepted into Yale and she is furious. She's genuinely furious. Serena tells her that her and Nate have also been accepted into Yale and they're all going to be together and she's genuinely excited about that. But Blair's just like, thanks for telling me and hates them. She hates them. She wishes for their deaths. Even though technically her and Nate are not together but I think it's definitely beside the point because of how much Serena and Blair were starting to progress without Nate there and their friendship was blossoming once again and to see this happen at the end of this book Nate and Serena hooking up again carelessly without a thought in the world without thinking of the ramifications of that it does feel like a huge kick in the face to Blair even though they don't really owe Blair by hooking up like again they're not together but still, it's the principle of the thing. So that's how we end this book. It's definitely the most like dramatic ending of any book, I think. But it only relates to hooking up. You know, it's all the series ever seems to be is hooking up. Oh, and actually, I was going to tell you the result of the poll, didn't I? Who I looked better as, Blair, Serena or Jenny? Well, turns out that people thought I looked the best as Blair with 62% of the vote. Me as Serena got 24% of the vote. And then in last place, me as Jenny with 14% of the vote. And I'm not surprised because that photo of me as Jenny actually gives me nightmares. I'm actually kind of scared of that photo. <laughs> so book number eight, and we start this off with Nate and Serena now being a couple and Nate cannot stop crying. He constantly bursts into tears and he's so upset that he is not with Blair. And Serena tries to comfort him. They do try and make their 
relationship work, but it's like really, really awkward. Serena tries to justify hooking up with Nate as well, saying if Blair hadn't caught them, they probably would have left it at that, but it would have been just plain cruel to hook up in front of her and then not try to make it mean something. Though she and Nate had never actually discussed it, they both cared about Blair too much not to stay together, so she wouldn't think it was just some random horny hookup between two beautiful self-centered people who couldn't control themselves. So they've decided to stay together, so that Blair didn't think it was a random hookup when it was, why? I, honestly, it doesn't make sense. And especially since later on in the book too, we find out that Serena has just like absolutely, and actually we've known this for a long time. Serena loves Nate with all of her heart. He is pretty much the love of her life. So like, why is all of this like, oh, they're only together because they didn't want Blair to think it was just one hookup. How does that make sense? Nate's thin and depressed. Serena looks distracted and spacey. Blair sees all of this and she just absolutely hates them both. Like she says she will never talk to either of them ever again. Daniel Humphrey is back on his porty writing shit. Looking girls and shucking corn. Rodeo bullhorns, Stetstone, longhorns, a Kansas cyclone. A Nebraskan girl leaves her lipstick on the dash. She salts my beef, stirs my gumbo, spits out my pit. Disgusting! I don't know whether I preferred him in a band or as a poet. Chuck, despite him exploring being gay when he could actually be bi, but you know, he's, he's just gay apparently. He refers to Vanessa as Dan's day word girlfriend because obviously Dan and Vanessa are still on together and like they genuinely need to be together. They realise how much they love one another. Dan does phone Vanessa, but she doesn't want anything to do with it because again, like he broke her heart and just didn't apologise for anything he's ever done. But he wants them to be friends again. He wants them to be something more. So so he's holding out hope that him and Vanessa will be a couple again. Jenny has gone to Hanover Academy because she wants to go to the same boarding school as Serena. Serena changed that boarding school for the worst. So she gets there expecting there to be like a huge party and stuff and it to be like a party central kind of place but nobody wants to do anything because Serena messed everything up. When she was there and created so much chaos there were so many rules put in place that there were a lot of people ratting each other out. So now Jenny doesn't want to go there. She goes to another boarding school and a guy who's supposed to show her around takes her into the woods. There is some kind of drug party happening and she gets ecstasy, but she puts it in her bra. The head teacher is there and he's actually down with the kids, but he slut shames Jenny because she's told to take off her shirt and he tells her to put it back on. So Jenny leaves. It's honestly so weird. I think I also forgot to tell you guys that Vanessa and Aaron are together now as well. Vanessa and Aaron are a couple, okay? So Vanessa invites Dan round and then they go up to the roof where they start to have sex. I don't know why I'm doing this, but she began. Then she put down her glass, leaned slowly toward him and shoved her tongue down his throat. Before long, they were kneeling on the futon beneath the water tower naked. So Vanessa's cheating on Aaron right now. Blair comes home and she hears them having sex, but she thinks that Vanessa's having sex with her stepbrother. And when Vanessa comes down with Dan, she realizes that she is cheating on her stepbrother, but doesn't say anything to Aaron. She doesn't do anything about it. She tells Vanessa that she's moving to the Yale club. She's moving out and she's leaving. She's out of there and Chuck helps her move. You know what I was telling you about the weird teachers as well? Mr. Beckham, he goes up to Serena. They're in the dark room right now. And he says, I've been watching you since I came here back when you were only in seventh grade. And I knew it sounds corny, but you really lit up my dark room. If I weren't your teacher, I'd dot dot dot. Serena says she really has to go and he says, would you mind if I just gave you a petite petite kiss? She shrugged her bony shoulders and turned to offer up her smooth, delicately sun-freckled cheek. He took a step forward and placed a careful kiss in the middle of her cheek like a stamp, as if to let her know that he had no intention of molesting her any further. <laughs> Oh my god. Like, I cannot wait for these kids to get away from this bloody school. You know, one of the teachers was blushing when Blair was talking to him. Another one came up to Dan as well. I don't think I mentioned it earlier on, but one of them was like, oh my god, I'm such a big fan of the band you're in, Dan. And she's just like, can't control herself around him. It might actually be this book. <laughs> oh my god, it is this book. Okay, so yeah. Uh, a teacher, Miss Solomon, had a serious crush on Dan, and whenever she suspected he wasn't paying attention in class, she'd stomp to her feet like a petulant child and ask him a question, demanding his attention. The teachers in here are predators. Do you want to hear another one of Dan's shit you've poems? The view is better from up here. See her factories, her rivers. If her hills weren't in the way, I could see into the windows of the apartment across the street. See a woman pouring milk as she sets the table for dinner. Oh, there, there's the table. There. I can see everything from here. There. Yes. 
right there. And we found out that Miss Solomon wore her sexiest dress just for Dan today, and he'd barely looked at her for the last 40 minutes. I feel like I have to scrub my brain after talking about all of these books, because, oh my god, it's gonna be such a godsend to stop talking. Blair has moved to the Yale Club, where she meets Lord Marcus Beaton Rhodes. Yes, a British bloke who says things like bloody hell, and she literally falls in love with him right there and then. She loves him, she wants to be with him. She sees the potential of their relationship and her being some kind of lady to his lord. Yeah, she plots and schemes to make sure that he only has eyes for her. Vanessa hasn't come clean about Dan to Aaron. In fact, she tries to hide it up. She'd ridded herself of Dan's musty smell and was horrified to discover that she sort of enjoyed the fact that Aaron had absolutely no clue. When she's bad, she's bad. Yeah, she is bad. She's an awful, awful person and I despise her. I despise all of them. When Aaron comes home as well, he even tells her that she's like the most righteous person that he knows. <laughs> and she's thinking, it made being with Aaron and Dan all the more exciting. Vanessa laughed out loud, amazed at how unguilty she felt. Is she like the worst cheater in the Gossip Girl series? Because of how unguilty she feels and like how much she's laughing about it and how much she loves doing it? My toe boo. Look, hiya baby, I love you. Mm. Okay, Daddy will put you to bed soon. Once I've talked about this, but I'll put you to bed, okay? So we have a storyline with Nate taking his coach's Viagra, which does come back to bite him in the ass. Like, he actually goes into his office and steals his Viagra. How he knew it was there, no clue. Why the coach would have his Viagra on school premises is beyond me. I genuinely do not know why he would put it there. Nate ends up taking the Viagra, and when Serena is getting changed, in a changing room, she's trying on different clothes in a, a store. Nate goes in and begins to have sex with her. And Joan, the shop assistant, found something you like, dear. She poked her head through the opening in the thick velvet curtain and she sees what's happening. She literally just like goes back. She's like, oh, there's, there's not much I can do. And she even says like Serena's like a regular. And it was so nice to see that she was so comfortable in the store. Nate also starts crying again when they finish having sex because again, like his heart belongs to Blair, even though he hasn't shown it. The coach writes into Gossip Girl. Dear Gossip Girl, please let your readers know stealing is a serious matter. Whoever took my prescription for Viagra, and I'm pretty sure I was a senior on my lax team, will not graduate. Thank you for your help. Why is the coach, this like 50, 60 year old man, using Gossip Girl to talk about the Viagra being stolen and that he's after them? Just add it to the list of ridiculous things that happens in the series. Dan and Vanessa are continuing to hook up on the roof and Aaron has no idea. Dan's literally on her roof before Vanessa's even home. They start having sex on the roof. Neighbors in the surrounding apartments adjusted their telescopes. Down on Broadway, Aaron ignored the group of bystanders on the other side of the street, all staring up at the roof of Vanessa's building. So like they have an absolute performance going on here. They've got an audience, everyone's watching, and poor Aaron is coming up None the wiser. They hear him come in. Vanessa says, do you think he heard them? But they were both totally getting off on the fact that Aaron had no clue. Of course, cheating was bad and wrong, but it was totally fun when you were completely madly in love with the person you were doing it with. What an awful, awful statement. Cheating is wrong, just totally 100% wrong. And yet we have this teen book series that glorifies all of this cheating and tells you that cheating is fine as long as you're in love with the person you're doing it with. Oh my God, Cecily Von Zagesa needs to have a serious, wait, is this book eight? Yeah, so she still wrote this one, by the way. This is before the Ghostwriters. Blair and Serena are both auditioning for a film as well. This came out in nowhere, but yeah, they're both auditioning. Ken Mogul is the one who's doing the auditions and Serena ends up getting a call back. Blair doesn't. And Blair doesn't really care that much because she's with Lord Marcus and she's trying to make Serena jealous with Lord Marcus. And she's like, oh, you know what, actually, I'm in with Lord Marcus. I don't even care that you're with Nate. You know, so like she's like trying to move on from Nate. I've got this much wine left and six more books to talk about after this. We finally have graduation as well, but Nate gets up and gets his graduation thing. When he opens up the folder, he doesn't have a diploma. His diploma has been taken away from him because the court found out that it was him who was the one who stole his Viagra. And now Nate is in the shitter because now he's not gonna be able to go to Yale. He's gonna have to repeat senior year. The only way that that will not happen is if Nate accepts the coach's offer, where he will have to work for the coach during the summer at the Hamptons, and only then will he get his diploma and go to Yale. So Nate has to agree to do this no matter what. Withholding your diploma was just a little slap on the wrist to let you know you can't get away with stealing my stuff, especially my medication. Dude, you still shouldn't have had Viagra on school premises. I want a place down in the Hamptons that could use some fixing up. You gotta be my boy this summer. You'll be going to the local church for AA meetings. So like these adults don't know that Nate has a drug problem as well. 
But again, nobody really does anything about it because even though he mentions AA meetings, that's never enforced. While graduation is happening, the callback for the movie that Serena is auditioning for is at the same time. So she's really late for her graduation and she ends up coming up as Blair is getting her honours thing. So again, like Serena... <laughs> She doesn't seem to do it on purpose, but she just does it. She gets the role in the movie that Blair also auditioned for, that Blair wanted, because it's a remake of Breakfast at Tiffany's. And she also gets up and arrives at graduation as Blair's getting her diploma. Before Aaron breaks up with Vanessa, Dan and Vanessa have sex again on the roof. So Vanessa's cheated like, quite a lot. And Aaron... Again, he doesn't react in the way that you would think. He is like, okay, like, you're not coming on a road trip with me, but I'll drop you off at graduation. He should be screaming and shouting at her. Whenever someone's caught cheating, there's seemingly no consequences. Serena also confides in Blair because she thinks that they're being friends again, and she says that she really is in love with Nate. I don't even know what to tell this girl anymore. I just... Okay, so she loves Nate. Okay, she's with Nate. But Nate... Good old Nate. Jenny spots Nate crying and gives him the ecstasy that she took from that boarding school. She starts flirting with him and Nate realises this and she tells him, let's go into the bathroom and do it. And Nate follows her in. It's not specified what they do right there and then. Jenny gives Nate all of the ecstasy, she doesn't want any of it. And he bends down and kisses her carefully on the lip. Jenny loved the idea that she was using Nate and the fact that he wanted her to use him gave her even more of a thrill. So we have Nate kissing Jenny right now while he's in a relationship with Serena. And poor Serena, who is head over heels in love with Nate, she sees them coming out of the alcove of like the men's room. They are a mess from like too much kissing. Jenny's hair is a mess, Nate's a mess. Jenny put her arm around his waist and he turned and kissed her eagerly on the mouth as if her lips were made of chocolate or something. Oh, Serena exclaimed as if she'd been pinched. It had never felt right her and Nate being together and it would be better to be single this summer so she could focus on the film. She's literally just watched the love of her life cheat on her with a 14 year old again. That's how you're reacting. Not only does the cheating infuriate me, but the reactions to the cheating infuriates me. Marcus has already left for England and has told Blair to come along to London with him. So Blair seems to be moving on very nicely from Nate. Serena's just broken up with him now. Well, they haven't like technically broken up. Nate's just cheated on her, Serena saw it and it's like so bad. It's just so bad. And Blair sees Serena upset and she loves seeing Serena upset. So again, like the friendship is really bad. The friendship is so bad right now. However, Nate comes up to them and he's like obviously high on drugs and stuff, which does give a reason to why he did that with Jenny, but still it's like, he's, he's drugged up all the time. But Nate comes over, gives both Serena and Blair a hug. Serena giggles and he even kisses Blair on the lips, even though she doesn't want it, like she pushes him away. So I'm not gonna count that as cheating towards Marcus because Blair didn't kiss him back. So he's acting all strange, and then Blair, she says, you wanna say something really cool? Immediately, Serena understood what they were about to do. The two girls smiled, their heads drawn nearer and nearer to each other as if in slow motion. You know you love me, they murmured in unison before their lips met in a kiss. So they end the book with Blair and Serena kissing, which again, I'm not gonna add to Blair's cheating counter, because I think it was just a, as a, oh, should I? No, because she's not like doing it romantically. They are best friends. But that's how we end the book. Blair and Serena are best friends again. They're kissing. Nate went off with Jenny, cheated on Serena, but Jenny's going off to boarding school. That's another book down. And I am seriously in danger here because I have six books and only this much wine. Okay, so this is when the Gossip Girl series starts to get written by a ghostwriter. And this is also the part of the vlog where I start getting sober as well, which is honestly so not ideal. Blair is in London and she's there with Lord Marcus and she meets Camilla, who is his second cousin. We get into some British stereotypes right here as well. I'm so delighted to meet you, said Camilla, staring down her long prominent nose, the kind of schnoz even the best plastic surgeon couldn't fix. Schnoz, honestly. Makes me paranoid. <laughs> but looks like there is trouble in paradise because Lord Marcus and Blair still haven't done the deed yet. Lord Marcus has been way too busy to spend much time with Blair at all. So Blair goes off on her own adventures in London. The English were standoffish with bad teeth and thick accents. And although their teeth and accents were distractions, so far every person Blair had spoken to had been unfailingly polite. Zoli's really been polite, but like standoffish with bad teeth, thick accents. What have we Brits ever done to you Americans? <laughs> I kid. 
Obviously, I kid. Do you want to know what Blair is out getting? A wedding dress. She's getting herself a wedding dress. Would you like to try it on? Yes, definitely. And it's one thing to try on wedding dresses and stuff. I imagine that I would also love to do this in another life. But then she buys it. For why? But she does want to get married to Lord Marcus. But, I mean... There are cracks, honey. You need to open your eyes and look at them. It's almost an ironic thing with Blair because she buys this wedding dress, right? And then she goes to, you know, the place where she's staying, where Lord Marcus is paying for everything. And she says, I want to fly to Paris. And she tells them to bill Lord Marcus, but they need to talk to him. And the concierge says, I do hope he'll find a moment to get away from his wife and come by. And Blair's like, what? Excuse me? He says, I believe I said, I hope he'll find a moment to get away from his life and come by. So the concierge is trying to like cover up his mistake, but like, was it a mistake? Was it really? Blair doesn't want to stick around to find out though. She tells him, book a flight to New York City right the fuck now, make it first class, and I'm out. So while all this is happening, Nate is in the Hamptons with the coach, and he starts to piv on his wife. He'd been so preoccupied, he hadn't noticed the best part of the view, the coach's wife, sunning herself in the bright morning rays, topless. She was a mom and she wasn't young, but she wasn't that old either. At least her boobs had aged well. I guess I can't fault Nate too much. At least he's single now, but not for long because he seems to have a thing for people who are younger than him because as he's out and about in the Hamptons, he comes across a group of kids and there he meets a girl called Tawny and all he can do is perv on her boobs. She has impressive pear-shaped boobs, which were totally visible. Nate was having trouble concentrating on what Tawny was saying because her boobs were practically in his lap. And again, Tawny's younger. Like I think maybe only like, yeah, like she says she's graduating next year, so she's not a senior yet, essentially. And literally, this is like their first meeting. He pitched his head forward and lightly kissed her, touching her cheeks gently. And before we know it, Nate and Tony are a thing. They have gotten together, so now Nate is in a relationship. So how long before he cheats on her? I'm taking bets. For some reason as well, Vanessa has been asked by Ken Mogul to help direct and be the camera person for the Breakfast at Tiffany's remake that Serena is the main character for. You know, she's been cast as the main female lead and Serena has been moved into an apartment which used to be a filming location for Breakfast at Tiffany's or something like that. So she's staying there and yeah, Vanessa's been asked to be the camera person. Worst idea in the world. Dan, meanwhile, is working at The Strand, which is a very popular bookstore. I don't think I've ever been. I've been in New York before, but I don't think I've been in the bookstore. And yeah, apparently it's like really prestigious and he's very lucky to even have a job there. And honestly, I don't even know how he got the job. He thought Frankenstein was Frankenstein's monster. Ruby is back with a new boyfriend as well and kicks Vanessa out. So now Vanessa needs a place to stay. Vanessa ends up staying at Dan's place. Rufus offers her Jenny's room because Jenny's going off. Jenny, I don't even think Jenny's in this book at all. She's gone off to Prague to spend the summer there before she goes to boarding school. So Dan's absolutely fine with Vanessa staying with him and his family. And Dan actually meets a girl called Brie at the Strand too and has a bit of flirty banter with her. Serena meets her co-star Thaddeus Smith, the male lead of her film, and she absolutely falls in love with him because he is gorgeous. He is absolutely gorgeous. And at the same time as well, with Blair being back in New York, Blair's mother tells Blair that she has to get a job. She says, you're not a child anymore. You're going to have to learn to manage your money. And Blair was like, I will die if I have to work. And honestly, I felt that. But Blair ends up having the idea that she will be a costume designer or an intern on Serena movie and just like that she gets the job even though I don't think there was a job opening for it she just gets the job okay we don't need to explain anything in Gossip Girl and this also leads to Serena inviting Blair to live with her in this apartment and Blair starts to help Serena become a better actress because Serena's not doing a good job she can't remember her lines like why the fuck did she get this job in the first place but Blair does genuinely help her and want her to be better so we do see like a really good friendship between them in this book like they're actually not at each other's throats, they're not being toxic. It's really quite nice. And Vanessa is filming this thing, right? And Ken Mogul asks to see what she has done so far. Like she's taken it from different angles. She thinks she's so artsy with it. And she says it's some of her best work. Ken disagrees. He says, what the fuck was that? <laughs> Vanessa looked at him. She couldn't quite read the tone of his voice. What the fuck was that, Vanessa? And then he fires her. Little Miss Indie Film has given me her bullshit camera work. I don't need this, you're fired. To be fair to Vanessa, he, essentially first got in touch with her when she filmed two teens getting it on in the park and he's surprised that she's not actually good. <laughs> Vanessa is immediately told about a potential job from somebody Blair knows. Vanessa doesn't even think to ask what the actual job is. She just goes to someone's house and goes inside and asks about the job and it turns out it's a babysitting job and Vanessa is in no position to turn it down so she takes it. So Vanessa becomes a babysitter. Who cares 
at this point. Who cares? Oh my gosh. So she's a director for this big budget Hollywood film in one chapter. And then in the next chapter, she becomes a babysitter. Dan's back on his bullshit. And he's trying to like impress Brie as well. So they go rollerblading in the park. I think Dan knocks into one. It, it's chaos. I don't know what actually happens. But Dan is on the floor and he's knocked into a kid. And then Vanessa comes up shouting at him because those are the kids that she's babysitting. And it's just like a really awkward moment between Vanessa, Dan and Brie. Especially since when Brie asks, who are you? Vanessa says, I'm his girlfriend about Dan. I'm his girlfriend. When did that happen? Did you tell Dan that you're his girlfriend again? Because that didn't happen. I mean, she does say that I'm his girlfriend, but like, they never like really made it official, I guess, because they were cheating together. She cheated on Aaron with Dan. And did they ever really like become boyfriend and girlfriend again? A lot of it's like very blurred lines. But yeah, Vanessa comes out with I'm his girlfriend. So Dan this entire time has been going on these dates. He hasn't kissed her or had sex with her. So I'm not really counting as cheating. Should I, should I count dating? Yeah, I'm gonna, you know what, I'm gonna add it. I'm gonna add it. Because he's literally been flirting and going on these dates with Brie. So yeah. Meanwhile, Thaddeus is being followed by the paps and he takes Serena out and kisses her in front of all of them. And I was getting some like really weird vibes from him because he'd accidentally texted Serena and there was like a guy involved. And honestly, my gay doll was like, hmm, something's fishy. Something stinks around here. And it's not the fish. And then Serena ends up meeting Serge, who turns out to be Thad's boyfriend. So Thad has been using Serena to seem straight to the media while seeing Serge as well. He didn't tell Serena any of this, so like I really feel like that was a really bad thing to do. Be honest. Firstly, like, oh, Serena, I'm gay, but like, can we pretend that we're dating for the paparazzi? And obviously Serena's like a bit confused to begin with, but then she realises, oh, you know what? I can have some fun with this. I can have some fun with Serge and Thad and... She's absolutely fine with it. So you do you, you do you. I would have kicked up a fuss, but you do you. Nate is also now dating Tony. Also there was mention of Newcastle Brown Ale and I'm from Newcastle. So I'm just like, we are getting references to my hometown. What is this magic? I love that. But yeah, he's with Tony and he says he can't help but feel he's with the wrong girl. So what does Nate do? He just ditches her without telling her. He literally realises that he was stupid for giving up on Blair, always fucking everything up with her, always taking her for granted or mistakenly hooking up with her best friend or whatever, that he'd been blind to the reality that without Blair, his life was nothing. Like the amount of times that he's been with Blair, like they've been together a good couple of times now, and every single time he's the one who fucks up. He still comes to all of these epiphanies. It happens every time. He has an epiphany. Oh, I can't live without Blair. It's all about Blair. I need Blair back. Speaking of Blair, remember, she's still technically in a relationship with Lord Marcus. She's just like left London. We haven't actually heard whether or not he actually has a wife or not. So they're still in a relationship. She hasn't actually broken up with him. Blair meets Jason, who is Serena's like apartment building neighbour person. And they start to get to know one another a little bit better. And then he bent down and kissed her slowly. His lips were the flavour of the sweet ale he'd been drinking all night in something pepperminty. So I want to add this one on to Blair's cheetah counter because... Yeah, she hasn't broken up with Lord Marcus yet. In fact, we don't care about Lord Marcus after this anymore. So yeah, we can assume that him and Blair are over. <laughs> Nate catches Blair and Jason kissing as well, by the way. And so he thinks, oh, you know what? I'm gonna go back to Tony. Even though he's had this whole revelation about everything, he's just like, you know what? Back to Tony I go. She actually goes off with Chuck. He saw that she was grinding with Chuck Bass, who'd unzipped his mint green shirt and was gyrating bare chested to a dance remix of that Kiara song. Ew. Out of nowhere as well at this fashion party, this fashion designer called Billy Winter comes up to Blair and Serena and says, both of you need to live with me in the Hamptons. You are both my inspiration. Blair, you are my winter. Serena is summer. And he needs them both to live with him in the Hamptons. And they just agree to it. They just agree to this random fashion designer who's just come up to them in a party and said, okay, let's do it. Because why not? Book number 10, we are finally in the double digits. Blair and Serena arrive at the Hamptons, they're living with Bailey Winter, and you would think that sounds like really glamorous and stuff, but like we never really get a, a sense of the Hamptons in the series at all. Like in this book, it doesn't feel glamorous, it doesn't feel like a great place to be. They also have to meet their clones, and they are two leggy Amazons they're described as, Abitha and Svetlana, and they will be the faces of the new line, and they will be mirroring Blair and Serena. It is honestly so confusing and so weird. I don't get the whole dynamic. I really, really do not get it at all. And there is a bit of racism as well with Blair too. Blair could say something else in their beady foreign eyes, something calculated and decidedly bitchy. Like they haven't even done anything at this point and Blair's already decided she doesn't like the look of them. Funny enough, at the same time, Nate is still working for the coach and 
the coach's wife, and the coach isn't there right now, the coach's wife is hitting hard on Nate. Like seriously, like she is coming onto him full force. She calls him her little gooseberry. <laughs> He might have been stoned most of the time, but he was with it enough to notice that Babs Michaels definitely had a thing for him. And even though he had a crush on Babs, even though he was like perving on her, he doesn't want to do anything with her, so like he makes an excuse and he leaves. Dan has a bit of a identity crisis, shall we say, in this book. He meets a guy called Greg. Greg, it's his first day at the Strand and Dan loves the superiority over him. They become fast friends, they decide that they are going to do a sort of salon or something like that, like this big book club, literature book club, and it's going to be exclusive as well. So people will email in and they will invite them in. So that's kind of like their little shtick. Vanessa really misses Dan and she feels so bad and depressed that she's fallen so hard and now she's doing like this babysitting job. But the family she's babysitting for, <laughs> surprise, surprise, are going to the Hamptons for the summer. So Vanessa is going to tag along with them to help look after the kids. Serena and Blair are like trying to troll their clones and like are kind of making practical jokes with them. And then they sort of leave they just totally abandon Bailey Winter and they run into Nate and they convince him to go skinny dipping with them. Even though like with all that history with them and his constant cheating, they're still fine with him. And they decide to go on a road trip together. Jenny is totally out of the picture now as well. She's sending postcards to Dan. But Dan's kind of got his hands full at the minute anyway, so he's not really responding very much because he's helping hold the first Song of Myself Literary Salon. Things go wild. Things get a little bit out of control. They're having some drinks and before Dan knows it, everyone's pretty much having sex with each other. Greg turns to Dan and Dan and Greg kiss. Vanessa, Dan murmured, running his hands over the soft prickly stubble on the back of her head as she kissed him ever so tenderly. You came back to me. Uh, Dan, it's me, Greg. Are you okay? So like Dan is like totally drunk. He doesn't know what the hell is happening. Greg pulled Dan's face close to his and kissed him softly on the lips. There was something so familiar comforting about kissing someone with short spiky hair. So we have Dan have this experience with another guy kissing him, even though he's like flat out drunk and he doesn't really know what's going on. I don't know how to feel about it, essentially. Dan's sort of going through like a gay crisis now, I guess. And his mum, who he doesn't really speak to and hasn't really spoken to in a very long time, she sends him a vase. Uh, it's white ceramic. It was about 18 inches tall and open at the top. At the base were two small rounded pieces on either side, which helped stabilize the tall central shaft. It was a vase, it was something, it was, well, a nicely glazed penis. So his mother, out of the blue, sends him a vase penis. And Rufus, the dad is like, you know who made that, don't you? Your mother. That's her handiwork. So she made him this. Was his mother trying to tell him something, something about himself that he'd somehow never managed to figure out himself? He'd never seen him mum in years. And then this, a penis shaped vase, coincidentally shows up in the mail just hours after he'd made out with a guy, but he wasn't gay. And he loved Vanessa most of all, right? The girl who looks like a boy. So what does Dan do with all this information? He sends a postcard to Jenny. And all it says is, dear Jenny, I'm gay, love Dan. He kisses the guy while drunk. His mum sends him a big penis face and now he's come out as gay. And he's confused, like he has no idea what he actually feels at this point, and that's fine. Like, he's confused, and everyone's confused about their sexuality at some point. Would you really send a postcard to your sister just announcing you're gay if you don't actually know? And also, again, bisexuality exists. It exists. What are we doing? And this is gonna be very confusing for Vanessa, who is still in the Hamptons. She ends up coming across Bailey Winters on the, like, the beach kind of thing. He decides that Vanessa is gonna be his new inspiration, and tells her that she needs to live with him and be used as inspiration and she says yes. She just says yes. She leaves her babysitting job without telling them and lives with a fashion designer she's never met before. And Vanessa kind of has a little thing for Chuck just for a moment, like this is never explored again. She was admiring Chuck Bass's perfectly torn torso. She kind of wanted to reach out and touch him. She licked her lips involuntarily. So yeah, she perves on Chuck a little bit and Sweetie the monkey, because again, Chuck's only storyline really is with a monkey. The monkey poos in the pool and Vanessa wants to film it. Did I mention, did I mention that I'm in love with you? Did I mention that Blair kissed Jason in the previous book, Serena's housemaid person? I think I did. Yeah, he's trying to call Blair, but she's ignoring his calls. In fact, she even forgets all about him. Nate wants to take Serena and Blair onto his family boat, except when they get to the wharf, the place where it's docked, it's not there. And again, Nate's driving when he shouldn't be driving because he's stoned. He's even nodding off at the wheel of the car. How nobody's had a car accident in this entire series, I have no idea. Serena does end up taking over and she's probably not even any better, to be honest. So the three of them end up going to Serena's parents' penthouse place and they all like go into bed together and they're all like 
well, you know, they always used to be like a threesome, like the best of friends ever since they were younger. And it feels like those days are coming back despite everything that's happened between them. And Blair as well, she lets out a sigh. It felt like she was breathing out something that she didn't know was inside of her. The frustration, the jealousy, the worry over what would happen next. Like she's wedged between Nate and Serena and it's bliss for her. Like she's actually happy, but how long is that gonna last? It ain't. Meanwhile, on the Gossip Girl website, which again, like you could easily skip these parts. Like you would not be missing pretty much anything. Somebody writes in with a question. I worry that I might be turning gay. Do you know if there are any warning signs? And Gossip Girl gives the worst the worst answer. Warning signs are plenty. One, you refer to things as fabulous or genius and have used the word swish in the last 24 hours. Yeah, this was definitely written in the 2000s. Number two, your best friend is a heavy girl with an interest in theatre. Okay. Number three, your ringtone is a Gwen Stefani song. Uh -huh. Love life, love boys, love yourself. That part I can agree with. Dan's trying his hand at writing some gay poetry to see if he really is gay. This is what he comes up with. Harry kiss, burn my chin, the sick taste of absinthe in my throat, deep in my gullet, sore lips and punches in the gut. Blind corners turned and now I am nowhere. I'm wondering if maybe I'm just not a poetry girly. Maybe Dan's poems have been fantastic and amazing. You guys think it's the best poetry in the world and I'm missing it. I'm not saying it myself. I'm no poetry expert. So I could definitely be wrong and I would hold myself accountable if that's the case. But I don't think that was any good. But Dan is still not convinced he's gay. Then why the fuck did he come out? He thinks of Brie naked and he felt something else too, a boner. Now we had biological evidence to prove that he, Dan Humphrey, was more certainly not gay. So he gets a boner thinking about gay. Again, you could be bisexual. Or you could even be pansexual. There are options. Honestly, teens, stay away from this book series. You will not learn anything good. It's almost Serena's birthday and she is visited by someone who she met at Hanover, who she used to be in love with and it's apparently their anniversary. Anniversary. Vanessa also leaves Bailey Winter and decides that she wants to be back with Dan. On Serena's birthday as well, Nate tells Blair that he loves her. Honestly, he's told her that many times before. Then he looked up and met her gaze, I love you, he finally whispered. At last. At last? He said it to him multiple times before and then cheated on her multiple times before. Serena overhears this and again it's her birthday so she's devastated. Serena never would have guessed Nate Archibald was so in touch with his emotions. Are you kidding me? When you guys were together in like the previous book, he wouldn't stop crying. It's like these ghostwriters didn't share notes. It's like they didn't read each other's books either. And so Serena decides to write a letter to Nate saying that she loves Nate. While Blair and Nate are definitely together again, Serena puts it in the glove compartment of his Aston Martin. Blair and Nate sneak out of Serena's the next morning and take the Aston Martin and they're gonna like drive away. They're gonna spend so much time together. They're gonna go on Nate's boat and just leave. Blair tells Nate to stop and he pulls over. He fills up, I think. And then Blair finds the letter that Serena wrote in the glove compartment, which reignites her hatred for Serena. It is odd timing because again, like I say, Every single time Blair has something, Serena seems to want it. So even though Serena had Nate, and it's not really fair to say because Nate did cheat on her, but like she's had a chance with Nate multiple times and only now when Blair has him again, she wants him. It's sus. Blair reads the letter and it's literally a love letter confessing her love. Blair rips it up. She destroys it. She doesn't let Nate say it. She gets rid of it, all about keeping it secret from Nate. Meanwhile, Nate gets a call from his coach saying that his life is over. You're never going to say that diploma. Yale, it's never going to happen. Big mistake, kid, fucking with me. Big time mistake, and I'm not through with you yet. And that was mainly because, yeah, Nate left the Hamptons. He didn't want to work for the coach anymore during the summer. But like, if Nate had said, your wife was hitting on me and it was very uncomfortable, maybe things could have been smoothed over, maybe? But I don't know, because again, the adults can't be trusted in this series. They don't act the way they should. Nobody does. But yeah, Nate is now not going to Yale and he doesn't tell Blair. And we end the book with Blair and Nate going off in the sunset on the sport. But going back a little bit as well, Dan tells Vanessa that he's gay. He says, I let this dude I met at the Strand kiss me. We started a salon together, I'm gay. My dad said he did some gay stuff when he was hanging out with poets back in the day, but me, I'm really gay. So he tells that to Vanessa. Again, like he literally, he said before this as well, that there was scientific proof that he wasn't gay because he had a boner for Brie. And now he's telling Vanessa that he's definitely gay. He even says, I wouldn't exactly say I like to kiss boys, but I did. Like this one moment, you don't have to label yourself from that one moment, Dan. And again, I can't really judge him too much for that because he could just be confused and he is confused and he doesn't know any better. He doesn't. He's been raised really shit. He doesn't have to label himself after one kiss. 
And even she says, look, you're either gay or you're not, or you're bi. Maybe that's what it is. You're just exploring, discovering yourself. So Vanessa actually making sense. She's actually making sense, but Dan's like, no, no, I'm gay. I'm gay. Just like, okay, whatever. I'm done with you, Dan. I'm through. I'm a little hungover today, lads, not gonna lie. I am wearing the same jumper as yesterday, full continuity. But in the words of Christina Aguilera, don't look at me. But I am ready to talk about the last four books. So book number 11 is the last book in the sort of timeline that we are currently in, you know, from book one to now. This is set a month after the events of the last book, you know, when Serena had her party and Nate and Blair went off in a boat. They've apparently been out to sea for literally a month and spent 24 seven together. I don't understand the logistics of that or how that actually happened. And especially with Nate being somebody who, again, is still smoking pot every single day and is stoned 24 seven. So how they didn't sink is beyond me. And apparently they've had no connection on their cell phones this entire month either. Which again, like gets contradicted a little bit later on. It just shows you that I don't think these books were actually planned well. I think the ghostwriters just sat down, wrote what they thought, and didn't even fact check their own work. Blair is still pissed off with Serena, but she doesn't want Serena to come between her and Nate again when they are coming back to Manhattan. She could totally find it in her heart to forgive poor, lonely Serena. Serena had no chance of coming between them ever again. Like nobody should really be with Nate, let's be honest. And the fact that a guy is constantly coming between these two friends, it just shows you how absolutely awful this friendship is. Both of them should have like ditched the other long ago. And I've eliminated my friends for less. Not eliminated as in like murdered, but like, you know what I mean? Like I I've dropped friends for like less crimes. Serena has been so depressed without her friends as well, because again, like her, Blair and Nate are like a threesome. They are like the best, best, best of friends. And them two going off on Serena's birthday without telling her, Serena spirals into depression. Not explored very well. Again, like as soon as she sees them come back, which they do very quickly, she is her happy-go-lucky self again. She squishes any sign of sadness or depression so that she can appear normal to her friends. She'd watched him lead Blair upstairs and right then she knew as surely as she'd ever known anything that she loved Nate. She loved Nate with her entire heart. So Serena is, you know, watching Blair and Nate be all lovey-dovey. Blair hasn't brought up the fact that she saw the letter. Nate doesn't know anything about the letter. Serena doesn't know if Blair read the letter or not. I can't help but feel a little bit bad for Serena, but like at the same time, I, this is so tricky. Can you, can you understand why I'm like, uh, in two places with a lot of these characters. They do shitty things to one another and we do get a lot of their internal monologues, their internal thoughts and feelings. It's hard not to feel sorry for someone at some point. And I'm telling you, this little triangle leads to bloody stop. But it's my circle of hell and it's continuing to turn. Dan and Greg are now a couple as well. And again, I get that Dan's confused, but the fact that he's leading Greg on, even though he knows he doesn't want to be with Greg, is not a great thing. Greg seemed to have decided two things, that Dan was gay and that they were a couple. Dan wasn't sure how he felt about either of those conclusions. And then Greg has to go off because his grandmother has passed away. So he's been gone for a month, so Dan hasn't really seen him. In this entire time, Dan is questioning whether he is gay or not. Like he constantly goes back on that kiss. Again, like he was flat out drunk when that kiss happened with Greg. The more he went over it in his mind, Dan wasn't even sure how he felt about the kiss anymore or about Greg, except that he was pretty sure he didn't really have any desire to do it again anytime soon. Then stop this charade. Stop it right now. The fact that he's come out as gay, even though he's not gay, it's like, and I don't know if you noticed, but my lantern died during filming last night. That's how I feel. That's how I feel with the storyline. I feel like I've died a little inside. He was really going to have to get in touch with his inner diva if he was going to make a go of it as a New York City bred gay man. Okay, to be gay, you don't have to be a diva. We all have different personalities and I know this might be a revelation to any straight people out there, but we're just like you. And if you want to be a diva, amazing, I support it. But I hope that when people read this book, they don't think that in order to be gay, you have to be a diva. You don't. I'm not a diva. And I'm a okay gay man, I guess. <laughs> Vanessa is torn that Dan is apparently gay, but the fact that he seems unattainable to her now makes her want him all the more. Listen, Vanessa, you've been with Dan so many times. You've had your chance and blown it. Both of you have blown it many, many times. Like this is like why every single relationship in Gossip Girl is toxic because they continuously get together, cheat on each other, get together again. And there are usually no apologies they just do it again. There's no resolution to any of the drama that's happened between them. It's just like a, a cycle. And honestly, by the 11th book, I was done. I read these kinds of books and I watch these kind of shows to escape and to see a life that I would also want to have. Like it does seem unattainable to see like the elite and the rich and famous. It's why I kind of have a soft spot for reality TV shows. But this has made it so undesirable to even be part of this life. It makes me feel much better about myself, which is probably the opposite effect it's supposed to have. It's supposed to show us the glam of the Upper East Side. 
there is no glam. It's more glamorous than my house right now, which is a mess because of my cats. And you know how I told you that Dan's mother had left the family years and years and years ago? Well, she's back and she's here to celebrate Dan's coming out. Like she is so happy that she has a gay son. She brings him a present. Do you remember that vase, that penis vase that she brought? Cradled in white wax paper was a chocolate eclair Two plum cream puffs nestled on either side of the long frosty pastry. But that looked a whole lot like a, it's a penis, his mother trilled. Why is she obsessed with giving Dan phallic objects? I mean, as touching as it is that she's so accepting of her son so quickly, it's a little bit concerning as well that she's making it out to be that he's obsessed with penis. Like, being gay means you're obsessed with penis. Not all gay men. I mean, I am, but like, not all. And even Rufus, he says gay. When did this happen? He doesn't even bloody know about it yet. It doesn't make a whole lot of sense, especially since it's been a month. Honestly, I would have loved to have seen this acted out because you would actually see how ridiculous it would come across on screen. It does complicate things for Dan though because he says she seemed really excited by the idea of having a gay son and he hadn't seen her in at least 10 years. I mean, there are levels to that, but in Dan's mind now, the reason his mum comes back is because he's gay. And so being gay is what brought his family back together. So I can see in his mind why he would want to continue the charade now. Like it is quite upsetting and it is quite horrible in a way to like pretend to be gay just to bring your family together. But I can see his reasoning right now. Not great reasoning, but it's reasoning nonetheless. Like I don't hate him right now in this moment. He's still a misogynistic pig. We will move on to something a lot more problematic now though. Blair's mum tells Blair that they're moving to LA and that her father, her gay father, has adopted Cambodian twins. He adopted these Cambodian twins and called them Ping and Pong. This was published in 2007, but I still feel like even in 2007, have some common sense. No wonder the ghostwriter wasn't named. I would be ashamed. Moving on from that, we do have these graduation parties that are about to happen, and Blair's mum wants to make a sort of special photo slideshow for Blair, and she asks Nate and Serena to go through a whole load of photos and pick the best ones for the slideshow without telling Blair. It's like a secret from Blair. I mean, you guys probably can assume what's about to happen next, can't you? So let's go into Nate's brain for a second. I mean, none of us want to be there, but we have to be there. We have to find out what's going on in there. So he's smoking joint after joint, and he says, and most of all, he still loved Blair and Serena. So even though he's with Blair again, Blair is his girlfriend yet again. He is thinking about loving Serena. And it's okay to be torn between them. It is. But like, with the many chances he's had, this is blasphemy. Nate's dad also doesn't want him to keep getting away with his shit. So he makes him see his mentor, Captain Chips White. And Nate and Captain Chips begin to like form some kind of friendship. Interesting as well because we got mention of the Carlisles on page 66 of this book. And there is a spin-off book series called the Carlisles. So there's a little bit of a backdoor pilot right there. Nate and Serena are spending more time together getting these photos. Blair notices this and she kind of stalks them for a bit. She keeps an eye on them. She goes to like Nate's house and sort of waits outside and she sees Serena coming out and stuff like that. And Serena is honest about what they're doing. When Blair confronts her, she says that they're just picking out photos for a slideshow, that Blair's mum asked them to do that and Blair believes it. And she's like, oh, okay, that's fine. And she's still holding the letter over Serena's head as well because she still hasn't talked about it. She knows about it, but she doesn't want to talk about it just yet. So even though Serena's been honest about what her and Nate have been doing and they're together in Nate's bedroom, they get dangerously close as they're looking at these photos. And Nate, when he's talking about being away with Blair, he says, it was probably the best month of my life, he said, although he was really thinking about how kissable Serena's lips always looked. <laughs> he's in a relationship, remember? He's just been away with Blair for a month. Apparently the love of his life, he was crying his eyes out a couple of weeks ago because he wasn't with her while he was with Serena. He's cheated on her multiple times. He's finally got her back again. And he is in this room with Serena, very close thinking how kissable Serena's lips are. Before they can do anything though, Nate does get a phone call from Chips, telling him to meet him down at the dock and he wants to talk to him. He honestly gets the weirdest advice from this old man. You kind of think with your balls, not your dick, because the men who think with their dicks are cowards. Like, I don't understand that advice. And I don't know why he's telling this 17 slash 18 year old, I don't actually know how old he is now, to think with his balls and not with his dick. I don't get it. This advice was not led up to. There was nothing to assume that he would give this advice. What? what? What does that even mean? Nate does end up going to Blair and confesses that he didn't get his diploma so he can't go to Yale. And Blair is pissed, as she would be. She's been dreaming about them going to Yale together. She's had these plans that she's told him for an entire month all of these plans and stuff that they're gonna do together. And one month later he tells her, so obviously she's gonna be pissed at that. And it's weird as well because she's more pissed at that than any time he's cheated on her in the past. But 
we're gonna get to this, okay? So as soon as this kind of fallout has happened between them, they're still together, they're still in a relationship, they haven't broken up. Right after this, Nate goes to Serena. His feet had led him right to Serena's doorstep. He was trying to think with his balls, like Chip said. So I thought he was thinking with his balls when he told Blair the truth, but no, in his mind, he thinks that thinking with his balls means going to Serena, his best friend who he's cheated on Blair with before, to cheat on Blair again. Serena asks if he ever got her letter, he says no. And she says, I wrote a letter to tell you that I love you. Sitting there with Serena on the floor of her room, everything felt right and simple. In fact, when he really thought about it, things between him and Serena had always been simple. It was life that had complicated them. Or, you know, Nate's tendency to cheat on everyone. Hmm? And somehow it felt totally right for him to kiss her. Oh, we're doing this again, are we? You think it's right to kiss? your girlfriend's best friend, again. So they have sex. They're trying to get these photos for Blair's graduation party thing. He's just been away with Blair for a month. They have plans to go to Yale together. And even though he's messed up those plans, like he messes up everything, he thinks the right thing to do is to sleep with Serena. And Serena, who's been trying to fix her friendship with Blair, thinks it's okay to sleep with Nate. I've said this many times in this video, but I'm done. I'm actually done. They decided to keep it a secret, and Serena even thinks Blair had been in love with Nate for as long as Serena could remember. The problem was, so had she. And after spending the entire day and night in bed together yesterday, Serena was positive Nate loved her too. Serena didn't want to hurt her. That was the last thing she wanted to do. Then stop sleeping with her boyfriend. It's fine to be in love with him. I don't think you can ever help who you love, especially when you have this huge history with, but just don't get with them when they're in a relationship. Serena also tells Blair that she's decided not to go to Yale. She wants to focus on her acting career. And Blair's pissed at that too. It's like everything's kind of crumbling around Blair and as much as Blair does do a lot of things that infuriate me too, she seems to always have the worst things happen to her at once. Some of it is karma, but then other times I think it's just so unnecessary, especially when it's things that just keep happening and happening and happening. It's fucking Groundhog Day. It's not even Gossip Girl, it's Groundhog Girl. And again, Blair doesn't know about Nate right now, but she rings her dad and tells him please, please, please get Nate into Yale. She needs him to get into Yale because she doesn't want to leave him in New York City with Serena because she doesn't trust either of them and she has every fucking right not to trust either of them. And her dad is like, okay, I'll see what I can do. And then he does end up getting Nate into Yale. And I'm like, excuse me, but do you remember a good few books back when Blair couldn't get into Yale? She got waitlisted. If it was that easy, if she could have just rang her dad and she even tried at one point, I'm sure she tried at one point to ring her dad and say, get me into Yale, and he couldn't do it. But now he can do it with somebody who doesn't have a diploma. Whereas at the time, Blair was doing a lot of extracurricular activities. She had a great resume, stuff like that. She just messed up her interview. She couldn't get in? That doesn't make sense. As all of this is happening, Nate and Serena are hooking up again. Being with Serena was so much less stressful than being with Blair. He knew that Blair was angry, but he also knew that she'd eventually forgive him, just like she always did. <laughs> Oh my God, the entitlement. What an assumption to make. But to be fair, she has forgiven him for like everything he's ever done without good reason as well. He doesn't deserve it. So a part of me is like, okay, I can see why he would think that. But the audacity still. He'd always thought he'd have to choose between the two girls, but now it seemed he could have them both. What an absolute moron. I think Nate is probably like my least favorite character just after reading all of it. Like serious, I don't think I can tell you anything positive or good about Nate. He treats both people who he says he loves like absolute shit. And then he assumes that they will just love him and idolize him and he can get away with anything. He's the most infuriating kind of man I can think of. Him and Dan. Chuck has been like the least problematic, which is so bizarre, especially since he had his really weird gay storyline, which actually in this book, it does seem like, okay, going back to Dan for a second because it ties into Chuck. Dan is still trying to work up the whole gayness of himself. And he thinks, oh, if I'm gay, I can also become a better writer. His dad says, I imagine that your marginalized position will be very productive for your writing. And again, this just shows you bad parenting because he is putting this into Dan's head. So Dan decides to ham up his gayness and decides, okay, yeah, I'm just gonna be gay. I'm gonna see if I can get over like my writer's block and stuff like that. I guess what pisses me off most is the fact that he makes it look like being gay is a choice. Like anybody can do it. And I'm just like, being gay is not a choice. He hangs out with Vanessa Lowe's and you can tell he does really love her, but he is choosing to be gay because he thinks it'll make him a better writer and that his family will stay together, which I mean, ugh. Okay, I'm conflicted with that itself, but like the author, the narrator is making it seem like being gay is a choice. Like say Chuck, his gay phase, because that's what it is. And Chuck does end up getting with Greg. Greg splits up with Dan. This whole thing is just a phase, which again, people do have their gay phase, I guess. When people are exploring their sexuality, it's fine to explore it. You know, you do you. Do what makes you happy. And as long as you're not hurting anyone else, that is absolutely fine. But like, 
The way that gayness is framed within the entire series itself, it comes across as if it's only a choice. You only choose to be gay. I'm just pissed off that teens will probably be reading this thinking, oh, I can just choose to be gay when it suits me. I can just choose to be gay to make myself a better writer. You know, it's just, it pisses me right off. And it doesn't even make Dan a better writer. So Ruby, Vanessa's sister, is getting married and she's asked Dan to write a poem for her wedding, right? So he needs to write some kind of really great love poem for her wedding. All the while, Dan can only think about Vanessa at this time while trying to write a poem that channels his inner gay. Do you want to know the poem he reads out at this wedding? Open the fridge and put my heart on a plate. I'm just as you left me and I taste even better left over. Pale Fury, why did you leave me? You're prickly in the morning. So prickly. This isn't a cooking show. This isn't chemistry or geography. It's physics. Pure physics. I'm falling fast and faster still. So fall with me, fall down with me and stay. And everyone's clapping, everyone's applauding. This poem is obviously about Vanessa. You're so prickly. He's obviously talking about her hair again because that's all she is, is her shaved head. And he wrote this for Vanessa's sister's wedding. If somebody said that out loud in the church where I'm getting married, I would literally throw the priest at them. Well, let's go back to Blair, Nate and Serena. Blair is talking to Nate, who is, again, keeping tight-lipped about what's happened between him and Serena. Serena's not mentioning anything either. Okay, so Blair and Nate are talking. She doesn't know if Nate is back in the Yale just yet. And she's talking about, like, oh, how can we make this relationship work? You can, like, visit me on the weekends or, like, throughout the week and stuff like that. And he's saying, like, he can take the subway on weekends. And she says, leave you here all by yourself with those slutty Lady Cole girls? I don't think so. And Nate has the actual audacity to say, you can trust me. <laughs> Honestly, Gossip Girl is the funniest book series I've ever read. You can trust me. <laughs> she gets him into Yale and he says thank you. He's so thankful for it. And he tells her like, you're amazing. Like this is amazing. So they're gonna go off to Yale together, which is like a big deal. And anyway, Chips tells Nate that he's gonna be sailing around the world. And that sparks a little bit of an idea in Nate's brain. So he goes to say Serena and Serena still thinks that Nate and her are gonna be together. So once Blair goes away to Yale, she doesn't know that Nate's going to Yale yet. She thinks that when Blair goes away that she will be able to have Nate all to herself. Nate isn't honest with Serena and says that, oh, he's also planning on going with Blair to Yale. She says, it'll be easier tomorrow after Blair leaves. And he's like, yeah. He also tells Serena that Blair wants to meet him at Grand Central tomorrow at 10, which is when he'll be going with Blair. But he tells Serena that's the time to meet there. And she says, okay, we should both go see her off. And he's like, yeah, let's do it. Even though he's going with her. Serena says, I love you. And Nate held her, squeezing her tight, I love you too. What is he doing to her? He is lying to her face, making her think that they're gonna be together and they're gonna send Blair off and then they're gonna be happy ever after while he's planning on also going to Yale with Blair. So they're planning this for the morning, aren't they? They still have like the graduation party get through first. And the mother of Blair, she puts up the slideshow that Serena and Nate put together. <laughs> do you wanna know what song she puts over it? What are you gonna do with all that junk? All that junk inside your trunk. The Black Eyed Peas, My Humps. For Blair's sort of story of her life, there's photos of her in kindergarten. Photos of her, of Blair and Serena as children during this entire montage. Lyrics like, they say I'm really sexy, the boys they wanna sex me. They always standing next to me, always dancing to me, trying to feel my hump hump, looking at my lump lump. You can look, but you can't touch it. If you touch it, I'ma start some drama. While there's like photos of them as children. This series, honestly, the fact that this was published in the first place just shows you anything can happen. And as this is happening as well, Blair and Serena are in tears and they are emotional and they hug and they forgive one another for like everything. Like they are like the best of friends now again. Meanwhile, Serena still hasn't told her about Nate and the fact that she plans on living with Nate. Nate hasn't told them about, well, his new plans now. He has a different plan in his brain that we're gonna find out in a chapter or two. And Serena still plans on seeing Blair off at the train station with Nate so that they can be together. So like the amount of two-facedness in this series, which I guess is the point, Nate says Blair and Serena hugging it out. And then he says he was going to think with his balls once and for all. And do you know what thinking with his balls actually means? So as Blair is waiting at the train station, she's about to go off to Yale. She's so excited. She's about to go with her boyfriend. The train is leaving at 10. It's like 10 minutes before the train leaves. Serena comes and she wants to see Blair off and she's like, where's Nate? And she's like, oh, I don't know. He's supposed to be here. We're supposed to leave by now. Blair's trying to get in touch with Nate. Nate isn't answering his phone. Instead of running to the train station, he's running to the dock so that he can leave with Chips, so that he can go around the world with Chips instead of going to Yale with Blair. Even though she managed to get him into Yale, 
through her father, he decides he's not gonna do it. But he doesn't even tell Blair that he's not gonna do it. So she's standing there waiting for him to arrive while he's going off on this adventure. He does, however, while he's on the boat, you know, it's already like too late, after Blair's already left like a million messages, he sends a text to both Blair and Serena. Be your Ness, sailing around the world, I love you both, always have, always will, take care of each other, N. Meanwhile, he's telling Chips, they both think I'm meeting them at Grand Central right now. And he feels bad, but only for a minute. This is Blair's big day. She wants to get on this train so that she can get to Yale, her dream university. And he waits until the very last moment to tell her that he's changed his mind Fuck you, I'm leaving both you and Serena, I'm choosing myself. Why does Nate get this happy ending? Why does he get to be the one to choose? He said, if I told them they would have tried to stop me from leaving and I might have let them. No, if you had to just messaged them earlier and just told them that, it would have done them a service. Like Blair could have gotten on her train on time. Serena wouldn't have had to have shown herself up by going to the train station. It would all mean fine and well. However, again, this is what frustrates me is that their reaction to it is not good. They both laugh and giggle and then they're off on their merry way. Blair, Nate is supposed to be your boyfriend. Serena, Nate just told you that he loves you and that he would spend time with you and be with you. He's just played them both for a fool. And Nate is the one who gets the happy ending. He's the one who gets to choose not to be with either of them. It should have been the other way around. They should have chosen not to be with him and chose to be friends with each other instead of him making the decision. Oh my God, I'm so frustrated. This is not a good ending. This is not a good ending to this. And Gossip Girl is like, I'll always be here. I'm just like, I wish you wouldn't. So next is the prequel. So this is set a couple of years before the very first book. So we're going back in time. We start off with the fact that Serena has disappeared. She's gone off to boarding school, but then it goes back in time again to before she went to boarding school. There's this whole like mystery, like why did she go to boarding school? It's literally answered on page five. Mom and dad want me to go to boarding school next year. That was the whole mystery that was set up on page one. Serena's gone missing, where has she gone? And then obviously we already knew this as well because literally the very start of the first book, she's back from boarding school. So it's like, we try to set up this mystery. <laughs> it's answered on page five and we already knew all about it anyway. So we do get a lot of things that were built up to in the first book, like say Blair's dad turned out to be gay. So for instance, Blair does overhear him on the phone talking like dirty and stuff. And she assumes that he's having an affair with another woman. And when Blair brings this up to Serena and Nate as well, they say, well, he could have just been talking dirty to your mom. And she's like, no, it's definitely another woman. Even though it doesn't really explain how and why she thinks that. Yeah, he could have been on the phone to his wife. Blair's whole personality of like loving Audrey Hepburn comes from this as well because Nate tells her that she looks like Audrey Hepburn then from now on her life's work would be to emulate Audrey Hepburn in every possible way so we see that the only reason why she wants to be like Audrey is because Nate told her she looked like her that's great let's just add more fuel to the fucking fire when it comes to Nate and how much he like rules her life I didn't really mention Vanessa too much in the previous book because she really did fuck all other than her and Dan getting sort of back together but in this one we see where she got the idea to shave her head. The girls in my class don't give two shits about recycling or art. All they do is get their highlights done and trade lip glosses they get in gift bags and all those fancy parties they go to. She's so judgmental of all of these girls. And I think I mentioned this previously in this video as well. The fact that Vanessa changes her whole personality, her whole appearance, just to not be like them. And she actually has waist length hair in this. She has been partnered with Blair for like a, a school project. And as they're walking down the street, Vanessa notices a barber shop and she says to Blair, two seconds, I just need to run in there. She sits down in the chair and tells the barber, actually, I'd like you to shave it, please. Shave it all off. Megan, her Constance Billard classmates hate her was an intrinsic part of the image she was cultivating. And out of all the people in her class, it was very important to her that Blair Waldorf hate her the most. So again, she's only shaving her hair off to piss other people off. My advice to you is just don't do that. Why do you care enough what other people think that you would do that? It's fine to shave your hair off if that's what you genuinely wanna do, but just to piss the girls off at school? you've got problems. And we know this, Vanessa, we know you've got problems. It was very easy to forget that Dan had an obsession with Serena, especially since him and Serena never really interacted that much towards the end of the first 11 books. But we are reminded again of his obsession with her. And this is when we find out how Dan becomes a poet because he didn't really have anything creative to do beforehand. And he writes his first ever poem. Nothing hit until you pushed me hard and I fell. It's bleeding, I'm bleeding. And I'm falling still, still falling. Can't you see me from up there? The water's clear. He was becoming a poet and Serena was becoming his muse. So like this is where his love for poetry comes from. It comes from Serena really, which is kind of sort of interesting in a way, but at the same time, knowing that they didn't really have a great story to begin with in 
the book series. It just makes it rather redundant at this point. Jenny is also still obsessed with Serena. She's making loads of portraits of Serena and Jenny puts that poem in Serena's locker for her. Serena says it, she says it's like flattering to get a poem, but also it's like a little bit weird too. Which actually brings us to Jenny's big storyline in this, which is the fact that Jenny, who now in this book, I think she's like 12. It's a couple of years before and so she's like 12. She is sick of having no boobs. So we had in the first 11 books, the fact that her boobs were too big. She doesn't have any boobs right now. She hasn't really gone through puberty yet. So what Jenny does is she goes online and she buys some supplements, some like boob growing supplements. All natural, risk free with a link to a site called nonockers.com. A 100% organic, all natural breast enhancement supplement called Mama Grow. She ends up using her dad's card to buy them and she gets these supplements. She starts taking them. Lo and behold, her boobs start growing, but then her boobs won't start Stop growing and she gets mortified the fact that she has these big boobs but what's so bad about this is like it's yeah I mean her body's changing but what it is is that this book makes it look like these supplements were actually the reason why her boobs started growing it wasn't just like the puberty or anything and then she sends an email to norknockers.com I just want to thank you for making an affordable product that actually works I started taking the supplements one week ago and I went from not even an A cup to a whole B cup I'm only 12 and a half and I was totally flat before so she's thanking this supplement company for helping her grow her boobs and if there are any other teens out there reading this who are, might be 12 don't do that it's making getting boob supplements desirable and that they actually work which they are a scam right like i'm not a teenage girl i've never had to take boob supplements before but charlie this was a scam is this like product placement in a book i know the show did this a lot but like is this product placement for nonockers.com? And even Jenny gets fan mail from people who saw her review of this, being like, oh my God, Jenny, you're such an inspiration. I took them too and they worked for me. Why is this a thing? But at least now we know the origin of why Jenny's boobs are so big. It's not really an origin story I wanted, but it's definitely the one we ended up getting. If you want to know what Nate's doing, he's just being horny all the time. And again, he is a teenage boy, fair enough. And he's constantly hanging out with Serena and Blair. And he's constantly sort of like in the middle of them. They have sleepovers and stuff and he's with them. And he's kind of being close to one of them and then being close to the other one. There are also some timeline issues with this one as well, because if this was supposed to be set before the first Gossip Girl book, which that itself is dated, you can really tell was written in the very early 2000s. So this would have been like 2000, right? This should be set in the year 2000. Meryl Streep and Devil Wears Prada meets Bono. And I'm like, didn't the Devil Wears Prada come out in 2006, the film? So I think what this book did, I think this came out when the TV show had started. I think this confused the timeline of the TV show with the timeline of the books. So this is set in probably 2007, even though the book series is set like 2002 onwards kind of thing. You know what I mean? So it just goes to show you again that these books were not well written. They were written with the TV show in mind by this point. This came out in 2007. Isn't that the year Gossip Girl started? 2007. Blushing as his pen flew across the page, Dan felt his palms grow more and more damp and he bit his lower lip. He was the next E.E. E. Cummins, the next Robert Frost, the next Wallace Stevens. I mean, I appreciate when somebody has these big dreams and they just go for it. Like, I love the confidence. So both Blair and Serena are in love with Nate. We feel this from this very moment and Blair tells Serena, even though Serena in Nate have kind of kissed before. Like their first kisses with each other. So technically before Blair even came onto the scene as Nate's girlfriend, Serena and Nate had already kissed and Serena was already deeply madly in love with Nate. And then Blair tells Serena, I'm in love with Nate. So Serena's like, oh, I don't want to hurt my friend's feelings. I'm going to go boy crazy and I'm going to sleep with as many boys as I possibly can. And how old is she in this? Like 14, 15? Like, what is the author trying to do here? And Serena's about to tell Blair that they kissed. Nate tells Serena that he was thinking about her all weekend. Serena's like, when are we going to tell Blair? And Serena didn't tell her because she wants her and Nate to tell her together that they kissed. Bear in mind, Blair and Nate are not a couple right now. They've never kissed. They've never done anything together, but Serena and Nate have. So technically, they've actually gotten together first. Even though they haven't officially said they were boyfriend and girlfriend, Friend, they're kind of together. They're just doing it behind Blair's back because Blair loves Nate and they don't want to hurt Blair's feelings. But Dan and Vanessa meet on a roof. That's their origin story. Do I give a shit? Absolutely fucking not. Blair and Serena are trying to stop Nate from sleeping with someone else and they end up kissing each other, pretending to be lesbians in order to like entice him to not sleep with anyone else. Like they're like, oh, stay with us. Don't feel threatened. We're lesbians. And then they start kissing each other. Nate has both Blair and Serena with him and Serena decides, oh, you know what? Actually, I want to let Blair have Nate. And she's going to go off and kiss Chuck. She goes off, 
finds him, kisses him in front of them. Should I add that to the cheat and count? I don't think so because I don't think her and Nate are really technically together. Again, it's just so confusing. I don't understand. I don't understand the relationship dynamics right now. It's just all over the place. I'm gonna add this one to Serena's cheat encounter because in her mind and in Nate's mind, they kind of are a couple. Yeah, I think I'm just gonna count it. This is Ash. Hi, Ash. <laughs> okay, thanks for the hugs and I will get you some food, okay? Let me just finish talking about this book. I'll not be long. And actually the only reason why I am gonna add this to the cheat encounter as well is because Nate then ends up kissing Blair in front of Serena and Serena runs away crying. So, I mean, I know this is like messy teen stuff. I can't even believe I'm talking about it. <laughs> and I'm gonna add that one on to Nate's cheat encounter because it does seem like him and Serena are in a relationship. They're just trying to hide it from Blair by kind of getting off with other people and then getting off with Blair. <sighs> I don't know. Meanwhile, Vanessa and Dan are getting closer. And then Dan sees on Vanessa's camera that she has some like pervy photos of Serena. Vanessa, she takes weird photos, doesn't she? Weird films. And there is like photos of Serena like bending over and stuff and he like can see her butt. And again, she's like 14, 15. And Dan, the little perv, decides to take Vanessa's camera and put those photos onto his computer. Like he downloads those photos. And then a bit later on, Vanessa, she takes this really awful photo of Dan sleeping, decides to upload it onto his computer as a joke. She sees the photos of Serena that she took on his computer. She gets pissed at Dan for liking Serena. So what she does is she puts his hand in a bucket of water and leaves so that he will piss himself. How old is she? Is this something that you would expect in a Gossip Girl book? Did this ever happen in the Gossip Girl TV show? Back with Blair and Nate. Blair tells Nate after they've kissed, I love you, Nate. And he doesn't respond. She says, you didn't say anything. I said I loved you and you didn't say anything. So he says, I love you too. He responded automatically. So it doesn't even seem like a genuine I love you. Whereas he has already been like, with Serena and he does seem to have more feelings for Serena at this point. I can't work out his feelings. I really can't. Blair was not a religious person, not really, but she was having a religious experience. Nate was a god, her god, and he'd blessed her with his love. Making Nate her god? No wonder she's been fucked up for the first 11 books of the series. So Chuck now thinks that Serena loves him because she kissed him. So he brings her some presents and he says, when you kissed me last night, I knew you're the one I love. She says, I don't mean to hurt your feelings, but I need you to go now. And then Chuck reacts, you're supposed to be so slutty or do you only do it with girls? He doesn't have a good reaction. That was so unwarranted. Also, Serena did play him like a fool in order to seem like she was in love with Nate. Both of their hands are unclean, but Chuck is still an asshole for that response. Back with Nate and Blair. Blair's dad, who has come out as gay, has come over to see Blair, but Blair's asleep and Nate wants to like protect her from him. Something about Mr. Waldorf's gayness made him feel like a freaking caveman. Like all he could do was grunt and whack things with a club. It was kind of cool the way he just like protected Blair from meeting her dad's gay lover. Um... Blair's dad just changes completely. So now Blair and Nate are together. So fuck Serena. Blair goes away to a wedding in Scotland. And that's when Nate rings Serena and says, meet me at Grand Central at 4.35. So she is like, oh my God, does like Nate love me again? So she meets him there. They kiss on the lips. So I'm gonna add that to Nate's cheating counter because he's supposed to be in a relationship with Blair now. Serena, his girl, his dream girl was right here, right now, sitting so close, her thigh pressed against his, breathing the same air he was. And takes her back to his home. So he's calling Serena his dream girl while he's in a relationship with Blair now. And that is when we have them have sex for the first time. And this is the whole catalyst of a lot of the issues that happened in the first book. But as we see from the prequel, it seems like Nate and Serena were kind of together first. He kind of ditched Serena for Blair. Again, like none of it's right. None of it's good. Like it does shine a whole different light on the whole thing. It shows you like a different perspective to Serena herself and what she did with that. I don't know if it's like the same in the TV show, but yeah, she kind of was like Nate's first kiss and everything. Like they were there each of their firsts, really. Ugh, I'm not saying it's right, but they have sex twice, so I'm adding both of those to Nate's counter. Serena's not in a relationship right now, so I'm not saying that she's cheating on anyone. How fun, how right, to be doing the scariest thing for a girl to do for the first time with her best friend, the boy she'd loved forever, her Nate. Like, it sounds romantic, it really does, especially in Serena's head, and Serena's always craved love and attention. And I genuinely think that Nate's more in the wrong here because he's the one in the relationship with Blair, and he's the one who's been, like, stringing both girls along. They tell each other that they love each other. If this is, like, a love story, or a romance, then fair enough, they love each other so they're having sex and that's fine. And they're using condoms, so even though they're teens, it's weird to talk about, really is weird to talk about. But like, they love one another and they're practicing safe sex, so that's all good. And the author is demonstrating that 
to the reader. They're watching Moses on the TV and she tells him that he parted her Red Sea. You nasty. It is definitely a very, very gross analogy. So they kiss again and before they knew it, he was parting her Red Sea once more. So another one to add to the cheat encounter with Nate. So they have sex multiple times, like more times than they've ever admitted in the original book. So again, I'm wondering if the ghost writer actually read the first book because, or any of the other books, because it just didn't make sense in the whole grand scheme of things. Guess what? Blair is coming back from her trip to Scotland. She comes in on Nate and Serena, but they've kind of stopped having sex and they've kind of sorted themselves out and Blair doesn't suspect a thing. She doesn't suspect a thing and then Nate just goes back to Blair. And then Serena is heartbroken that Nate's done that. So she decides, you know what? I'm glad I'm going to boarding school. So she goes to boarding school. So if you ever wanted to know what happened before the first book and who was in the wrong, I generally think it was Nate. I don't blame Serena too much even though she should not have done that to her best friend, Nate dragged her along and manipulated her emotions. And bear in mind, she is like younger as well. Like in this book, she's younger. She's like 15. So is he, 14, 15. So is he, but still he led them both on. He made Serena believe that he loved her and he does love her. But whenever the two of them are there, he seems to just want to hurt them both by being with both of them. I feel like a lot of people hate Serena from the TV show for what she's done and stuff, but like, I don't know if the book series would make you see her in a different light. She could see now that what she and Nate had done last night was so dangerous and explosive and hurtful, it was best to pretend that it didn't happen at all. She felt like her chest had been cut open with a dull knife and without any anesthesia, and Blair was ripping her heart out with her bare hands. And because she wants Blair and Nate to be happy, she leaves from boarding school. It's kind of a selfless thing to do. Obviously she should tell her best friend what she's just done. I do really feel bad for Serena while also condemning her actions for not being honest and for doing it in the first place. It's a conversation to have. Let me know in the comments what you think about this. Okay, I had to top up my coffee so that I can go into the penultimate book. Oh my God, I'm so happy. Not from the book, not from the book, but like the fact that we have made it this far. Oh, like I'm proud of us. I'm so proud of us. The continuation story that didn't need to happen. It's overly long, just like the prequel was. For some reason, the prequel book was 400 pages. And this is a continuation. So this is four months after book 11. And it's funny as well, because even though this is again, written by a ghostwriter, it has a sort of bio for Cecily Von she always wanted to be a writer. You know, some dreams are better left as just that, dreams. To be fair though, it did bring us the TV show Gossip Girl, which I think we're all pretty much thankful for. Even though I haven't watched it all, I do recognize its status as an icon. So the continuation, it's set four months after, and this actually is only set around Christmas time and New Year, and it's split into four parts, and it's each year. So it's like Christmas and New Year, one year, and then part two is the following Christmas and New Year, and then part three is the following Christmas and New Year. To catch up to speed with our characters, Blair has been at Yale and she has a new boyfriend who she met at Yale. We have Nate, he's been sailing around with Captain Chips. And we have Serena who has stayed in New York and she's rather sad again without her friends, but she has been working on her acting career. Blair's new boyfriend is called Pete Carlson and he and his family are going away on a Christmas vacation that Blair is not invited to. Apparently there is a no ring, no bring rule. So if you are not married into the family, you can't go on this vacation. So Blair's like, screw you, I'm gonna go back to Manhattan. So again, like her and Pete have not broken up and you know where I'm gonna go with this, don't you? <laughs> you know where I'm going with this. <laughs> so Blair's going back to New York where Serena is. Nate is still out on the open sea with Chips and he's asking Chips, oh, where are we going next? And he says, it's back to New York for you, Sonny. It's time, I've shown you the world, now you've got to live in it. I don't believe they've been around the world in four months. I don't believe it. Nate is like, he'd had some time away, some time to think and be on his own, to say the world and become a man. So I'm like, okay, this could probably be a great change for Nate. Maybe he has grown up. And then when he saw Blair and Serena, he'd be ready to choose. When he saw them, he'd just know. Oh, like you don't get the right to fucking choose. At the end of book 11, you left them both and you'd just been cheating on Blair with Serena, which she still does not know about. So Blair and Serena, they meet up again and they are gonna go to Chuck's New Year's Eve party. And Serena needs to go to like a sort of rap party for a film first. And she ends up getting stuck there and Blair is absolutely pissed off with her because she was supposed to go to Chuck's party and she isn't there yet. So she's like really, really mad at Serena. Again, she gets mad at Serena for like the littlest things when really she should be getting mad at different things. Like she puts her energy in the wrong place. Nate is back in New York and he randomly remembers, he hasn't been invited, but he randomly remembers that Chuck has a New Year's Eve party every New Year's. So Nate runs into Chuck outside of the party and Chuck actually seems like a decent guy now. He went to an all-male college called 
Deep Springs, a two-year program on a working alfalfa farm in California. I don't know what alfalfa means. It was either that or military school and he chose to go to Deep Springs. And also the fact that on the first night there, Sweetie, his monkey, got bit by a rattlesnake and died. That is like really mortifying actually, especially since Chuck's whole personality, his only friend was Sweetie the monkey. And then she died. Did Chuck have a monkey in the TV show? But he's genuinely a changed man. He recognises that he was awful in high school and he was a dick and he actually apologises for his behaviour. Like he's genuinely changed. And I only believe people when they actually show how changed they are. In this book actually shows that Chuck is probably the best character because of that. Like his development is massive. So Nate goes into the party and Blair sees him for the first time. She wasn't sure if she wanted to kick him or kiss him. So Nate and her talk for literally a page and a half. Well not actually no not even a page and a half just a page. And again he doesn't confess to sleeping with Serena. He says I understand if you can't forgive me but I hope we can still at least be friends. And she thinks he looked like a guy who'd realised he'd made the biggest mistake of his life. I mean to be fair he's made the biggest mistake of his life 20 times before this point as well. She says, can we go back to your house? She knew what would happen when she was alone with Nate but she also knew finally that Nate loved her and he deserved a second chance or a third, or a fourth. You're in a relationship with a guy from Yale. Have you forgotten him? Because it seems like you've forgotten him. Nate takes Blair back to his apartment. He plants a kiss on her lips. He'd never ever leave Blair again. He was so thankful she'd given him another chance. He wouldn't fuck it up this time. I'll never leave you again, Blair. I love you. I love you too. And they have sex. So Blair's cheated on her Yale boyfriend. He doesn't even confess that he cheated on her with Serena in book 11. And this is book number 13 and we're still doing the same shit. Serena finally comes to the party and Blair and Nate have come back to it. So again, Serena's trying to suppress how hurt she is right now and tries to be happy for Blair and Nate. She acts normally. This is the first time she's seen Nate since he left her too, after he told her that he loved her and all of that before he left to go around the world. Oh, I just want to shake everyone. I want to shake everyone and be like, do you realise what he's doing? I want to help you. If I could sit Blair and Serena down right now, I would say, get Nate out of your life. Never see him again. Never give him another chance. He doesn't deserve it. Both of you as well, I don't want you two to be friends either. And then I'd have to be paid a lot of money to have the conversation because I feel like I do not have the energy, but I'll do anything for a check. Serena is again like feeling so sad that she can't do her acting very well because of it. She's thinking too much about Nate. So she decides that she's gonna go to Nate and tell him that she loves him. While Nate is with Blair and Blair's in the shower, that's when Serena comes and we have an, like, an actual genuine sort of fight between Blair and Serena, which was actually kind of good. Because usually there isn't a good confrontation between anyone because everyone just like hides their true feelings. But this is like a genuine confrontation. There is some sort of resolution there. And Nate felt confused, just as he always felt whenever he was with Serena and Blair at the same time. He knew he should explain that he and Blair were together now and that he was going to yell with her, but he couldn't. Instead, he imagined what it would be like on the ocean with Serena. So now he's plotting to leave Blair for Serena and go around the world with her. And she says, take me along, I can be your first mate. And then Blair comes out of the shower and she says, well, like, that could ever happen. Nate and I are going to Yale together. And then Serena asks, how does your boyfriend feel about that? So Nate doesn't know that Blair's in a relationship with a guy from Yale. Blair wanted to fight, fine, she'd give it to her. She wasn't going to let Blair get away with stealing Nate. Finally, they really do get their feelings out. And Serena says, what does your boyfriend think about that. And Blair says, I don't have a boyfriend. How would Serena know anyway? She does have a boyfriend. And then Blair tells her, Serena, just get your own fucking life. Which, honestly, fair, because a lot of the times it does seem like Serena wants what Blair has all the time. She always seems to go after it. Instead of speaking, Blair hurled a Mason Pearson hairbrush at Serena. But because Blair had terrible aim, it hits one of Nate's little sailboat things and destroys it. So Nate says, I can't do this. You two always fight. I never should have come back. I'm leaving. Don't look for me. So Nate leaves them both again. He blames them both. He says, you're both like fighting. I don't want this. I'm leaving you both. Even though he's the cause of everything. And that's just part one. And I haven't even talked about Vanessa and Dan because we're going to get some really shitty things with Vanessa as well. So Dan's made away and he wants to transfer to Columbia and he asked Vanessa to transfer from NYU to Columbia with him. Vanessa loves NYU. She doesn't want to leave. And so she's like, I'm not going to do that. Obviously not. And Dan's like pissed off with her because she won't transfer for him. So bear in mind, they are a couple. They do not break up. They do not fall out or anything like that. She just says no and Dan's upset and pissy about it, but everything's fine, right? It is still New Year's and Vanessa goes to meet her old teaching assistant at NYU. Like he says that he's not her teacher anymore, but he was her teacher. He's called Hollis. Hollis brushed his hand against Vanessa's cheek and then cupped her chin and pulled her mouth towards his. So they've just kissed. 
It's New Year's Eve, right? Vanessa hesitated for a fraction of a second as an image of Dan's sallow face flashed across her mind. Dan, her Dan, who was back and wanted to move in together, go to school together, start life together. But it was this thought exactly that made her kiss Hollis right back. So I'm adding that one to Vanessa's cheating counter. But up here on the roof, so close to the winter stars, it felt so right. Here she is cheating on Dan, literally straight away with somebody who I think was probably a teaching assistant because he must be quite young. It doesn't actually explain like how old he is or anything like that, but he was her teacher. All the teachers in the Gossip Girl series are scum. They seem to just want to get with their students. Did Cecily Von Skeser take some tips from Sarah Shepard? Are we getting a bit of a Pretty Little Liars flashback here? Although to be fair, I did read all the Pretty Little Liars books and I much prefer how we handled the Aria and Mr. Fitz situation. Much preferred in the books. But you might be thinking, but Gav, it's New Year's Eve. Maybe they're just like kissed because it's New Year's Eve. Hey, 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 hey. Vanessa accidentally left her camera up there and it's like the next day or something. And Hollis brings her camera back to Vanessa. Vanessa's living in Dan's family's apartment. They weren't kissing, but their lips were millimeters apart. Vanessa leaned in and her lips touched his. Boom, another cheating thing right there because she kisses him. She purposefully closes the gap between their lips and kisses him. And guess what? It's not just kissing. Dan comes home. Couldn't wait to see her face when he surprised her. Vanessa was lying on his bed, on Dan's bed, naked, but she wasn't alone. She was with a guy, an equally naked guy. So Dan picks up Vanessa's camera, throws it. Fuck you, Dan said. And by the way, you can't live here anymore. So he like kicks her out. They're not a couple anymore because Vanessa's literally just cheated on him. But also Dan's awful. So I'm like, does he deserve it? He kind of does because he's also a cheater. It's really hard to pick a side. So then we get into part two, which is the following New Year's and Blair is back with her Yale boyfriend, Pete. And Nate is also back from New York because he did leave. He actually went to the Deep Springs where Chuck went and he's come back a changed person apparently. How many times have we heard that before? Yeah, he's come back for Chips' funeral because he had cancer and that was one of the reasons why he stopped going around the world and brought Nate back to New York. But he didn't tell Nate, so Nate ends up getting some kind of like compass thing from him. You would think that would be like kind of an emotional thing, but because this is so poorly written, there was like no emotion whatsoever. And even when Sweetie died as well, which honestly was like quite sad, I just didn't really feel anything. I feel like a bad person for not feeling stuff. <laughs> Vanessa is also with Hollis now. They've moved into a new apartment together. And Hollis, he is like a sort of filmmaker now as well, which seems to be a recurring theme with Vanessa. And he says, I want to make a movie out of your life. And Vanessa's like, but my life's boring. And I would agree. The one time I would agree with Vanessa, I would totally agree with that. But he's still like, oh, I want to make a film of your life. So they set up a meeting with some like movie people and they start talking about like a, an idea for this. And they shoot Vanessa's idea down and they start talking about like some kind of other movie and, and Vanessa gets pissed and leaves. And she gets pissed at Hollis as well because he joins in on the conversation. And back home, she forgives Hollis. He's like, oh, I couldn't say anything. I couldn't do anything. They just don't want to make your movie. But I have to go to Iceland for three months to film this movie that we're now going to do. So he's going to leave Vanessa for three months. Bad idea. It's always a bad idea, isn't it? Nate bumps into Serena. She should be so pissed off with him. And she just isn't. She actually runs up to him, kisses him, gives him a hug. He wanted to tell her he was sorry. And yet he doesn't. He still doesn't say anything. But right now with Serena and yeah him, he felt better than he had in a long time. So we see as soon as he's back with Serena or like in Serena's presence, he is starting to like fall in love again. Nate felt a sudden surge of pride to realize he could still make her smile. Did that mean she forgave him? They shouldn't really be forgiving each other, but Nate always makes these assumptions and they are just terrible assumptions. At the same time, Blair comes to this party with Pete, her current boyfriend, and she gets pissed off. Serena and Nate are kissing and Blair gets jealous and she tells Pete, we have to go. She doesn't want to be honest with Pete, but then he does bring it out in her and she says, I saw my ex making out with my best friend and we're not together anymore, obviously. And he says, just tell me that nothing has happened between you since high school. And then she finally admits to cheating on him. Last winter break, Nate and I hooked up on New Year's. I didn't even know he would be in New York, but that was last year. It only happened once, and now it seems he and Serena are together, so good for them. She acknowledged it for what it was, a dumb mistake that would never happen again. And he's like, you slept with him? You cheated on me? Jesus Christ, I'm a fucking idiot. You cheated and you never told me? He's actually reacting the way that he should react. How do I know this? This love triangle isn't always going to come back to haunt you, to haunt me. Yes, preach it. Because this love triangle haunts us all. It haunts me. And I'm not even part of this love triangle. Are you breaking up with me? And he's like, I just need some time to think. So he's not breaking up with her. He's just upset. Rightly so. Because he's just found out that Blair cheated on him with her ex, who she obviously still loves. But I'm just so glad we finally have a character who reacts the way that they should. Somebody with one brain cell. Nate is high, he's taking drugs, and he and Serena hook up and have sex. So both of them aren't in a relationship, so that's 
fine. Nay brings up Blair, which pisses Serena off because Serena's like, oh, so he doesn't love me. He loves Blair. And then Serena leaves him. So Nate wants to go back to Blair, right? He hooks up with Blair and the first thing he thinks of after is Serena. He hooks up with Serena and the first thing he thinks of after is Blair. When will it stop? So Nate decides he's gonna go and see Blair, right? So Blair's asleep in her suite, in her hotel room. And somehow Nate gets in. He somehow gets into her hotel room. She thinks it might be her boyfriend, Pete. And all she hears is, you're my east, my west, my north, my south. Blair, you're my girl. And it's fucking Nate. You're drunk and high, you need to get out here. Yeah, get out. And that is when Pete walks in. Pete walks in and sees that Blair and Nate are in the hotel room. Blair doesn't do anything with Nate, but it's just like the worst timing in the world. And Pete sees them and he freaks out and he's like, it's over and he leaves. Nate tries to apologize to Blair for messing things up again. She tells him to get out. You're bad for me. I never want to see you again. But Nate just stood there. So Blair ends up leaving her own hotel room to get away from him. I'm sick of him. And you know what's really nice as well is that when Blair leaves, she confides in Chuck. And Chuck, who is an actual changed man, looks after Blair. He tells her that she can stay in his suite and they're gonna go to brunch and he says, good night Blair, kisses her on the forehead, I'll pick you up tomorrow morning. Like it's very respectful. He doesn't try to grope her like he usually would. And he doesn't try and force things on her. Like Chuck is genuinely a changed man. He is the opposite of Nate right now, which when you first read the very first Gossip Girl book, you wouldn't expect that. And I know that Chuck and Blair get together in the TV show and that sort of end game. This would have been written during season one, season two. We do have Finally, the very first inkling of a sort of relationship between Chuck and Blair. What's Dan doing during all of this? Honestly, I couldn't give a shit. He needs to hand in a poem to his professor and he ends up mashing loads of different poems that he used to write back when he was with Serena. And he sends it to his professor, his professor loves it. And he says, call it Serena and it gets published again. You know what, actually the professor's response, this is supposed to be a professor at a university. This is his email. Danny boy, I thought you were going to submit shite, but this is the real thing, boyo. Sent it to Jamie Matteo at the New Yorker. She wants it. They're going to crash it into their next issue, printing tonight. What's it called? What a professor. One says shite, call them boyo or whatever, Danny boy. Like, again, this is another example where adults just don't act like adults. <laughs> but Serena, anyway, she reads the New Yorker and she sees that it's called Serena and it's by her old classmate, Dan. And she ends up emailing Dan saying, oh, can we meet up? I know things didn't work out between us, but you know, maybe we can, you know, try things again. And I also know that Serena and Dan end up together in the TV show too. So we are getting two like end game couples appear or materialize in the continuation story. So getting into part three of the story, it is the following year. Serena has gone to Yale, but Blair wants to avoid Serena. So she goes to Oxford to study for the semester. And Nate is back at Deep Springs where he actually bumps into Jenny. Jenny is at a university pretty much next door to it. And they start a thing. So we get Nate and Jenny again. I mean, I know she's a little bit older, but I find it still creepy that she dated him when she was way too young. And now she's like obsessed with him again after he broke her heart. Serena and Dan are also a serious couple now as well. They've gotten back together and they go to pick Jenny up and surprise, surprise, Nate's there. So they also let Nate in. Serena lets Nate in, even though again, Nate broke her heart and she's like acting like nothing happened. And Dan's pissed off with Nate. He doesn't want Jenny to be with him and all of that. So he doesn't want them to be in the same car, but they have to. And there's also a blizzard happening. There is a snow blizzard. They end up having to like stop. And Serena remembers that Blair has a home nearby that she can crash because she knows the code and stuff. Guess who's there? <laughs> Blair, her serious boyfriend, Chuck, and Blair's dad and his partner Giles. They're all at this home. So Serena, Nate, Dan and Jenny knock on the door and lo and behold, they're all together again. Blair's pissed off. She doesn't want anything to do with it, but she can't do anything because there is a blizzard and they are forced to stay in this one place together. Talk about drama, but also the conveniences still. The conveniences are still happening. So Nate is given the attic to sleep in. Dan and Serena have their own room. Blair and Chuck have their room. And while Nate is upstairs in the attic and stuff, Jenny goes up and kisses him and that's like their first kiss since like getting back together kind of thing. Blair, even though she's in a serious relationship with Chuck, and Chuck is honestly so kind and caring. It's such a 180. But Blair's fantasizing about Nate. What was she doing fantasizing about Nate when she had Chuck? Chuck, who made her feel like a princess and never ever fucked with her just down the hall. It was infuriating. Yeah, it's infuriating for me as well. Blair, stop thinking about Nate. Not just that, Serena's also like feeling things funny again, even though she's in a serious relationship with Dan. And she's fantasizing about it. So one night, Serena and Blair and Jenny all have the idea that they're gonna sneak up into Nate's bedroom, into the attic and 
hopefully sleep with him. And again, like even though Serena and Blair are in serious relationships, I'm just like, you're nasty. However, Blair does bump into Serena as she's about to go up to the attic. So they kind of stop one another, allowing Jenny to go up. And Jenny then has sex with Nate. So Nate takes Jenny's virginity. So this is three of the main characters that Nate has taken their virginity. He's taken Serena's, Blair's, and now Jenny's. It's weird as well because Blair and Serena make up. Like they become best friends again, which again comes out of nowhere, but they're just like having fun reminiscing about things again, which makes Dan feel left out because Dan doesn't really feel like he is part of that sort of friendship. So he goes into the other room and he starts texting Vanessa. Vanessa, Vanessa of all people, the person who cheated on him, had sex with someone else in his bed. And he he starts texting her and they're texting non-stop. Hollis, who has been away to Iceland to film, comes back to Vanessa and he sees that they've been texting a lot as well and Vanessa's just like, oh, it's fine, it's, it's nothing. Hollis and Vanessa do end up breaking up. He thinks that she's in love with Dan, which she is. She was with him and cheated on him though. <laughs> anyway, like I am holding on to Chuck right now because again, he's the only person who is actually treating his partner with respect. Think back to the fact that everyone thought Chuck would be the biggest cheater when I put on that Instagram story. Chuck came first in that poll. He hasn't cheated on anyone. I mean, granted, he hasn't really been in a relationship this entire book series, so he actually hasn't been able to cheat on anyone. When he's in this relationship with Blair, he treats it seriously. He gives her an anniversary present. I remember how sad you were around this time last year. This year, I want you to be happy. Like, he genuinely wants Blair to be happy. He loves her. He thinks the world of her. And yet she still wanted to cheat on him with Nate. <laughs> She doesn't deserve Chuck and I never thought I would say that. They're all playing Clue and Blair is pissed off with Serena for wanting to say Nate, even though she should just get the fuck over it. She's with Chuck. And they're playing Clue. I suspect Miss Vanderwood's in outside Nate's room with a really slutty candlestick. And it brings things out. So it comes out that Serena was going to sneak into Nate's room, which kind of ruffles Dan's feathers. And also Serena does say, well, Blair, you were going to do the same thing. So both of them admit that they were going to sleep with Nate. Both of them admit it. Meanwhile, Nate is like, oh, you guys are fighting over me again. I'm sick of this. And then he ends up leaving and he takes Jenny with him to go on a boat. But this does show you how amazing Chuck is because when Blair and Chuck have a conversation, she says, I'm so sorry, which honestly, she actually said sorry. She has said the S word. She says, whenever he and Serena are around, I act like the person who I don't like, but I'm in love with you. I know that. And he says, I love you too. And I know you. <sighs> Chuck. Like, honestly, he has my heart. And remember, he did have his whole gay section of the series, which totally fizzled out. It just went nowhere. She asks, can we start the deal over again? And he says, we can. At the same time, Serena and Dan are talking and Dan forgives Serena too. She says, he was my first love and that's hard to get over. But then she tells Dan, I love you, which makes Dan laugh. He says, if we got through this weekend, we can get through anything. Leading to Dan and Serena getting back to Dan's apartment because now the blizzard's all clear. Everyone can leave now. Everyone can leave now, which is so convenient, isn't it? So yeah, they get back to Dan's apartment where Vanessa is, even though she was kicked out because Rufus says that he can live there. So now we get into the fourth and final part of this book where everything just goes to shit, right? This is the last of Gossip Girl, right? We do still have the serial killer rewriting of the first book, but like this is how we end the characters, right? This is how the whole series ends, right? So this is part four. I am furious. So firstly, Dan and Serena are still a very, very serious couple. They are totally in love with one another. Serena wants to uproot her entire life for Dan because he's going to Iowa and she has this whole like apartment thing bought. Actually, she's bought an apartment that she and Dan can live in without telling Dan. At the same time, Dan and Vanessa are talking again and they're talking about Hollis's movie. Even though Vanessa and Hollis are broken up now, Dan cheats on Serena. As if they were following the steps to a dance only they knew, they stood without breaking their kiss. Vanessa took Dan's hand and led him to her bedroom. So yeah, Dan and Serena are supposed to be together. And now Dan has just slept with Vanessa who cheated on him. And again, Vanessa hasn't even apologized for doing that. Ugh. Can you say now why I did a cheat encounter? Because that's all these people ever fucking do. And it's quite heartbreaking for Serena because in the next chapter, they meet up in a place where Dan loves, but Serena's never liked, but she just went there anyway because it's Dan's favorite place. So she's gonna like it too. And she shows him the apartment in Iowa that she got. And he's like, I need to go and do this by myself. And so effectively he breaks up with her, but still without telling her that he cheated on her with Vanessa. And Serena says, you can still keep the house. I paid the first few months. It was your Christmas present. And Dan is like, I still don't want it and leaves her. <laughs> How awful is that? So Dan, who is what endgame for Serena in the TV show, has just cheated on her with the person who cheated on him, Vanessa. Dan and Vanessa 
are together right now, Serena and Dan are over. And even say that though, because Dan and Vanessa are going off on their own little adventures for two years, they say, oh, wait for me. And then after two years, we will be together. So like, they're not even like really together right now. And with them being away from each other for two years, you just know they're going to cheat on each other multiple times. And then even when they're together after two years, they're going to cheat on each other still. It's just a constant cheating cycle. Jenny and Nate are together, but they are so weird. They do a lot of cat noises with one another. So they're having like a, a dinner party with other people and Blair and Serena are there too. Jenny is like going meow meow and Nate's also going like meow meow and like they're acting like cats in front of everyone. I'm genuinely mortified. Literally a server asks Nate if he wants some wine and he replies meow meow and picks up Jenny's glass. I'm scared again. This isn't even the horror book. The next book's the horror book, but I'm genuinely terrified right now. Jenny was sitting on his lap as well, but they had to move her to a different chair. And he shouts down the end of the table, you holding up meow? And she says meow, she replies meow. She purred goofily, not caring who heard her. She should fucking care. He takes Jenny to see the Nutcracker, that's the tradition, but all he can think about is Blair. All he can think about during this entire thing is Blair. <laughs> even though Jenny's his girlfriend, he can't stop thinking about Blair. Jenny then leaves Nate for Tyler, who is Blair's brother, and that's because Nate's been boring, he just wants to stay in all the time, and Jenny wants to like go out and party, so she leaves him. They kind of break up. Blair and Serena break into Nate's house, and they take off their clothes and sleep in the same bed with him, as a prank. As a prank. After everything they've done together, they just do it as a prank. They, they do that. They actually do that. And they're both, well, actually, I think at this point, Serena's not with Dan anymore. Blair's with Chuck. But you know what really infuriates me is the fact that we finally have a healthy couple with Blair and Chuck. And this is the final Gossip Girl book. Chuck wants Blair to move in with him. He wants to plan their summer together. And she says, I can't do this. It was the fact that deep down, she wasn't sure if she wanted to be in a relationship, at least not right now, not with someone who was so ready to settle down. So Chuck just wants to spend more time with her. Like, again, this is the thing with these characters is they think that everything has to happen right there and then. And it doesn't have to be endgame right now, just like be in a relationship right now. But she doesn't want to settle down. And he says, I understand, even though he's so upset. Like he is genuinely devastated that she is breaking up with him. They've broken up now. Serena and Dan aren't together anymore. They've broken up. Chuck and Blair are not together anymore. They've broken up. Nate and Jenny are broken up too. Everyone's broken up. So at Chuck's New Year's Eve party, cause it's like the final New Year's Eve and Serena and Nate are together and then Blair sees them. So she comes over. She's like, what are you doing? Serena says, I was thinking we could go on an adventure. Blair is absolutely furious. She's like, seriously, again? And she assumes that she means a romantic adventure with Nate. But then Serena says, would you just shut up for one second? I meant an adventure with you, Blair. I want to travel with you. You're my best friend. And then Nate's like, I can come. And then Serena's like, sorry, the invitation was for Blair. Blair says, no boys, you ready, Serena? Good luck, Nate. We love you. They chose each other. I love the fact that we rectified the end of book 11 where Nate decided to ditch both Blair and Serena and chose himself. In this one, we have the opposite where Blair and Serena choose each other and go off into the sunset together. Like that is a great at ending than book 11 was. But like everyone's broken up. Blair and Serena, they haven't been honest with each other the amount of times that they've cheated with their partners and stuff and hurt one another. None of that's been resolved. So again, like the friendship is still toxic, but because I've been battered and bruised by this entire series and everyone's pretty much made really bad decisions, I'm kind of left to feeling, well, this is the ending I've got. It's the only kind of positive outcome, I guess. Ugh. I don't know how I feel. I, genu I don't know how I feel about this. The final Gossip Girl blog post, who am I and will I ever reveal myself? That's a question I could answer but I'm not going to. So if you're waiting this entire time to find out who Gossip Girl was, I'm sorry to say, but we never ever find out. And that is because it's physically impossible for anybody to be Gossip Girl. Not a single one person could actually know every single thing that happened in this. I know people do submit things to Gossip Girl for like the whole rumor mill, but it's genuinely physically impossible for Gossip Girl to be anyone. There is no way it could have been anyone. The way this is written, it's, there's no chance. Not unless I went into sci-fi fantasy territory. And especially since a lot of times the blog posts and things are pulled straight from the thoughts and feelings of the characters. There is no Gossip Girl reveal. I am so sorry. It is not Dan Humphrey. It's just not ever revealed because it's impossible for it to be anyone. I'm sorry. 
the last book, the book that probably nobody heard about, the slasher remake of the very first book, written by the original author Cecily Vonsegay. So she left the series and she came back for this one. And I know why, and I'm gonna tell you it right now. I alluded to this earlier of why I have a theory she came back for this. It's because she copy and pasted her own manuscript from the first book, threw in some like horror references and like little kind of sinister thoughts from like Gossip Girl and stuff, and even added a death scene, well quite a few death scenes, very gruesome death scenes, but she didn't bother to change the entire manuscript for it. So we would have a really big gruesome death scene, and then the scene would continue just as it happened in the first book, as if nothing happened. That is why Cecily came back for this book, because she could get away with copy and pasting the first book and just adding little bits in here and there. So I'm just gonna get through the entire book for you. I'm gonna do a kill count as well for Blair, Serena, Dan and Jenny because they're the only people who really like kill anyone. So it's honestly so bizarre. It is honestly a really weird book and I had high hopes for it too because I was like, oh, you know what? I've read 13 books where I hate all the characters. Maybe I might get some of my anger and frustration out. Maybe I will say these characters like get killed and stuff. Like that would be amazing. And like say like Nate and Dan. Oh my gosh, I would love it if they died and stuff. You know what I mean? It isn't exactly what I was hoping for. It is about 100 pages more than the first book. And I mean, there are like some changes, of course, there's like quite a few changes as well, but the majority of it is pretty much the same. So for example, we have like, welcome to New York's Upper East Side, where my friends and I live and go to school and play and sometimes kill each other. Whereas in the first book, it's welcome to New York City's Upper East Side, where my friends and I live and go to school and play and sleep, sometimes with each other. So we are getting like these little twists in the narrative. And I don't want to go through like the entire story the way that it does in the first book, because it's essentially just the story of the first book. We have Serena, she's gone off to boarding school. We have Blair and the fact that she doesn't like Cyrus, her mum's boyfriend. In her mind, she's like plotting his murder and stuff. Other than just like those slight changes, the story itself, everything that happens in the first book happens in this one. I mean, there is a big difference actually because when Serena comes back, the first thing she does is breaks into Nate's bedroom and she injects poison into one of his socks that has his stash of weed in it. She just wants her and Blair to be friends and their friendship wasn't supposed to die, not ever. All she thought about all year was how to repair their friendship. Eventually it became clear how much easier things would be if Nate were out of the picture, literally. And I was like, yes, finally we are rectifying how, I mean, I know murder's wrong and stuff, but like, this is fiction, it's fine. Finally, we are rectifying all of the wrongs of the original series when Nate, like, did so many fucked up shit to them both, you know, and he did come between them. They also treat each other like shit, don't get me wrong, but like, Nate is a constant pain in my ass. So before this, we find out that Serena's actually killed three people when she went to boarding school. There was Jude, sweet Jude, but Jude simply wasn't Nate. So Serena had rammed the stick down Jude's throat, catching his tongue and epiglottis in the little metal basket meant for catching apples and killing him instantly. There was also Milos. Milos was still missing, his shark-eaten body floating to and fro in the icy waters between Cape Cod and the Bay of Fundy in Canada. And then the third person she's killed is called Soren, had built her a snowman the bloody snowman was wearing Soren's head. So she has killed three people quite gruesomely, I might add, before we even have the story start. As she's leaving, she gets in a cab, she bumps into Jeremy, who is one of Nate's friends, and he's come to get the pot that she has literally just injected in poison. So then we have Serena go to Blair's, you know, Blair and Nate are about to have sex for the first time, blah, blah, blah. Serena is there, she comes back, and they have the exact same conversations. Seriously, the conversations have just been copy and pasted again, which to begin with is fine, because I understand this is just retelling the first book. But then we have the huge difference that Jeremy, okay, with, with Serena there, with Serena at the party, Jeremy comes back after being at Nate's to get these socks, this pot, and then he's trying to say Serena. Jeremy is choking and he's trying to say Serena. He yanked a pair of neon yellow Adidas socks from out of his pocket and tossed them on the carpet. So there's the murder weapon right there. And then he falls down and Serena is now grateful that it's him who's dying and not Nate because she's just changed her mind. She doesn't want Nate to die now. Jeremy's eyes bulged impossibly. Finally, they exploded. Pop. Pop. Blood spattered the walls and the furniture. Jeremy collapsed in a blood-soaked heap on the floor. And then his dad says, son, are we going to have to send you up to Little Silver again? And then Jeremy's mother says, he can't hear you, dear. He's out. So his eyeballs have just popped. There's blood all over the walls. Their son has just died in front of them. And they're just like, ah, oh, he's fine. But what's weird as well is that all of the other guests are just continuing to do what they were doing. They continue to have the food that they're eating, they continue chatting, there's blood everywhere. And then we get the whole copy and paste again of like all the conversations that happened in the first book. I'm just like, okay, so we just had this big death scene and then everything's just back to normal? 
This is when the story should have changed, right? Because then Serena confesses to Blair, oh, I killed Jeremy because I was going to kill Nate, but I changed my mind now. And so even from that moment on, things should have been different, right? But no, nothing really changes. Everything still happens the way it happens in the first book. And I'm just like, how does somebody die so graphically and brutally in front of everyone at this party and everyone just goes about their business still? It doesn't make sense. I mean, the whole series doesn't make sense as it is, but like, what? Serena is confronted by Jude's sister. And again, this is just like where all sense of reality just like escapes my body because, let me, let me tell you. Serena's in the elevator at her apartment and a girl comes in and she says, I know what you did. Up at Hanover, you killed him, my brother Jude. I saw from the window I was visiting. Okay, why didn't you say this to the police for one? This would have been a good few weeks at least. Okay, so you knew this and you're getting into an elevator with the person who just murdered your brother. While in this elevator, she's like, you shouldn't even be in school, you should be in prison, murderer. And so obviously Serena's like, well, okay, I'm gonna kill you now then. And she's like, oh no, please don't kill me. She goes to press the stop button, which is stupid because of an elevator right now. Don't press stop. You want the actual elevator to stop at the actual place that you're going to and get out. Not actually stop the elevator mid travel. And when she reached it, she found her right hand was no longer attached to her wrist. Soon her pretty open scalp was no longer attached to her head, nor were her pierced and grey eyeballs attached to their sockets. So apparently Cecily Von Zgeser has some kind of eyeball fetish and she loves it when these people don't have their eyeballs anymore. There's like a lot of focus on eyeballs. Like she leaves the body in this elevator. She's just killed her on this elevator. Does she think she's gonna get away with that? I mean, she does. Oh my God, it, it gets more ridiculous. It gets more ridiculous. I'm here for a fun time, don't get me wrong. I love anything ridiculous and camp and stuff like that, but like, this is like maybe a bit too much. And it also seems like everybody is a secret serial killer. Well, the entire class are like in this school and they're singing the hymns. Blair gets sick of the gossip that Nikki and the rest of the girls are talking about with Serena. So Nikki is just like one of the friends. Blair is behind her. She reached for Nikki's ponytail, pretended to remove a piece of lint from the shiny blonde strands. Then with a sharp yank on the gold chain around Nikki's Nikki's neck, she crushed the girl's windpipe before ramming the ridiculous crystal icicle pendant through her yellow Ralph Lauren turtleneck and into her jugular. So she doesn't just strangle her, but she also like stabs her in the neck so that like there's gonna be blood everywhere. All the while Jenny notes that Nikki is lifeless and she is dead. Jenny thinks Serena did it because everyone thinks Serena is a serial killer. So like if everyone thinks this, then why doesn't someone step in and do something about it? I do like the subtle changes as well with the horror stuff. So instead of the kiss on the lips party, it's kiss me or die. And Blair's favourite films are now like Rosemary's Baby and The Shining rather than Breakfast at Tiffany's and like Some Like It Hot. And Dan still does his stupid kiss thing. You know how I hated it when he overhears Chuck and everyone gossiping about Serena and he hates it. So he stands up after eavesdropping and then goes mwah, 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 to the boys and then leaves. Is it like a big screw you kind of gesture? He still does that. Like that still happens the exact same way. And it just annoyed me. Like it's just one little thing, but it annoys me so much. Vanessa is still here as well. And she just wants to film weird stuff. She wants to film dead bodies and things like that, which honestly isn't really all that different to her personality in the first 11 books. Vanessa isn't really that different. There's music blasting outside. I think someone's having a party, like how dare. Nikki's body is found and this is what the school puts out. Due to an earlier incident, the auditorium will be closed for maintenance for the remainder of the day. Drama and dance classes will be relocated to the gymnasium. Thank you. That's it. They don't shut the school down. They found a body on the premises. Someone's just been murdered. They don't shut the school down. They just relocate where the classes are. The incompetence. And Blair says for every person Serena offed, she planned to off someone too. So now we have this like, competition between Blair and Serena to kill the most people. Which, honestly, I do like. Like, that is actually a kind of good storyline, but it's Cecily Von Zagier is writing this, remember? So it's obviously not going to turn out good. Something that didn't happen in the original book as well is that Serena has a pajama party that Nate comes to. And, you know, other people were invited, but no one shows up. And so Nate comes and they end up having sex. So I'm going to add this to Nate's cheat encounter. Even though it's like a different kind of timeline, I'm still, I'm just adding it because I just don't like Nate, okay? But then Katie and Isabel, who are like Blair's best friends and are kind of there to be sort of her mole, they come along. They say that Nate's, you know, stuff's all over the place. Nate's in the shower. And then Serena's like, okay, I'm going to have to kill you both now. So she pretends that she needs their help to get rid of the sheets. And she's like, could you help me get these sheets into the incinerator? You know where this is going, right? Like, can you be so dumb? So Katie and Isabel, they are excited about the prospect of like having some dirt on Serena. So like, oh yeah, sure, we'll help. Serena appeared with a bottle of absolute pepper vodka and a flaming tiki torch in her hands. She doused their hair and faces with the pepper flavored vodka. Blinded, Katie and Isabel fell on their hands and knees mourning. Serena tossed in the torch and the two girls became a giant flame and flambe. Owie, it stings, Katie screeched. You're rubbing flames and that's what you say, owie, it stings. 
And then Isabel says, you insane bitch. Serena grabs Isabel and throws her in the garbage chute. How she has the strength to do this, I do not know, because then she also grabs Katie and gets her to, well, drags her there after her too. I don't know how Serena had the strength to do that, but she does it. And so she's just offed two of Blair's best friends. Don't get me wrong, it's a good death scene. They were just dumb. They were just dumb for like believing Serena. They know she's a serial killer. And they're just like, oh yeah, let, let's go to the incinerator with you, Serena. Like if there was some more believability and people acted like actual people, I would have liked this more, but nobody's acting right. <laughs> Blair's party, it's not the kiss me or die party yet. Like she's just hosting a different party. Whip my hair back and forth. I whip my hair back and forth by Willow Smith is on. It's oddly poetic because at the same time, Blair decides to kill Elise who is Jenny's best friend. She says to Elise, I was just thinking how much I'd love to watch you die. And then she puts the ice pick into Elise's chest. And then she puts her head into the, what do you call it? The, the garbage disposal thing. She forced the girl's blonde head down the drain and flicked on the disposal. Its blaze began to grind, sending up sparks as they met bone. Chunks of flesh and bits of hair spattered the white kitchen ceiling. Just as Blair was feeding the girl's ankles and feet down the drain. So apparently she's been able to put the entire body of Elise into this you know, the, the disposal thing. Myrtle the cook came in. Blair, what a mess. Next time you want Bloody Marys, ask me to fix them for you. Okay, this is a horror comedy. This is genuinely a horror comedy because like, come on. At the same time, Dan wants to kill Chuck and Jenny also wants to just kill someone. You know, everyone seems to just want to murder people in this. Dan sees Chuck in Barney's and follows him into a changing room and starts to strangle him with a tie. And then he does end up getting interrupted by the salesperson and Dan runs away. So he's a bit shit at trying to kill people, isn't he? Blair and Serena are able to pick people up and put them in incinerators and put them down garbage disposals. Whereas Dan can't even strangle someone. Just to add to the random kill count as well, Blair goes for a waxing, which is again a scene that wasn't in the original book. I'll give it that. She goes for waxing, but it's not her usual person. So with the strength of a nationally ranked tennis player, she dunked his entire head into the pot of bubbling hot wax. So she's just killed him because he isn't her original wax person. Even though he offers to do it for her, she's like, no, die. Jenny confronts Serena. You're like a superhero. You're like Robin Hood. You're killing all the meanest girls so girls like me can have a chance. So while that's actually kind of like a good storyline, like killing all the mean girls of the school, Jenny has it totally wrong. And it's just like proven that she's probably just as more psychotic as Serena and Blair are. And Serena thinks for a second, should I kill Jenny? But then she's like, mm, actually not. And then Blair comes up to Jenny and she's like, okay, let's go to the dark room. But Serena actually saves Jenny from Blair. Meanwhile, Vanessa's still trying to film her movie thing, you know, with Dan as the lead character. So this doesn't make sense. So she goes to a store to get a $4,500 knife to use as a prop for this film, but she doesn't have the money for it. So the salesman says, I'll tell you what, I'll let you have this one on loan if you bring it back safe and sound. No one's going to buy it anyway. Hunting's not real big in Manhattan. Who in their right mind as a salesperson would give a high school student a $4,500 knife as a prop for a movie and say, oh, just bring it back. It's alone. Just bring it back. Fine. Who in their right mind would do that? And Serena, she still wants to audition for it, but she gets the idea from Miss Gloss, who is the college advisor person, who we did say in the very first book as well, but very briefly. And Serena decides to kill her too. <laughs> She's like, here, yeah, have a tissue. She yanked out the entire wad of tissues, folded some paper, slid to the floor. She lunged across the desk and began to shove the tissues up the surprise college admissions advisor's nostrils into her open mouth and down her throat. So she's managed to what, shove tissues into her nostrils, put her whole hand in her nose, down the back of her throat and down her throat. Like that is actually like really, really gross. Like this isn't just like murder. This is like go. This is like soul level shit, you know? Like this is really bad. <laughs> Blair is following Nate because again, they're supposed to be a couple and she catches Nate at a pizzeria kissing another girl. He goes back inside while she goes outside. Her real name's Nancy and Blair grabs the girl by the back of the head and rams the entire slice into her lipstick mouth. Yeah, have a bite. But not before Blair slit her throat with the round metal pizza slicer. Zing, blood gush from her neck, red and thick as tomato sauce. For good measure, Blair cut a big slash through the girl's slutty gray uniform skirt too. Nate says the whole thing, but he's just high. He's been having pots so he doesn't really believe what's happened. And he's just anxious about Blair discovering that he's cheated again. Meanwhile, Vanessa, she's in a taxi and she passes and she tells the taxi driver to stop so that she can film the dead body. She's like, oh, maybe I can put this in my movie. Just to make Jenny and Dan really weird as well, they eat raw food. 
They're just eating raw food in their apartment. You little nasty. The author's like, okay, they haven't done anything too weird yet. Let's just make them eat raw food. Blair and Serena meet up and Blair tells her the same stuff she said in the first book. Do you have any pride? Leaves her. Serena's upset. And she runs into Chuck and Chuck takes her back to the suite. The whole thing happens where like she's, you know, losing consciousness and stuff like that. But when she wakes up, he's actually in her dress dancing to Madonna's Express Yourself. Maybe as a sort of nod to his like gay phase in the original books. And she, with her left hand, and she clipped the eyelash curler over Chuck's right eyelid and pulled back hard. Chuck's bloody eyelid drooped from the eyelash curler. She opened the window and tossed it into the gutter. Within seconds, two well-fed baby vultures were fighting over its squawking. So she's just ripped off his eyelid. And he definitely deserves it. Don't get me wrong, he does in this book. But can you just imagine like how random that is? You know, an eyelash curler, getting it on his eyelid and just like, oh... That would really hurt. But Chuck isn't dead. The whole stuff with the Remy brothers as well, taking photos of Serena happens, she leaves. Blair comes in, absolutely jealous and foaming at the mouth. And again, I don't know how this happens, but she ends up killing the brothers. Blair unfilled the coil of wire and wrapped it tightly around both the Remy brothers' skinny necks. In her deft, perfectly manicured hands, the wire became a garrote, crushing their delicate windpipes and choking them in unison. How she has the strength to do this against two grown men, I do not know. Because then also, Blair dragged them over to the far wall of the gallery and strung them up from the same nail on which Serena's portrait hung. She turned their dead heads to face each other, their twin bodies dangling. How does she have the strength to do that? It doesn't make sense. But I'm kind of living for it. Like, I both live for this book. This book is also making me die a slow death. Blair is in her apartment. She's like all up in the very high up. And she sees somebody who has blonde hair going to Central Park. And she assumes it's Serena. Like, because like, there's no other blonde people who live in New York, right? So she literally chases after this girl. The girl glanced behind her and started to run. They get all the way to the obelisk behind the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Blair swung the knife, holding it in both hands for extra head chopping power. The girl's head separated from her neck with a satisfying slicing sound. The head wasn't Serena's, but at least she'd had a good workout. <laughs> it's hilarious actually, but the fact that she chased just a random blonde girl, killed her, decapitated her, and she didn't even think to see if it was actually Serena? In fact, she did this in public? Chasing her in public killed her in public? And nobody does anything to stop it? She just gets away with it? And then we lead to like, I think the best scene that ever happens in Gossip Girl. Skip forward, we are at the museum place where there is like a dinner happening, Blair and Serena are there, and then an alarm sounds in the museum. And now there is this huge chase scene in this museum between Serena and Blair. They're both trying to kill one another, which honestly, I would actually love to have seen acted out. And then they're both grabbing weapons from like samurai swords and like these rifles from this museum. There are security guards and stuff, but they're not doing anything. They're kind of running away themselves. You know, we have these two teenage girls trying to kill one another and the security guards are just not doing anything. They get sabers, they get spears, and they're trying to like kill one another. The weapons were so heavy, the girls had to use both hands to wield them. And there's literally a tourist here as well. Do you girls know how to get to the arts of Africa, Oceania and the Americas? And they both shout shut up at him. <laughs> Everyone's trying to just go about their day exploring this museum and there's Blair and Serena just like trying to kill each other. I love it. I love it so much. Two security guards ran in to stop her, losing their legs, swung back with the saber to defend herself. Whoops. Blair accidentally kills with two security guards, I'm assuming. Serena as well as she's like with the saber, accidentally disembowels a tour of matriarchs from the Cosmopolitan Club while she was at it. Finally, Blair catches up with Serena, hurled the yatagan at Serena's strained form, catching her between her shoulder blades. Serena dropped her saber, staggered and fell. At least Serena was dead now, but her new shoes were totally fucked. Blair leaves her, assuming that Serena is dead and she just goes back to her table and eats the creme brulee and nobody does anything about this like <laughs> I still don't understand like why this was written or how it was published but part of me is so glad that it was but Serena is not dead all week long she'd been in an induced coma in Switzerland healing now it was Friday the night of the kiss me or die party and the question is to go or not to go so she's been in a coma for a week and she's already okay to go to this party in Switzerland as well she's in Switzerland she somehow comes all the way back to America and she's all right for this party, which she decides not to go to. She goes and meets Vanessa to give back the knife because, oh, I totally forgot to mention all of this. Vanessa does the whole screen test thing with Serena and Dan and they have chemistry, but Vanessa doesn't want her to have the part. But Serena, she accidentally takes, accidentally takes the knife. She wants to return it to Vanessa. So they meet up at the club thing and tries to give her it back. Dan comes, they decided not to go to the party together. Jenny's gone to the party. Chuck is hitting on her just like he did in the original book. And again, it's just like, how do we have this huge thing happen and things are carrying on as normal as it did in the first book? You know, Serena and Dan arrive at the party. Everything happens the exact same way. We have that moment where Blair and Serena look at one another and they just like smile, just like they did in the first book. They're just like, okay. And they kind of let each other go. It's just like, the whole thing, like the whole point of this book was the fact that they were building up to them trying to kill one another for Nate which I would have loved to have seen Nate actually be the one to die. Both would be like, oops, 
oh well, let's be friends again kind of thing. You know, I would love that, but that does not happen. They just said it wouldn't be worth killing each other over. And I'm just like, if I was Serena, I wouldn't let Blair get away with it. She literally just almost got murdered and was in a coma for a week. <laughs> like, come on. So yeah, Serena and Dan are trying to save Jenny. They've come across her in the toilet and then they get Chuck away. Serena still has a knife. She grabbed Chuck's scarf and yanked him toward her holding up the knife. Dan picked up a huge naked girl shaped pink glass bullet of Dolce & Gabbana perfume and held it aloft. Jenny burst out of the bathroom stall clutching a white porcelain toilet seat in both hands. I kind of love the metaphor of that because that's exactly what Chuck put her on. He made her stand on that toilet seat while he like groped at her boobs. So like it's kind of poetic in a way that she would use that as her murder weapon. Don't kill him, he's mine, she shrieked, holding the toilet seat out in front of her and running full tilt toward Chuck. The toilet seat caught Chuck just below the waist, shattering his pelvis. Now obviously that is poetic justice. I feel a bit bad as well because Chuck is the only decent character by the end of the original series, but obviously this is just the first book retold, so fair enough, he deserves it in this one. Serena gives Jenny the knife. Chuck is pleading for his life. Half kneeling and half standing, he slipped and fell forward onto the outthrust knife. Jenny let go. It's stuck out of Chuck's torso like a dot in a bullseye. Serena lunged forward and grabbed the knife's hilt. She twisted it right and then left, gutting and disemboweling him. Chuck collapsed on the blood spattered marble tile, smashing his skull. His guts were on the floor. His eye patch had fallen askew, revealing a littlest rolling eyeball. Again, we have the eyeball stuff. Serena raised her foot and crushed the good eye with the pointy red stiletto heel of her gold Louboutins. I kind of like the image of that. That's actually kind of iconic. Dan lit a match and reached for an aerosol can of hairspray. I'm gonna burn you, he bellowed. <laughs> and even after all of this, Chuck is still alive and he says, but I'm Chuck Bass. His tongue lolls out, pink and meaty out of his mouth. She could cut it out, bring it home with her, slices up and eat it. So now Chuck is like the last person to die. I don't know who to give this to, so I'm gonna give it to Serena, Dan and Jenny. They all had a part to play in his murder. And it makes me so pissed off because I really want to see Nate and Dan die like so badly. This was awful. <laughs> it was good fun for some of it as well, but the fact that it was just a copy and paste, no consequences, it was totally completely un realistic. It didn't satisfy me the way I wanted it to. I wanted to see karma and justice done for the shitty things that all the characters have done throughout the series. It leaves me with a bit of a bad taste in my mouth, but you know what? It was definitely the most fun of all of the books. So if you're going to read this, I would recommend not reading any of the other books while you do this. Like read this as a standalone, honestly. I think it would have more fun if you didn't read it not too long after reading the first book like I did. And that, my friends, is the entire story of the Gossip Girl book series. And I believe I probably did miss like quite a lot out as well. I tried to make this as thorough as possible. I even have a 35 page manifesto of all the quotes, all the moments that I wanted to mention. And even then I still didn't go through absolutely everything that I wanted to get through. It's now 24 hours later since I started filming and I need to rest. <laughs> I need to get over Gossip Girl, essentially. I also don't know myself what the final tally for the cheat encounter is, so I wanna put it up on the screen. And I know like everyone voted for Chuck in the Instagram thing, but it wasn't Chuck. I know for a fact it was Nate. Nate was the biggest cheater in the entire series. And yeah, I think he's probably my least favorite character, even though I really don't like any of them, really. So who did you not like the most? That's what I wanna know. But also, what did you think of the entire Gossip Girl series? If you're even here anymore. <laughs> <laughs> I'm probably talking to myself right now, but do you have a favorite moment? Did you used to read these Gossip Girl books when you were younger? It's absolutely fine. There's many books that I read when I was younger that I thought was amazing and turned out not to be on retrospect. But I mean, you guys can still enjoy it if you want to. Like, I'm not judging you if you do. I just found this like to be the messiest, most poorly written series I've ever read. I'm definitely gonna watch the show from beginning to end like for the first time at some point. I feel like this book series makes me appreciate the TV show more, even though I only really saw the first season. So I'm just like, oh, I'm just so happy. I'm so happy it's over. I'm still gutted that we never found out who Gossip Girl was in the books, even though it would have been impossible for it to be just one person or anyone at all. So thank you so much for watching my video. I really appreciate it. Don't forget to leave this video a like if you enjoyed it and subscribe if you haven't already. Please leave all the comments down below and let me know everything you thought about this video. Did you agree with everything? Do you disagree with everything? Just let me know everything. Let's chat Gossip Girl down below. I wanna give a huge thank you to my patrons and channel members for supporting my channel. If you'd like to join my Patreon or my channel membership then all the links are down in the description box as well as my twitter instagram all of the social media stuff you can follow me on any of those be my own little stalker why don't i be the serena to your jenny <laughs> i'm joking but honestly thank you so much for watching and i hope i will see you in the next video you know you love me xoxo gossip gav <laughs> bye